I'm on vacation every single day Cause I love my occupation Hey, hey, hey I'm on vacation If you don't like your life, then you should go and change it hey, 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 I'm on vacation every single day Cause I love my occupation hey, hey, I'm on vacation every single day, every, every single day Every single day, every single day Every single day, every, every single day Everybody sour like a lemon tree I'm just smiling down upon my enemies Do the shit and love it on a daily You say you hate your job but you'll never leave Never leave but that ain't gonna be me, that ain't gonna be me My brother called me up, said he saw me on TV I said it wasn't easy but right now I'm living It's May 1st, 2020 and live from my garage <laughs> Welcome to the Whiskey Throttle Show We're uh, having to adapt Given uh, the fact that there's some uh, closures and TLD right now is not having people inside of there. So we're doing it from here. And guess what? We got an awesome show. The godfather of freestyle motocross, Mike Metzger, is here with us. Stoked to have him. Uh, he's been uh, at the top of our list since we first conceived this show. And uh, we're stoked to have him here today. He's brought to you by Yamaha. Uh, we'll get more into their stuff later. I want to introduce our co host, Grant Langston. What's up, boys? Welcome, buddy. Stoked to be, to be doing here. it again. Good, Good to see you, you guys. And Donnie Bale is our producer behind the camera. You guys can't see him, but uh, he does a hell of a job every week getting this show produced and put out to you. So thanks, Donnie. Yeah, of course. That's what I'm here for. That's your job. That's my job. <laughs> when we talk about jobs, you say that's your job. Yeah, that's your job. All right. Uh, so yeah, Yamaha bringing you Mike Metzger today. They're the leader in the power sports industry. We couldn't get this show produced and done without them. Uh, big supporters. And, and, and like I said, with all of our sponsors, uh, we're just... We were very picky about who we partnered with, and they are absolutely perfect uh, because their products are reliable. They look at all the motocross shootouts that you read. They're winning them, 250 and 450. They're still making two strokes. They make boats, generators. They are an amazing company, and we're stoked that they're part of the show. PowerDot. Um, go over to the PowerDot and check those out. Listen, you can't right now get to a massage therapist. You can't go to a chiropractor. Not going to see somebody for anything like that, sports therapist, stuff like that. So... This is a really great tool, super affordable, and you get 20% off using the code Whiskey Throttle. Go check one out. Uh, can take care of a lot of your problems. You might, you might notice yourself going to chiropractors and massage therapists less if you use this product regularly. So uh, check those guys out, PowerDot.com. Method Race Wheels, bringing you our front and chatter segment today. You get 20% off on a set of wheels using Whiskey Throttle there as well. Troyly Designs, bringing you our timeout. We got the SKDA Get At Me Q&A segment. If you guys want to uh, have any of your questions asked, I don't care what it's about. Uh, we'll answer it. Send that out to our Twitter account, W underscore throttle underscore show, and we'll answer that on the show. Adidas, don't be a dick to your feet. Put them into some good shoes. It'll pay off. Pro circuit. <laughs> Thank you to those guys. Mike's like, what the hell's going on? What did I sign up for? Yeah. <laughs> don't be a dick. Yeah. Don't. To Just feet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Pro Circuit, they are doing a 10% off discount right now on all their hard parts. So get over there to ProCircuit.com. Still up and running over there. Anything you need done, any service work, they will knock it out. So uh, those guys are still cranking. Dunlop Tires, simply the setting the standard in our sport. Uh, so if you're getting motorcycle tires, buy the best. Buy ones that support the sport. Dunlop's the only tire company that hasn't backed out over the years. Uh, they don't just throw support when it's good for them. They support this sport 100% through and through. So... Reward them for that. Nihilo Concepts. Get a free gift over there using the code Whiskey Throttle. Um, amazing products. I love the stuff those guys are doing. Fire Department Coffee, 20% off again. You can go online, order K-Cups, whatever, whatever uh, brand you like. Dark Roast, Light yep, Roast. That's the one I've been having. Whiskey lately. Infused. Yep. They got all kinds of rad stuff, so check them out. And they give 10% of all their proceeds to uh, injured firemen, so uh, it's a good cause. Seat Concepts. Uh, great saddles, man. I've, I've been putting them on our Vital MX builds and just stoked on the way these things come out. And um, these guys do an amazing job. All kinds of snowmobiles, bikes, cruisers, adventure bikes, whatever you got, they make a seat for it. So check them out. Specialized bicycles also. Um, just simply the best bikes in the business as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we love what those guys are doing. And also Ogeo. We've got uh, Pat Lopez coming in later. He's going to walk through some of their products with us. But these guys are... The Kind of, again, the setting the standard in terms of bags, backpacks, uh, gear bags, wheelie bags, 
And hydration packs. There we go. <laughs> You're thirsty, damn yeah. it. Sometimes you just need a backpack with water in it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, our Method Race Wheels front end chatter. Let's get into it. They're bringing you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road, and uh, we love their products. So if you've got a van, a sprint, or a truck, a side-by-side, -side, put some methods on it. They look good. They work great. So, guys, here's the first question for this segment. The sketchiest jump you've ever done. <laughs> And I'll, I'll, I'll go first. A lot since of I, I know jumps. you have. And my, my jump's going to seem <laughs> like, hey, say, Mike's whole career is sketchy jumps. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's the show. <laughs> he's going to do one question and he's going to leave. <laughs> okay. Well, so me and GL will share. Mike can laugh at us and then tell us what a really sketchy jump is. Did you guys ever do the 10 pack up at Castillo Ranch? The I don't 10 think pack. I did. <sighs> it was five doubles in a row going downhill and Castillo dug them out. I'll have to, we'll have to throw it up on YouTube or something, but. They were probably, like on, I was doing them on a 125, third gear, not quite triple distance, but they were super peaky. And so if you cased it or went long, <laughs> you dropped down into this hole because he dug holes out to make the dirt. Did you pull it? I did, but it was, I did it like two or three times and I'm like, I'm done. So. I'm trying to think. I know one that does stick out. It was actually uh, Beaumont and it was a bit of a, like a, a cliff jump and I'm afraid of heights and I looked and it was one of those, I think we could do it, and it was a cool landing, but it was so steep, I, but no one wanted to do it. And I think this was when I was, had the ego got in the way, and I'm like, oh, I'll do it, you know? And then I hit it pretty hard, and it G'd out, and I started almost rebounding near the, the top. Coming back out. And I was almost coming back, and I looked down, and I just felt like I was way up there, and I just had that, like, come to Jesus moment. It was the first <laughs> time I'd prayed midair in my life, but... I just, I almost, almost freaking went down pretty hard. I let go of the bike, landed on the edge, and almost fell back down the cliff, which, yeah, if I'd got landed on my feet, I might have just broken my ankles, but it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Like, it really did. Did you stay up top? I did, did but the, the bike, bike went down. Oh, the bike, bike, went bike, down. Was, bike was mangled. Yeah. And then I had to come up with a really good story about... You were doing Went through the whoops and, yeah. and hit a false neutral, and <laughs> yeah. the rest was history. All right. Sounds so, sketchy. So make us look dumb. What was the sketchiest uh, thing you've ever done? I mean, I've had so many sketchy jumps from, like, I remember coming up short on, like, a 110-footer mm. out at uh, what it used to be called, um, out there off Ramona Expressway, past where... Uh, Oh, there's a big cow paddy pasture where we had a track. Oh, the old, uh, we called it the poo poo track. Yeah. Um, Comp Edge. Plano Honda. Comp Edge. Comp Edge. Oh, oh the yeah. track. Okay. Duty yeah. Palace. Yeah, yeah, no, I had yeah. like my own freestyle, a little park that they let me build out there. And, you know, just coming up short oh, on big, I huge that. jumps all the time is just, you know, a nightmare. I'd rather go 100 feet long than come up short yeah. and just stick yourself. But um, I don't know. One of the biggest jumps probably was going out to. Uh, Glamis for the first time for, with the crusty guys and getting a ride with McGrath and of course McGrath was you know factory running yeah. super sweet equipment his bike was dialed and he did this step over jump like into this small ravine like totally unsafe probably 120 feet I did it probably about three times and then the fourth time I just ended up going too long oh grabbing a little too much throttle and I just remember throwing myself like into the next sand dune and smashing my chin open so that was you know memorable because I got to really go out and free ride with McGrath for the first yeah. time and I'm you know I'm excited just like whoa I get to ride with Jeremy and yeah you know wanting to keep up with him and I think let alone the the big sand dunes that we were doing were you know the hugest jumps that I had been doing yeah. up till that time so smashed myself those were neat times because back in the 90s that was going on a lot when it would rain uh like where this all of southern temecula is you remember all the hills For out there sure. in the tracks yeah, yeah. and we'd ride with jeremy and rhino and factory phil and all those guys and jeremy would do stuff and he just made it look so easy yeah. he was so calculated and he just knew what he could and couldn't do for sure and his bike was freaking amazing too that honda like he would just crack the throttle you know but I remember all of us trying to kind of, he would do something and we'd all try to do it. And, and that was the time where, you know, it all kind of started banging off as far as racers kind of hanging out more and yeah. free riding. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really, I don't think that happens a lot anymore. 
Yeah, I think there's there you got your fair share of dudes who do go out and just free ride, you know, yeah. like Twitch and the crew out there at yeah. uh, Ritchie Canyon that are building jumps every day and you know that's just what they do they got regular jobs and then after they go yeah. and well, if build you, jumps if you look what's happened freestyle broke off and then from freestyle you've got free riding I yeah. mean, even like axel hodges you know yeah. some of these guys they don't compete they're just out free riding so but i think what we're saying is the moto like the actual motocross guys don't yeah, go racers. out as much like even this morning i was watching some of the old videos you know and and like you said all the guys were out in the hills yeah. doing jumps and kind of social like even guys that were competitors for sure like can you imagine right now seeing tomac and moose skin and rocks and all out at beaumont like sending big old booters right now <laughs> not unless it's, they're sponsored schedule yeah yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah. that's it yeah it's too bad man it was a fun fun time to, back then um all right so the other thing i want to ask in this segment uh has freestyle motocross peaked and maybe you can speak to this like where could it go from here i feel like uh, Paget and some of those guys are still the tricks they're coming up with. Uh, I saw actually they're voting on it right now, but Pastrana did a double back which was 360. Yeah. I, I think it was 720 it. spin something. Yeah, no, I've seen it. it. Looks ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, I just think, how do you just go, all right, yep, I think I got this and send that because he's so high in the air if that goes well, that bad. Was, that was like even like with uh, Sheen doing oh, a yeah. triple backflip. I mean, he hit that ramp. Like, when you're watching slow motion, by the time he's doing his third rotation, you're like, he is up there. I don't care if you're landing in an airbag. If you're upside down, you're screwed. Yeah, I saw some video of you working on... Uh, um, Arrow was, roll? Yeah. On a KTM? God, that looks sketchy. Yeah, Just it's to, weird, because I had pulled that a few times uh, when I was riding Kawasaki's and had my property with my own foam pit. Um I pulled it a handful of times, like did a perfect barrel roll, but then, you know, a few years later, moved up to Idaho and uh, went up to a buddy's house to work on doing it on the KTM, and I just couldn't get the bike to do the same rotation, so huh. I know there is one or two guys that did a barrel roll throughout time, Yeah, but uh, it was I just one of those sketchy deals where it's really hard to get the front end to come down and land right. If yeah. that's bike inertia. You know, maybe being on a different bike made it awkward to do that. Yeah, no, I think so. Like, because I was doing it on a KX250, and it felt just like it could be done super easy to dirt. Uh -huh. But then, you know, something happened, and I didn't end up continuing to work on it. And then, I don't know, three years later, I was up in Idaho, and a buddy had a foam pit. And I was like, dude, I think I should practice that. Well, I just ended up beating myself up in the foam pit and probably just got frustrated to where i was like huh. the bike will not do the same thing and you're saying that as far as like the rope the inertia yeah. maybe the front end or the motor i think where the, the motor's KTMs, placed in it maybe you know like yeah, even, even the front end of the bike i noticed that probably the kawasaki's had more uh turn radius mm. so one of the things when you're coming up you know like throwing a whip right when you would get up and you're being like that that whip upside down you had to throw the front in the opposite direction so the wheel would continue to rotate the bike mm. and i think with the ktms it just didn't have enough rotation in the front end to really do the same thing well you notice that the ktms have those little bolts that plug into the sides to keep the, the, from the, the forks the radiators. from hitting the radiators yeah. Huh. so yeah you can take those out but then the fork taps the radiator so. That might be something huh. that you, you guys might work on when you get your phone bit, but I'm <laughs> over it. <laughs> Did you have any? My phone you have pit any, is in my bedroom. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only phone pit I have. Do you I have bet. any video of that? Uh, the one from riding uh, the KTMs up in Idaho at uh, Keith Sayers house that's on YouTube yeah but as far as what I was doing when I was riding Kawasaki's and had my team and my foam pit my property I don't think we filmed it that day yeah it's like I think it's like what you guys are doing I'd film every single second just in case for sure you know yeah, well no, we were riding so much back then right too, it's like you'd be burning you'd be burning Right. Yeah. But again, different time, like the social media and the video well, stuff. Well, I'm not even talking about for that. Just like documentation. You, know, you, documentation. you yeah. have a point in history where you comp completed something and you're like, okay, I couldn't do it on the KTM, but you want to go look. <laughs> yeah. It was done, you know? For sure. I I'm not talking about just trying to do it to pump out content, but more for like the history of it. Yeah. I, I always think it's, I would be curious, you can tell us maybe, if you're working on a trick that's sketch and you get it, 
how many, how, what's the percentage of times you nail it before you go, okay, I'm going to try it to dirt. You know what I mean? Like nine out of 10 times, six out of 10 times. I mean, at what point do you go? Yeah, I'm not, I'm what? not trying that to dirt. You know what uh, I'm saying? I don't know. I, I always kind of felt like I was pretty confident in my riding and like the skills were okay. If it was time to do a backflip variation, um, then you're pretty much confident where you're running that through your head going, oh, I can picture doing that. I can do it. Uh. You know, I never really felt like I was like doing anything completely out of control or, you know, almost like doing a stuntman type of deal, like where I did, um, you know, I did a backflip over barge to barge in yeah. front of the Queen Mary. That was more like, you know, getting myself involved with something where I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do an evil Knievel style stunt. No mm -hmm. practice. We're just going to, you know, try to get the ramps set where it's normal 75 foot flip. And it just didn't work out that time. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna, I got something in here. I want to ask about that. Does yeah. that went yeah. bad? But um, And then we're going back to that question that his freestyle peaked. Yeah. And, you know, I think I felt like it did a long, long time ago. Like, you know, for me, my peak was telling myself what my goals were, were to win X games mm -hmm. and then like having goals and then, you know, knowing that I had the back backflip in the bag, but also just like treating it as a job, mm -hmm. you know, freestyle for a long time, you know, I was used to racing motocross and then trying to race everything else at the time. But, um, I don't know, with freestyle, it was just really easy to get by and, you know, just not take it serious. Yeah. But when I decided, like, dude, you know, maybe I don't have a very long career left, um, I started waking up 7 o'clock in the morning and, and, like, you know, going out, watering my cores, doing everything I could to, like, prepare my mind for, like, yeah. dude, I have to win. Yeah. And then when you're in that mind frame you're pretty much, you know, you've set your goals and you make them happen. Well, when I went out and won X Games <coughs> after that, I was kind of like, my goals have been reached for freestyle, you know. But then I get more, more sponsors paying and uh, wanting me to go do the next biggest backflip yeah. and the next biggest trick. Where For me, it was already over where I was just like, you know, I want to race. I grew up racing motocross, yeah. and that's where, you know, I think a lot of the first freestyle guys were totally different than how the sport evolved because yeah. they were motocrossers. You got Deegan, Clowers, Mike Jones, Pastrana. Kerry Hart, Pastrana, mm -hmm. dudes who had that mentality of, like, You've been racing since win you were at kids. all costs, yeah. you know, and that's how motocross is. You're grow you grow up to win, yeah. and you're taught, whether it's your parents, your trainers, Whatever yeah. you teach yourself when you go to the track, it's not fun to lose. Yeah. So I think those main freestyle guys have always brought that super gnarly competitiveness to the table. And it wasn't anything other than we're there to win, yeah. just as if we were there to win a motocross race. Well, and you could see, and I think maybe it was really right after Kerry tried that backflip, but it, the, it changed. Because it went from you guys, and we'll talk about it later more, but it seems like it went from you guys just sort of, this was a, a way to go have fun and make some money and you guys were partying a lot and just like having fun with it. And then somebody went, there's some money to be made here. Like if For I was sure. to really take this seriously and then it was like you Twitch Deegan, Nate Adams came in and you guys took it. It was a job and For you sure. got up and you worked hard at it all day, you know, yeah. and that made a difference. But, but I just wonder if <laughs> like how many more times can you flip? I think three on a 450. that's as hard as you can go. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's crazy burials. nowadays, too, as far as, like, the sport being a competition. You got Nitro Circus, and then those guys are on a whole different yeah. level. And I'm going to say it's like being a clown. You have to practice doing those double front flips or, you know, yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it's all it's routine. More of a show. It's all yeah. a routine. It really so, is a show, yeah. Uh, even the X Games nowadays, it doesn't seem like what they're doing – in best trick or you know whatever their competition is for x games that year it just doesn't seem like it holds any i don't know it is x games right espn but it doesn't hold any value to what travis pastrana has done with yeah. these athletes yeah that he's you know and i say the word clown loosely these guys are full-on athletes you know iron man they train mostly to keep their their mind in control 
and where they can see, you know, if they're going to do a triple backflip or a double front flip with a trick. Those dudes are so, you know, smart. They already see and imagine what they can do. And that's kind of like what yeah. holds the difference between a professional stuntman, freestyle guy, motocross dude, and then somebody who wants to be that person. You know, right. somebody hit me up with a direct message the other day saying they will, they're they got a daughter and they're trying to get into being a professional motocross racer. I'm like, they're like, how do I do it? Well, you grow up in a family that's, yeah. you know, it takes a lot of years to become something that you yeah. put your goals to be. So. so you think it'll, you think there's more in the bag for freestyle or no? Uh, I mean, you, you think know, it's sort of reached its peak and it's going shh. You but, never know. You got guys like Nate Adams who've been doing one of the gnarliest tricks for years and years, which is a 360 flat spin. There isn't too many other dudes other than like Paget. Um, and so, you know, why isn't there dozens of guys doing that trick? Well, it's because his mind and the level of riding yeah. is beyond the other dudes, you know. Yeah. So there's only not even a handful of freestyle guys that are at a level that there'll probably another, never be another handful of guys that can do yep. that type of skills on a bike. Yeah, because I feel like the freestyle guys that are freestyle guys now, they rode, but they didn't race at a high level. They went early on what I want to be a freestyle guy. And so then they just focused on tricks. But you guys had bike control skills, uh, you know, that mental attitude like you were talking about from motocross that you brought over. For sure. They're not bringing that. And I think that's a missing component. That's a super, super interesting point. To where it is right now and to where you guys started and came from. That's why I asked, do, I, do you think it's peaked? I just don't that's think... That's very interesting. It's not like, uh, let's say, <coughs> who's a really good pro that's maybe not going to make it? Like, uh, God, I don't want to throw any bed into the bus right now. <laughs> <laughs> you are so <laughs> yeah, good. Come on, you're right there. Come you're on, not dude, do it. You know, who's this guy? Hey, we'll say truth, Robert, Robert Renard. How about go all the way back? Well, <laughs> I'm just saying, there's guys right now who are racing nationals. They're really good. Riders, they have a, a great bike skills and all that, but they're not going to make it. Not so going to translate. Or would they transition into? I mean, I just don't see it happening. Right. We gotta have goals. Too. Well, a lot of these guys too now go more toward off road. If they feel like they're yeah. not going to cut it, they go. Well, we'll just go to off road. I think a bigger group is doing that than probably going to freestyle. Yeah. Anyway, interesting stuff. Well, if you, sure. I think if you look, you know, around, you know, the era from even around the 2000 mark, you know, when, you know, in the 90s it was free riding, then freestyle kind of, it really gained popularity. I feel like people from around the world really gravitated towards it. And I think its popularity went up. And like what you alluded to, I think it hit its peak a little while ago. Well, if you look at certain numbers, they're not attracting new fans really. And whether it's X Games followings or these events, they're battling to get the crowds like they did 15, 20 years ago. Sure. There's something else, too. And the videos at that time showed this complete lifestyle that was all-encompassing in freestyle. Sure. And that was very attractive to young people. That was people. cool, too, yeah. And they're not showing that, that party that we're doing everything all together and having a good time. They're not showing well, that anymore. That's the other component of it. Because like Mike said, like everything got very serious. It, yeah. was, a, it was a job. Right. And like I would say now, Twitch is going out and having fun and his stuff is, that's why his stuff is still popular. But these top freestyle guys that are doing this crap, these crazy tricks, they're working their ass off. It's not go out and party all night long and pimp and hoe no, parties no, and all that. And, that and, fun stuff that people wanted Twitch to see. And Twitch's transition to that, he started from the fun side, knowing that party side and going all the way over. So he's gotten to ride the wave how he wanted yeah. to ride it, and he's projecting what he wants to project now. And you know, those other guys can't do that. He's just stayed high the whole time. Yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> hey, high. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey, uh, go over to the whiskey throttle, or not the whiskey throttle show dot com. Our new website's up and running. Uh, you can buy all of our merchandise there. You can see all of the shows, listen to all the podcasts. And one thing I really recommend is is go on there, click on the podcast, and scroll through all the photos. Like Mike brought in a bunch of stuff from his scrapbook. Stuff when he was a kid. Uh, we got some cool stuff. He and I racing together in 87? That's a long time ago. 86 <laughs> or 87 at Blythe for the Kyle Fleming Memorial. Anyway, some neat stuff. All of our guests were taking as much as we can get out of their scrapbooks, their personal stuff, and uh, posting it up underneath their podcast so that you can scroll through that as you listen. A pretty cool feature. So check that out. And also, Mad Skills Motocross, I mention that every week. They got that tournament coming up. Uh, so stay dialed into that. That's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Let's get into it, Mets. You ready? Sure. We're going deep. 
Yeah, we got a long day ahead of us, right? <laughs> It'll be a while. Um, tell us where you grew up and uh, when you first, how and when you first got introduced to dirt bikes. Uh, I was born in Huntington Beach, California. 75? Uh, 75. Yeah. And my mom and dad basically grew up in that, that area. My dad was a motocross racer. And uh, actually, my mom ended up racing. She was into dirt bikes, going in the desert. And both my parents used to ride Makos at the time. Okay. So, yeah, my mom did a handful of races, like Corona Raceway. Um, yeah. Was I, Dad like, Ted was a competitive uh, local pro guy? Or yeah. what was he? Yeah? Yep. My dad, basically, Orange County. I think his main shop sponsor was like Will Smith Mako. Okay. Which is a shop out of the Orange County area. And um, yeah, so basically, because my dad was just hardcore motocross. Yeah. Uh, that's how I got into it pretty much from the time I was born, riding on his lap to, I guess, at three years old, he built me my first motocross track while I was riding a JR50 Suzuki. Oh, yeah. And then shortly after that, I think we moved from like Huntington Beach to Corona. Uh, around five years old okay. and then right around six years old I started racing motocross full-time and I think once I did start racing then it was pretty much every weekend of my life mm. you Do know? you think <laughs> that the move to Corona was partly because of the motocross scene? Um, I think at that time for my dad him being in construction it was just that that period in his life with uh, starting a family and needing to move more inland mm. um, you know, I think just at the time, it just was all all worked out in my dad's favor because my dad, you know, I think he definitely loves motocross more than anyone in my family. And, uh, you know, he religiously watches the Nationals. And Still? For cross. Yeah, every Saturday. He's right. got his whatever ready to film it <laughs> if he's not there. Well, the announcing's so good, you don't want to miss it. <laughs> oh, yeah. man, listen to this guy. Shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, what do they do without you? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fine. <laughs> so, yeah, no, just, you know, grew up as a kid pretty much riding dirt bikes every day. Do you remember your first race? Or, I mean, sounds like that was when you were really young. Corona Raceway would have been my first race. Um, On the JR? JR 50 yeah. Suzuki. Then, you know, shortly after starting to race there, going to De Anza Raceway, Paris Raceway. Yeah. You know, that was all our local scene. OCIR? Uh, yeah, Orange County Raceway. Yeah. Went there a few times. I think the last time I went to that track was for one of the Troy Lee Day in the Dirts before they moved it to, I think, Glen Helen. But, um, yeah, no, just a lot of different racing. You know, yeah. thinking back as far as, like, Big events that we probably rode as kids were Golden States, yeah. Trans Cows, all the CMC races, um, and then of course the bigger races, which would have been like the World Mini. Mm -hmm. You raced it at the old track then, outside of Henderson, probably the too. old one. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. That thing was gnarly. We talk about that on here regularly with guys that did yeah, it. Just like concrete. Well, that start, you remember, you're like 100 miles an hour into a sweeper, into a sky jump. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> thing would send you, you remember that? Nice and safe. I have a hard time uh, remembering the And tracks, the wind was blowing yeah. at 900 miles yeah, an hour. It was so sketchy. For sure. So who, I, I'm pretty sure I know, like the guys you grew up racing with, um, you know, like I think <laughs> You were to, one of them. <laughs> yeah, but I was in Arizona at the time, yeah, so yeah. like we would only meet up at bigger so races. I think there was a track that was like on the border of Arizona that we go for series races, which was like Thunder Valley or something. Thunder something oh, motocross, um, which I thought was more like your local track. Well, there was Canyon Raceway. That's probably... Canyon. And then there was a sand track called Thrasher Land. Thrasher. Huh. Um, I just remember it was like a track that went in between these canyons. and They had a Golden State there, too, one time. Yeah. Yep. And it almost kind of reminded me of uh, the Blythe track. Okay. You know, sand, Man. but with some hard pack. It might have been Canyon, but I just remember going there a couple times, and every time it was like, we're going to Dave Pingree's local track. Get ready. <laughs> I know. I think your dad, he didn't like us early on, huh? <laughs> I don't think my dad likes too many people, period. He just likes to mind his He's own competitive, business. He's uh, competitive. Very competitive. Yeah. I mean, I grew up, you know, being taught to win, and yeah. nothing else matters other than winning. Whatever you do, whether it's motocross or... Get yeah. your schoolwork done. It's it's time to win. Get the homework done the best you can. So no matter what it was is. Was Ted pretty tough on you? Yeah, for sure. 
I, d- I don't really remember my mom being tough on me, but if it was anything that, you know, was leading up to going racing, like getting your homework done, making sure that, you know, everything's packed up, ready to go. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Do you think that it was too much? Like, uh, as far as my dad being too much, I don't think so. Because I remember kids that their dads definitely were way too overboard. And, like, you know, okay. my dad was never, like, you know. Wasn't abusive about no, it. Or, no, no, yeah. it wasn't. You know, it was just more like you could tell he was bummed if you weren't going home with the the first place yeah. trophy. Then there was no conversation. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I think, yeah, there's just so many rides around the country where we're going to big races. And if, you know. Didn't win, man. It was a quiet trip home. <laughs> it's a, no music. Yeah, you know, yeah. I remember my dad not ever listening to music, so we would. You oh, know, that's the worst. For you know, going to Ponca City, Loretta Lynn's, all the way from California, and you're just in the box end like this with <laughs> dads like this. We're going racing. You know, no music. And then it's worse if you don't have a good race weekend mm. and you're driving back. Then it's that awkward silence. You're like. You never thought to ask, hey, Dad, can you, like, pop in a CD or something? Oh, if I ever asked to put music on, he cassette. would put country. <laughs> would have been a cassette tape. Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, eight track, was, sorry. Can you pop in an eight track? It was, it was cassettes at that yeah, time. Right, Come for on. sure. Huh. That's funny. But, yeah, no, my dad, you know, he just always did the best he could. Always get, got me the equipment that we needed. You know, I remember... Just always kind of being jealous of all the other kids that were out there on factory Suzuki bikes or Team Green bikes. And my dad was never one of those dads that needed to go kiss anyone's ass. He always believed in uh, if you're going to get that sponsorship or get that help, then your writing's going to speak for itself. So, you know, it was just... And then when I got old enough and I had to do the speaking for myself and, you know, do the resumes and... Mm-hmm. Do that stuff, then it became a real job. I wonder so, if kids do that these days, send resumes. <sighs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't no, know. because I think like a lot of them, it's like the parents get them in, and then there's either a team or something. I don't know. I just don't really hear about kids. Are you, I mean, think, are, you, are, you are you talking about through Instagram or Twitter? Or is that yeah, there's well, probably a website like uh, well, what yeah, is it? Hook, Sponsor House. Yeah, Sponsor or House. Ho- hook it or Sponsor hook it, yeah. House. Yeah. yeah, it kind of turned into that where people could just do their online resume. Yeah, and then any companies in the industry could like go through and yeah, it's all digital. Yeah, my favorite sure. thing is. Guy could never race in his life. He's sponsored by everyone that's on there. <laughs> we see potential. I got 5% off, man. I'm a factory, uh, you know, so that's a, a big deal. I got some free stickers. Well, Nets brought in his a resume from, what is that, 87? Yeah, I think so. It's well, like all, it's pretty rad. I'll post it up. But um, I remember sitting down and typing those out and doing the whole deal. Sending them to everyone. I, sure. hand, everyone. I, used, I, I just hand wrote mine. Did you? We, we'd throw in a couple black and white photocopy pictures. And then, kind of tailor it to that sponsor. Well, that's cool. Some were pretty cheesy. It must though. have worked. I read one from the <laughs> Team Green guy that I sent to him, and I was like, "Oh, that's so." Good. I'm like, it was so corny. But hey, sponsor me. I'm good. <laughs> it was something along those lines. <laughs> so, who else were you racing with, though? I'm, I think back to that era. I think of Don Upton, oh, Decker. Yeah. Um, yeah, as far as local competition, it was always Decker. Was you know, from what I could remember some of the big races or like, I don't know, Verona Oaks was just a really cool track that yeah. I remember growing up to where it was just different than all the other tracks, Yeah, you know, and the Oak trees, big jumps. Yeah. Um, I think too, they could, they could have their track a little, a little harder to ride or with bigger jumps because it was on Indian reservation land. Mm. Hey, but That's do you remember the remember. bathroom there at Verona Oaks? I think it was a concrete, it was it was pretty bad, yeah. Was it? Oh my god! I don't it remember was the bathroom. Bad. Oh yeah. Well, that's where the saying comes from: brick shit house. <laughs> yeah, right. I remember. I remember concrete watching book. Dana Wiggins down there when he was a Suzuki guy. Um, like a lot of guys that are mechanics now in the industry, the Albrechts. I remember them watching them race at Brona. I don't know why that sticks in my yeah. head, but. Uh, but uh, other than Craig Decker and him being my main competition, and then every once in a while, like you said, da- uh, Damon Huffman would be in there, but he was always a little older. Um, I don't know. I just remember really you and Decker as mm-hmm. far as like psh, always battling and, you know, being yeah. like, damn, I got to race these guys again. <laughs> 
it was funny back then because you would show up and be like, oh, okay, Metzger's here. Oh, Decker's here. Oh, who, you know, you're always sizing up who's there. For sure. I, I don't know. I guess that's it's still like game. That. Yeah, for I guess sure. that's part of the but game. But it was the same when we grew up because like we would race the guys in our area like in our state. But then nationals and that would go to someone else's local track. The same thing. Like, oh, he's there. He's, he'll be good yeah. today. And oh, they, that guy won yellow. You know, you do the same thing. You size up it. It's fun looking back on it. I remember being like, it's pretty stressful as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, shit, okay. You see that guy, you're like, oh, damn it. He's so how there. did you guys race each other when you raced together? I don't think anyone was dirty that I remember. Yeah, except no. for when I cleaned Decker out, like he said. That yeah, time. no, I don't. That wasn't my idea. I don't Can remember any of us. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, tell us. What I think we was told Well, Mets remembers because we were both Suzuki support. Yeah, and I just remember because my dad, you know, was basically getting the bag from Decker's dad, like, it was your fault too. Mike was involved. It's, you know, there. I think you and I were both riding Suzukis. Yeah. Were you maybe on one side of him? Like just incidentally, I think. Ponca City. No, no. I, I for some reason think that you were in the middle. Craig was on one side of you, and then I was on another side. But you came out of the gate so hard and cleaned out his front end. He just automatically lost his balance, grabbed a handful, and went into, and went into oh, me. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure that's kind of what I remember, Craig, but all Craig, I remember is my dad got it from Craig's dad saying that we were part of you taking him out off yeah. the start, and I think you know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> real, just real quick, Craig Decker was kicking our asses at Ponca City this year. 91? I think what so. What did we say? Yeah. Maybe he was 90. 91 because I, I graduated in 93. And so, so what happened? He'd grab, he'd grab every so whole he shot. So he won all, all the first motors. He'd whole shot and be gone. And so Jeff DeMint who was a pretty aggressive racer at the time. He was Suzuki support. He was riding 125s in. He said, hey, listen, start in first gear. When you jump out, of the, you Slide line up the next tire. to him, and you just, yeah, get the tire super hot, and you come out of the gate, and you move over and block his line. That way he's got a shut off. It sounded great in my head. <laughs> because I couldn't, by the time I would get up into second or third, whatever, Craig is just gone, you know? And I'm like, man, I got to do something. So the second moto of one of these classes, <laughs> just, and, you know, you don't practice this, so I'd, I'm Most just going to have to move over, move over, move over. So I jump out of the gate, and I <laughs> right. guess I just went over super hard. And as he mentioned, Craig immediately goes down, takes Mike out, who was left of me. <laughs> and when we came back in, it was a brawl in the pit. Like, Will yeah. Decker was hot, rightfully so. And, yeah, I guess they thought you were in on it. Yeah. Obviously, anyone that was riding Suzuki was in on it. For yeah. sure. Team tactics. I know how hey, all, all of the 39 people in the gate were in on it. <laughs> well, anyway... <laughs> I, it wasn't my proudest It's moment. crazy to think back, though, because we were all probably around 15 years old. I think it was 14 to 15 yeah. class. Yeah. And uh, just, you know, it just is funny to think back how serious we were as kids and our parents and racing, how serious it is from the time you yeah. start. F for sure. And if you're good, you know. Well, when you look at serious stuff. People's, yeah. People's careers. <laughs> The next race is the biggest thing. Think about it. It's yeah. always the next big thing. So at the moment, it's the biggest thing that's happened in your racing career. For sure. Because we look back now, and I remember like there was stuff like my dad getting a fist fight because I took some kid out for a club race trophy. You know, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. really? We went right, that far? <laughs> right now, like we that's look funny. back on it with this different perspective, and you go, God, what were we so worked up about? <laughs> it's a mini bike racing. <laughs> Take a chill <laughs> pill. Yeah. And you, you know, you think, man, why weren't our dads? It's sharing some of that perspective with us. But they were into it just as much as we were. They were For fully sure. invested. Will was willing to come over and punch my dad out if that's what it said. Like, you know what I mean? For sure. It's funny to think back it's on it. Serious though. stuff, racing motocross. Well, you're spending, you know, they're spending a lot of money for, you know, I don't think any of our dads were rich. No. And like, spending a lot of money driving across the country. So, so that added to their passion yeah. because when things didn't go good I always felt like we had to hear about every penny that they spent on your <laughs> lousy <laughs> racing career <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's funny so you were doing were you doing just kind of mostly west coast stuff at that time I know you did Loretta's and Ponca did you go to like mini O's or my dad always told me that he wasn't going to take me to any, any of these big races until I was an expert okay so like when we were younger and doing all the uh, local big races like the cmc golden state we weren't traveling too much we traveled uh i don't know here and there we'd yeah. go up up north mammoth or yeah do the yeah. mammoth every year but my dad always said you ain't riding uh any big events until you're an expert uh 80 expert rider and i went and the year that i got to go i 
think at Ponca City I ended up with like a fourth and a fifth. I think it was fifth and super mini. My dad built me a bad to the bone uh, super mini Suzuki back then with the big wheels and mm -hmm. So that was cool. And then I think two weeks later, we go to uh, Loretta Lens, and I ended up winning the championship there. And I still look back, and throughout my whole motocross career, there's a lot of cool stuff I got in the do. But I think just and you beat Decker, and uh, who's third? I'm not sure who got third, oh, I think but I Decker and I had a big battle the whole race, and I was racing with a broken ankle that oh, I broke Casey my Johnson. ankle. Casey Johnson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I remembered in my parade lap. Uh, two days prior to that race that I ended up winning and beating Decker, I ended up blowing out my ankle on the parade lap, just cruising around. And you probably know that where there's like a big rain rut that goes through the yeah. track yep. close to the finish line. Yep. At, um, like Lens. a water drainage. Yeah, water drainage. I kind of just took my eyes off the track looking around. And as my front end dropped in there, there was a boulder. Oh. And it freaking just knifed me to the ground. Peg caught my ankle broke my ankle of course dad wasn't going to have me not race driving that far across country so taped it up or what? taped it up iced it throughout the days and um ended up winning basically the biggest race that you can win as a mini bike guy and you know beat my main competition at the time which was craig and uh to look back at that i think is is one of the biggest events that i got to win and be a part of of my life because my dad put so much effort into you know, everything leading up to that. Yeah. You can race that race when you're an expert, and I did, and did the best I could, so that was cool. There was lots of good talking on the way home. For sure, <laughs> besides being in pain. You didn't yeah. need the music at that point. But, but to look back on that trip, matter of fact, because I went to my parents' house and looked at all those pictures before. Yeah. Before we left on the road trip to Ponca City, my dad was getting all the bikes dialed in, and he ended up getting on one of them, I think it was my mod bike, and ended up driving it or riding it down the driveway and it got whiskey throttle, something happened and the dude ended up going off the side of the cliff at our property and just scratching his whole body. This was prior to driving cross country oh to gosh. go to Oklahoma, then to Tennessee. So my dad wrecked and just scratched himself. Just so he wasn't, he wasn't happy to start the trip. <laughs> but yeah, to come home with a, with a win and... And, uh, you know, to be a part of that winning yeah. list of riders that grew up riding yeah. Lord of Lens is pretty cool. Well, like you said, to go out and beat Decker, he was the guy. He definitely I mean, was. at the end of the day, he was the guy. Right. Yeah. I mean, we were Suzuki dudes. He was their main mini bike Cowie dude. Right. But he was solid, man. Like, he For was sure. tough to beat. Huffman could beat him, like you said, when he dropped down, but he was always a year ahead of us. Yeah. So, like, he'd be in our class for a year, and then he'd be out. Yeah. Be in our so, class like, for a year, be out. your first year was his last year kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, cool. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm stoked. I only got one title at Loretta's, but like it means a lot for sure. You know what I mean? Like that's a big deal. And I, I look at um, I think the 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 thing that means the most to me about it is the experiences and the memories with my dad. Yeah, because sure. it, it meant so much to them too. You know, and it was such a cool all that, that work, all that build up to it to go back there and like do it together yeah it's cool yeah no, i think that's the best thing as far as looking back and the different things i've gotten to do with my career as a, a bike rider and um just getting to relive those moments yeah. with my dad yeah. because he was like i said he's more passionate about bikes than i think i have ever been yeah you know? <laughs> that's interesting so. do you guys so like when i talk to my dad now we don't, there's, we don't really, there's not much to talk about in terms of racing. I mean, what are we going to talk about? He doesn't watch the races really anymore. So Is it because of the announcing? <laughs> the announcing so. <laughs> Just, uh, so our conversations are kind of like, so, yeah, what's going on? Yeah, the weather, you know, yeah. It's like, we don't have anything to talk about anymore, in a sense. You know, because it always was racing. Sure, For sure. Yeah. Do you find that with your dad? I guess you guys can still talk racing because he's so into it. Yeah, it just seems like he's every time I go over to his house, it's on the TV. Yeah. You know, something that got recorded from the weekend, and um, I'm not into it. No, no, you, you don't know, follow it. Watch it. I much? never f have followed motocross since I quit. I mean, wow. since I stopped racing Supercross, and then never really. You know, I wasn't the type of kid that wanted to watch Supercross or motocross, or even if I could as a kid, I don't mm. think you know. 
You always liked bicycles. You were into yeah. downhill and BMX and all that dirt jumping. Yeah, I wanted to race BMX as a kid, but of course, you know, I had motorcycles because that was my dad's thing. And I remember going to a track in Norco. Uh, he took me there to check it out, and we'd get out of the car, go up to the fence, we're watching, and I remember looking over at me, going. Why would I let you go out on the track and do one lap at a time? You can go to the motocross track and do a 30-minute <laughs> moto. You're done. You go home, get your homework done, and do it again the next day. Motocross. <laughs> Hardcore he, he Ted. It. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just he Hardcore lives, <laughs> lives, eats, and breathes motocross. That's just. He's uh, like, Mike, why aren't you out there racing right now? Yeah. I, I love Ted. <laughs> so, no, it's. It's cool though, because he still rides. He's you know got dual sport Does he? bikes and yeah. and then his other passion is mountain biking and keeps him in shape. But that's awesome. You know, for me, he brought up bicycles. I just uh, always wanted to race BMX bikes as a kid. Didn't get to until just this uh, early this year. I actually did my first BMX race at 44. Oh, really? Yeah, on my way to the Grands, I took my 10 year old and um, my lady's eight year old to. Oh, was it Tulsa, Oklahoma? Yeah. And on our way there, we met up with Randy Lawrence and his kid and yeah. family and got to go to a bunch of skateboard parks, BMX races. I did my first race. I won, which was really cool. And, well, aren't uh, you involved in a BMX <laughs> track up? Lucerne. Up in, yeah, okay. Lucerne Valley. Um, they ended up having a parks and rec track that has been closed for maybe like five years okay and they were looking for somebody to take it over so i said shoot i'm only 20 minutes up up the back of the mountain yeah big bear and so we took it over and we've been doing all the reworking of the track and and my kids really into it my 10 year old maxton uh that's his you know his his passion is bmx Mm -hmm. racing and so we've just been trying to do as much racing as we can with him and of course now we're all on break but uh once everything goes back to normal, hopefully we'll be doing mm. some racing for USA BMX at the track and traveling and, you know, hopefully going back to some big races this year. That's well, cool. If so you're not 2020, to... then maybe 2021. It's cool that you're, what you were passionate as a kid, your kid is passionate about. So you're yeah. kind of getting to do it. Yeah. Which is crazy him, yeah. because like today I got to go and hang out with my mom and my sister was there looking at all these pictures and I'm looking at pictures of my younger sister, Megan. And there's one of her and I next to our box fan, and she's in a jersey. And she's never raced or anything, yeah. but, you know, now to see where my sister is in life and has two kids, and her son, Nixon, is just eats, breathes, and sleeps, and is so serious about motocross. And oh, I think, really? I think he's only five, six years old, <laughs> and he's been going to the track. He's been at Ted's house. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Your dad sunk his uh, claws in there, like, come here, boy. So it's just rad because, you know, looking at these pictures of my sister, yeah. I'm sure she had it in her back then, the excitement of being around her brother and her dad who were into motocross. And she didn't get to live it, being mm-hmm. a girl. You know, my dad was like, no, girls need to stay away from the track. Like, yeah. we're at the office. This is where we work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, now my sister, having kids, she's yeah. fully sunk into the sport with her son, and he's good. He wins all the local. Is that right? Yeah, he's really oh, good. Man. So it must be in the blood. Yeah. But also his dad uh, is a local dude named Sp- Spencer Meineke. Okay. And the Meinekees were locals that grew up around Lake Elsinore racing. and him. So he was a rider yeah too. so he's a rider and it's cool just to you know see as the family grows yeah. and that you know my sister and her husband who are just you know totally into motocross <laughs> because of their families yeah. now they have a little guy that's out there and he's just yeah. ripping it up that's pretty neat have you gone to watch him ride yeah. race a little bit yeah. yeah gone over to paris um several months ago just to go root him on and yeah. it was like from that race on he just like started getting more and more serious and his dad you know, went out and bought race cobras, and oh, oh, so yeah. he's totally sunk. You know, Fully invested. <laughs> for sure. Dude, those cobras are pretty gnarly. <laughs> I, I was, I mean, you, I rode a Weisinger, like that was my first bike, probably the same pace as the JR50. Yeah, those cobras are insane compared for to those. Sure. Yeah, no, I didn't really have a trick 50, as to say. Like, a lot of guys, like Damon Huffman's dad was, you know, in the oh, modern yeah. out 50s back then. Uh, Robbie Raynard's dad, he always, you know, had sick 50s. Yeah. Uh, one of the dudes that had some of the sickest bikes growing up that I remember just being like, 
shoot, how are we going to beat that guy? <laughs> was Ezra Lusk. Yeah. And he had the all DMC those DMC bikes. bikes that were just insane, right? <coughs> you know, the yeah. sweetest factory mini bikes yeah. that you could ever put your eyes on. Do you remember one year, it had to be 87, 87, 88, there was a, at the old world mini track, you did this bowl turn around where the tower was, and then there was like a drop with a jump out there, and the pros were doubling it. And Ezra was doing it on his 60. Do you remember that? I think, I mean, and I have it, a hard time remembering back, but as far as like thinking about the track and at the time remembering Ezra on, on those bikes, it was just, you know, he was always the guy to beat. His dad would be out there yelling at him to like, go oh, jump it. And Dave Miller's like, <laughs> you'd have this massive lead. It's not you know? necessary. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, I totally know what you're saying. Uh, the R&D 80s and those DMC Cowies, unreal. Yeah. Some of the coolest stuff growing yeah. up. <laughs> um, speaking of like one-off cool stuff, I remember you back from, I can't remember exactly the year, but you showed up on this mountain bike. This is back when mountain biking was first really even starting to grow. That San Andreas mountain, mountain cycle, cycle or something? Yep. That was the coolest bike. It was like raw aluminum, full suspension. Oh, I remember seeing It was one of the first of maybe full suspension bikes. Yep. Yeah, I think as far as one of those in high-end downhill bikes, as far as the mountain biking market kind of going yeah. that direction, um, I can't remember the the dude's name who ended up producing those yeah. bicycles, but he was a pretty popular guy in motocross. I want to say his name was Robert Reisinger or something. Okay, that built those bikes. But um, I ended up getting a sponsorship just through motocross. I think that was around '91. And then around 93, I graduated high school, and somehow I ended up getting involved with Intense, with Jeff Steber over at Intense Mountain Bikes, um, and I ended up trying to go race downhill mountain bikes on the Norba professional scene that year. What year was that? I want to say it was right around 94. Okay. All I remember, at the same time, I was getting into tattooing also, it's like... Okay. You know, kind of almost like the start of my tattoo career, but also playing around with the mountain bikes. And then I ended up uh, going up to Spokane, Washington for one of the normal races and had to race against John Tomac, <laughs> Eli Tomac's dad yeah. at, at the time. And there's like, you know, downhill wasn't really downhill. Like, yeah, it was a, yeah, yeah, fire roads where you come around and you'd have to sprint up a fire road for yeah. minutes yeah. and then back down. So, you know, for me, it wasn't that fun. Yeah. So I like going fast. Um, I like scaring myself. You know, being out of control and on the edge is how I ride. I like to, you know, keep it in control, but also, you know, I just know my limits. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's BMX, mountain biking, motocross, road race. I've tried a lot of different things in my life, and I'm always on the edge. You know, that's why yeah. I don't go sky skydive, you know, because I'm going to crash. I just, everything I've <laughs> That's done. not a good one. That's a bad crash. <laughs> you know? yeah. Didn't you catch on fire road racing or your bike caught on fire or something? My racing? truck. Yeah. yeah, my truck caught on fire. I was uh, doing the core series uh, uh, before I hung that up. It was like my last year getting paid by Monster to freestyle, and I was using all my Monster money to off-road and buy parts for my truck and go racing, and they weren't really pumped on that. They wanted <laughs> me to be at all the freestyle events. Yeah. They had stuff in Mexico called the X-Fighters, yeah. and uh, they wanted me to be doing stuff like that, and I was kind of over the whole freestyle, and you know, I just wanted to do something different, which was off-road. And I ended up burning my truck down in Chula Vista. And then shortly after that, uh, Deegan ended up buying my truck as a practice truck when he started getting into it, along with Twitch and all those dudes. That off-road truck racing seems like a way to spend money. Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely, you need, you need to have a lot of money to do it, or you need to have sponsors that are just like, you yeah, know, yeah, here's yeah. money, eat it and shit it out. Yeah. It's just, it's weird. It's a lot of fun and it was, you know, really competitive. But at the same time, I didn't really dig it as much as uh, just being on a bike. Yeah. You know, I feel the same way. I try to dabble a little bit and same thing. One, I was like, 
I'm not investing all this money of my own. And secondly, I was like, I didn't get the same feeling as being just out riding. I like sure. that freedom feel. I, For sure. I'm not really a guy that likes to be caged in. Yeah, I like to be able to move around yeah, and yeah. feel fluid with my bike and the things that I'm doing. Where you're in a truck or a, a buggy or a car, you're, you're yeah. stuck. Are you claustrophobic yeah, at all? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I am, and I think that's part of my problem. Yeah, is the claustrophobia. I, yeah, I definitely didn't like like you know you got to wear a, a heat mask or a fire protection mask in the tight helmet. Oh yeah, it's hot as hell. And you're strapped in, in tight, and the windshield is basically a barbecue grate, so you're battling the sea to begin For with, sure. and you get roosted and all that. I remember I sat in there, I was just like, oh shit, yeah. what did I get myself into? I was like <laughs> hyperventilating yeah. before the race started. Yeah, no, it's it's good to hear that because same thing. I you know it was fun while it lasted. It was something i wanted to try i got to try it i had money to do it but in the long run it wasn't something that i was passionate about uh, yeah you know, like definitely bicycles taking my kid now I, at my age i can't go and race bmx or downhill with the pros you just I, won no, I, which it, I think it was novice yeah <laughs> hey, <laughs> gotta you gotta start, start somewhere, somewhere right yeah. just for, leave that part off i won my last <laughs> yeah, I race did. i won my <laughs> last race you're only as good as your last exactly. race right i'm kind of a big deal you're the best right now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, like seriously, I've always been passionate about bikes. That's why I moved to Big Bear in the first place. Mm. Um, I was still getting some help from Monster to pretty much go and do whatever I wanted to. And that was downhill racing and going to some of the bigger races like the Mammoth um, downhill that they had there. And I thought it was just really cool that yeah. I still got to do that. And then my son, Myrie, who's 17 now, uh, when we first moved to Big Bear, he was in the downhill mountain biking okay. and in a short period of time maybe three years he won some championships in his age group won some stuff with slalom and then uh his passion is snowboarding he fell into going snowboarding during the winter and then once uh you know pretty much like this it's summertime he tries to skate bike a little bit but mostly he just waits for that winter time so that's his jam that's his jam and then my little guy max he's 10 and he just loves bmx and Fortnite. oh <laughs> like yeah, any kids. Kid. yeah. Uh, and then i, I have my 18 year old daughter michaela and she pretty much is just uh a go-getter just you know does her own thing what's she doing is she gonna go to college is she gonna she actually is an artist Oh, really? Um, she's bounced around different jobs up in Big Bear, and she just actually moved away from Big Bear to go do some stuff with uh, her grandparents down in the San Dimas area. So cool. She kind of just does her thing. That's about it. Yeah. I can, awesome. you know, she's more like me than any of the kids as far as just, you know, kind of. On her, on her on program. Her, yeah, yeah, on her program. Just if she wants to do art one day, she's doing art. If she feels like she needs to go work, she's making yeah. money. Yeah. So she'll cool. figure it out. She's like a pro gypsy. Yeah. yeah. She's got it dialed <laughs> in. Well, the thing is, at 18, that is that is the time you go and figure out what, what, what makes you tick, what you enjoy, sure. what you want to do. So. Yeah. I, 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 I talked to uh, Sean Palmer last night. He Once in a while, we just kind of check in on each other. You know, he's isolated up there north of Reno, <laughs> out on some property. So I got to make sure he's alive up there once in a while. But um, I told him you were coming on, and he's like, I can't say what he said. He's like, F yeah, Matt, man, I love that guy. I told him, I said, what's up? But he goes, hey, guys, I think he's the guy that got me into mountain biking. You know, me and him and RL would go, you know, mess around at Big Bear and yeah. thinks you and, and, and one of the, introduced him to Jeff Steber. So anyway, yeah. he said to say hi. Yeah, it's pretty cool to know that guy growing up because he was definitely one of those dudes, those outsiders in his sport yeah. that I always tended to kind of look towards, yeah. you know, like. I guess with motocross, number one dude would would have always been Ricky Johnson. Two hip, always had that, you know, Edge. his own attitude. Um, and then you know, guys like Palmer basically stood alone in his sport. Glenn Plake for skiing. Yeah. Um, Greg Herbald for mountain biking. The dudes yeah. that were just kind of clowny and did their own thing. And Pete basically Steve artists. Pete. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, when you say clowning and palm in the same sentence, it makes sense. Well, no, listen, I, because I, I feel like he kind of set, um, he set the tone for like post race celebration stuff. Like, if you ever watch that guy win his snowboard stuff or even a downhill mountain bike race and roll up to the podium in a gold lame suit with yeah. a king's crown, like, you know, champagne in one hand, yeah. trophy in the other, and just run his mouth. 
it was awesome. Like for sure. And not definitely. many people can pull it. You would say, be one that could pull that. When you, know you can I mean? back it up, it's the best. For yeah. Sure. Anyway. Yeah. No, Palms was one of those dudes that I always thought was way cool because he did his own thing. Yeah. And that story I told you as far as mountain biking and trying to go pro mountain bike and going up to Spokane, shortly after that, I came back and I told the intense guys that, you know, this isn't what I want to be doing. And I was hanging out with Randy Lawrence and Palm at the time, and I think I had a handful of downhill bikes, so I'd take them up to Big Bear. And next thing, I was going one direction, probably tattooing, and then those guys were racing mountain bikes full yeah. on, had full factory ride from Intense, winning races. And well, think, Palm rode for Specialized, and he, I think he made more money than... Maybe anyone in that sport ever has Probably. in terms of a salary. They were paying him some absurd amount of money. He was going to the races in that big Prevo bus. I mean, he was larger than life in that sport for <laughs> yeah. a minute. He definitely changed the sport of mountain biking as far as it being the, uh, the Lycra tight wearing yeah. sport to full blown going motocross yeah. image, you know? Yeah. Good guy. Anyway, yeah, great dude. Um, okay, so I wanted, this, this threw me off when I was looking through some of the results. You raced the LA Supercross in 92. But in 92, I was still racing amateur, 125 intermediate. So I was like, did you jump up and just like bump right to pro? In 92, huh? It showed you at the LA Coliseum in 92. Okay, because I graduated in 93, so yeah. I kind of based different stuff around that. Um, I did. That was my first Supercross race, okay. which is really crazy. It's a totally lame story. <laughs> there was a dude that I was battling in the last chance qualifier, there ended up being like some crash. I come across the finish line and my dad's just all bombed and pissed, already thinks that it's over, we're going home, pack up, we're going home. Well, pretty sure at the time, the Suzuki team manager, Pat, Pat, Alexander, yeah. Pat Alexander, calls my dad the next day or two, which would have been early in the week, Supercross run Saturday, right? Yeah. So Monday morning, my dad gets a phone call, and I'm on Suzuki. I'm a factory support rider. Uh, Pat asks, why didn't Mike ride the main event? My first Supercross, dude, I show up. I made the main event. My dad thought by seeing, you know, he still probably wants to apologize about that today for oh, supercross man. i made it i got the last qualifying spot but he didn't think but he, he didn't think he and he didn't <sighs> he was just automatically fuck we're going home pack up <laughs> so angry ted no talking yeah, all the way home but uh yeah so no i did race the supercross at la coliseum first one made the main event but went home just thought that I that's hilarious. It. That's so, probably the only time in history that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard I, my, I don't, you don't hear that a lot. No, that's never happened before. Nobody's ever thought, I didn't make it, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. Usually people go look at the results, you, you know? Think, yeah, you think. I'm just spitballing. But here. that yeah. was probably also before where you could just walk up somewhere and get a printout. Right. You know, or have it, you they know, had now printers they have back it. then, GL. I promise. No, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But it was also with the I, AMA. Yeah. I think Good it was point. handwritten. Yeah. Honestly, I think it was all handwritten scoring. And so you went up and it was all Well, that was how it was that they would get some of them, the moms, to just to do lap scoring. Because yeah. I remember some of them, the prize giving, just hearing big arguments about the lap scoring. So uh -huh. you, because we were riding mini bikes in 91, so you went right to big bikes and right to pro? Yeah. Pretty much. You must have. Yeah, no, I think that was one of the things, too, like moving out of mini bikes, because you move up before you turn 16. Uh-huh. And then I probably did a, a handful of intermediate races, local, like at Paris. And then uh, pretty much, I think my dad and I were like, you know, talked about it and said, I think I felt it was better to just move yeah. up instead of winning everything in intermediate. Yeah. So wait a we second, were, though. Was what did your time. dad, how did he break that news to you? Uh, just like any dad would, he doesn't want to, but I had to remember him being like, hey, I got a phone call from Pat. <laughs> you missed the main event. You actually made the main event. You know, it's pretty much like that. And they're just like, I don't think I was too worried about it. <laughs> I'm sure he was way more bummed than I was. <laughs> <laughs> like, whatever, Dad. I just want to go ride BMX. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the other thing, maybe this sort of... Uh, uh, around that age, you might have also hit a growth spurt because a lot of times you hear when guys, some guys move at different levels from 80s to 125s or whatever. Well, and a lot of times it depends on when, guy, like, 
kids hit their growth spurts. We would have been 16, though, because being born, we were both born at 75. You know, we were, we were at the, we were barely qualified for 14 and 15 in 91 for mini bikes. You know what I'm saying? We were 16 already then. Mm -hmm. So we were 16 going into 92. Yeah. Cause I was probably 16 years old at Loretta's, but racing the 14, 15 class. Cause where the cutoff is. Yeah. yeah. How they work it. I want to say too, that, uh, one of the reasons too, I ended up moving up to pro, which is weird to say, but, um, Going into Loretta Lynn's in Ponca that following year uh-huh. and being an intermediate rider, I ended up like the week before blowing out my humerus, battling with uh, with Donald Upton at okay. Paris. And I remember just being so bummed and so shocked that I wasn't going to be able to go to Loretta's in Ponca as my first year as an intermediate because i remember you know i had won yeah. as a mini bike guy now it's on i'll get to go and do the big races and yeah. race everyone that's fast and i ended up blowing out my arm and i remember just you know trying to get my doctor to pin it so i could race and he wasn't having that he made me heal and uh i think once i got back into it it was just like dude let's Screw just it. ride pro yeah. let's you know this is yeah. my job it's been my job for years since a mini bike dude taking it that serious that you just automatically like dude let's ride pro well and i think that group of us decker yourself obviously huffman he was probably already pro then but we were fast enough to get in and be competitive in the pro class anyway for sure so yeah, you were probably beating you were probably winning the pro class at Paris on yeah. the weekend. You and Upton. Upton was fast. There. Yeah, he was fast there. And and then L- Lynn Kogel had his moments. Yeah. So. In his Beavis and Butthead box van. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, I saw pictures of my box van that had freaking uh, the Coyote and Roadrunner on the side. I remember <laughs> seeing pictures of that before. I remember that one. That's right. <laughs> you were posed up in front of it. I forgot about that box, man. And Bill, big Bill's pipe down the side uh-huh. and neon riding. Yeah. You and Bill were tight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, 93, you did some West Coast Supercross. Um, I think maybe two or three only. Might have gotten hurt. Do you remember that year? Around what year? 93. 93 would, you know, I don't even remember. Yeah. I mean, well, I just know some of the Supercross races that, you know, stand out. Probably the best event that I ever did or a sixth place in the 125 class riding for Moto Triple X, I think, in 98. Yeah. That was like in Houston. Mile, uh, mile High Stadium, Colorado. Oh, okay. Okay. That was one of my best that I I finished. thought I had. You raced. I did a race in, Oh, you got seventh at Houston. And that was in 94. In 94? Yeah. But yeah. again, you only did like three rounds. So yeah, I was, I was always hurt. Yeah, you know, it just seemed like I couldn't stay consistent as far as getting to where I felt comfortable not riding and racing hurt all the time. Yeah, there was always something that was in major pain. Okay, so we both had shared one other thing: our first national, '93 Glen Helen. That was when that they was did the one, the one, one moto format. forty minute moto. Yeah, you I got that? the whole shot. Battled with uh, Emig for a little bit. I'm pretty sure Emig won. Yeah, but, and I worked my way back to twelfth. I, you finished 14th. Did I? Yeah, because I looked at the results. Okay. I got 15th. You did? <laughs> yeah. I beat you? Yeah. <laughs> I was number 90. I earned number 90 for the next year, and you were 85. And then I went the next year and got the NCY, yeah, NCY yeah. Yamaha ride. Yeah. What did you end up riding? Uh, just Suzuki support. Oh, okay. Oh, um, so you got a 15th. The same deal. I got a 14th. So I worked one of your uh, better outdoors, Pink. Yeah. Top 15. He was probably working his <laughs> way from like 30th to 15th as I'm working my way from first to well, 15th. Dude, I told these guys, I pulled off with like two laps to go. I told my dad, I'm like, I, I can't. I'm done. I'm seeing stars. Like my vision was all. Yeah, know. there was something with the uh, the sky as far as how crazy polluted smog. the sky was. Yeah. yeah, Crazy smog. It was hot. It was 105 or something crazy. No, not Glen Helen. It, it was, was probably little... nice and smooth and prepped well as well. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was great. It was typical Glen Helen in the summer. But I, And my dad, like, screamed at me, you get your ass going, what are you doing pulling in? So, anyway, terrible. So, terrible that was experience. our first national. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, then you did. You rode for Moto Triple X one year. Yeah. Was that fun? That had to be a good time. Um, I just... They always made me feel really uncomfortable at the Moto Triple X deal. You know, I come from a Christian family, raised going to church. Yeah. So to be sponsored by Porn Star, you know, we my dad was my mechanic. I remember mm. I still have pictures where he's wearing a, a mechanic shirt and it says 
porn star as a sponsor. Oh. And so, you know, looking back, you know, it wasn't meant to last long. Yeah. It was cool at the time. They helped me out what yeah. I needed. But at the Glen Helen National that year, um, I ended up getting smashed by Ray Crumb. He landed in the back of me, and I ended up, like, doing a flip over the top of him and landed on his rear uh, fender and got sucked into the rear tire and got stuck in the rear tire of Ray Crumb's bike. And then Ray Crumb jumped on my bike and tried to take off and ride my bike, same as he did with Tommy Clowers at a Supercross. Remember when Clowers' yeah, leg got that. stuck yeah. in? So. Yeah, one of those incidences with Ray Crumb, and um, shortly after that, I went to the Moto Triple X guys, and I said, it's, this isn't going to work out. I yeah. think it was more on my heart to not ride for a team yeah. that was, you know. It was pretty rough, dude, uh, as far as the whole sport at that time. Because remember, Skin Industries, for sure. Al Borda yeah, yeah. is literally doing porn, and he's you know making graphics and all that. Porn producer. Oh, I forgot all about him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was big. Oh, there was Skin some scandal. Some, something happened with him. Yeah, it was just I'm weird. sure it's been more yeah. than one, I think. <laughs> it was a weird time, let's say, because there definitely was sponsors involved with the industry flesh, that flesh had their wood, money flesh, in yeah. there that were like coming from stuff. places that weren't legit. You know what I'm saying? And and I think that matters. You know, you don't, you don't want to ride for a company that is dirty money because it's not in the long run it's just not going to pay off it just doesn't work like yeah, that yeah i feel like if yeah i mean that was just the vibe at the time between moto triple x the movie and and uh crusty and all of those what was the company they all wrote for um well flesh wound films yeah. i guess right it was those guys yeah it was just a it was, it was a just a bunch. crazy time yeah. for the whole motorcycle industry you yeah. know cuz the filming was something that was starting to get bigger with not only the free ride guys that didn't care about racing, yeah. but then even the motorcycle, the fast guys like M. Egan and McGrath. Well, then the top dudes were getting more involved with the dudes that were doing the videos. Yeah. And but when you watch some of those videos, you started seeing f like Fox gear, you know, getting involved in four sure. and, you know, you had the moto industry kind of seeing that this was, what people were gravitating yeah. to. Did you have girls dancing in cages when you were there on that time? No, they were cage free. That was, that was I hard. think that was, or it was Clowers. Didn't Clowers, yeah. Clowers do like the biggest jump over like the most girls or something? Something like that. <laughs> oh yeah, that was hard. I forgot about that too. There was a lot of crazy stuff yeah. going on at that time. That's pretty funny, man. Um, all right, so 94, again, you just did a few rounds, three rounds. That was to get the seventh at Houston. 94, huh? 95, to only did two races. These were both NCY years. Okay. You only did two Supercrosses, and I don't see any Nationals that year. Yeah, I remember I did a Supercross at uh, Daytona, which was kind of super gnarly. Yeah. And then after that, I kind of was like, I don't know if I really want to be doing this. Yeah. And well, that took some time off. And that was kind of the time when they started doing those expression sessions. Like they were doing them overseas. They were doing For them. Sure. Do they what? did one at LA. They would just have, they didn't call it a freestyle contest because freestyle wasn't even really a thing yet. No, it was the expression sessions because I remember <laughs> That's a watching. That's funny name. <laughs> um, you know, I started going over and getting invited to do super crosses. But because they were also having the expression sessions, I got to do, you know, a couple contests with McGrath. Uh, Michael Craig was that one in, I want to say, in France. Mm -hmm. um, and Button. Yeah. yeah. yeah Button would do the can-can. Can, can. yeah. Jeremy had the knack-knack. Yeah, so that's when tricks were just... Mad Mike would throw a helmet bag over and, and do a no <laughs> crash into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> End up in the grandstands and win it. Didn't Mike Craig, like, miss the flight on the way back or some crazy stuff with that? I'm I would have sure. to imagine. <laughs> that sounds that right. was pretty standard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But th those were a big draw at those European supercrosses. It'd be the middle of the show. They'd set up a ramp to yeah, the finish line like the intermission. And, yeah. Like, yeah. wait, everyone got to go show their cool And it trip. started. that started getting really popular. So I think that's when you guys started kind of doing yeah, some more I of guess that, that would have been 94-ish because then, yeah, well, 95, I remember that kind of being like the year Krusty's first Krusty came out was right around 95. We had been filming that for a couple of years, different riding spots. So I was traveling, doing a handful of races overseas with the expression sessions. And I think as far as uh, 90, I'll we'll say 98, let's jump a few years forward to yeah. that being like our first real contest as far as a freestyle event. 
And where was that? Was that the one in Havasu? It was Havasu, Las Vegas, which yeah, in Las yeah. Vegas, I ended up missing it because I had broke my femur in France at a Supercross in 97, mm. which is a few months leading up to that new year. Um, and then, you know, I can't. Was it Four Leaf Entertainment? They did the IFMA, the yeah, International yeah. Yep. Freestyle yep. Motorcycle Association. So, and then that lasted maybe well, a year or two before uh, the big like Pace or whatever ended up buying it, the rights to the IFMA. Oh, I didn't know they did that. Yeah. Okay. So the Supercross people, promoters, ended up buying the rights to the freestyle deal. Hmm. And then it went from us winning like $10,000 for a freestyle event to all of a sudden it was like 1200 bucks to go win at these little stadiums all over. Sounds about right. Little arenas. <laughs> Jeez. So, yeah, it was good while it lasted. But for me also then, you know, there was X Games came up. and That was know, 99, right? When, when X Games first happened, if I remember. When they first brought in Moto. Yeah, I'm trying to... Let's see... see um, yeah, 99 was the first year for X Games. That yeah. was when Pastrana won yeah, and in jumped San into Francisco. the bay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, all right, I'm going to jump back because I have a story I got to tell. I think this was 95. Because uh, I talk, I've talked about this before in my show where one of the biggest regrets I had was dating a certain individual who, was, who will remain lame, nameless. <laughs> but we were at a party at Dean Gibson's house. Uh, Dino builds factory Cowie bikes. You know Dean Gibson, right? Yeah, he yeah, Builds yeah. all their motors yeah, right yeah, now. yeah. And he was living with maybe, maybe Dana was living with him. Albrecht's were there. We were having some kind of party. And you and Deegan were there. And it happened to be this girl that I was dating. <laughs> it was her birthday. I knew you'd bring this up, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so they, bring, they come in sometime in the night. And they got this box wrapped in like newspaper. It's a cigar box. Oh, okay. It's a perfect cigar box. Uh-huh. And so they're like, hey, hey. We got you this birthday present, you know? And they're giddy. They're, like, giggling. I'm going, oh, man, something's up. And, and like, I had had issues with Deegan before this. We got into it at Ponca one year or something. We never liked each other after that. And I was kind of the clean-cut, preppy dork that, you know, and you guys were just, just out of control, tattoos. Just, just do, do You know, we were we doing wanted. this. So I was the anti-you guys. And um, so this girl's all excited. She's, she's genuinely, like, really tickled that they thought of her and got her something and she <laughs> opens it up and it's a picture of me torn out of mxa and a bunch of dog poop sitting on top <laughs> <laughs> well she reached in like she reached in to like grab something out and her <laughs> <laughs> it's shit <laughs> <laughs> I think it's awesome now. Like it, it yeah, really makes me happy. Good but. fun. <laughs> good fun. <laughs> Someone didn't get laid that night. <laughs> no, probably not so much. Anyway, I don't think he'd want her to touch her. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, get that shitty honey, you gotta go watch your hands. Please. You go shower, good story, Dave. Yeah, good we'll story. Talk <laughs> I had to, man. That's so funny. All right. Yeah, Deegan and I were pretty much hanging at that time. We we're inseparable as far as just best buddies. We'd yeah. hang out every day, and. Uh, we pretty much would always party at the Yellow House where I had numerous parties and we'd all hang out. But, uh, yeah, no, that incident, we just thought it'd be funny to uh, have all our buddies take dumps on a newspaper <laughs> and then pack a cigar box full of <laughs> treats for her. I'm sure she deserved it. 100%. 100%. All right. Um, so X Games. What kind of leading up to that? Was there events like the Vans Big Air Festival? I think was that year too. Probably uh, before X Games. You remember that? Yeah, there was before X Games. There was kind of just a couple different. Yeah, it seemed uh, like these promoters independent contest popped yeah. up around that time when it was taken. Yeah, off. Yeah, there was a promoter that started doing events all the time at uh, Costa Mesa Speedway. Mm. That that kind of was an event that led towards a title. And then you had the IFMA doing their thing, which was run by Four Leaf. Um, yeah, up until X Games, you just had these little different events popping up. And then once X Games came about, then it was more just like super serious. Where sponsor, I even had sponsors telling me like, "Hey, Mike, like you're way better at jumping bikes." maybe put down racing for a while and just concentrate on jumping you know where i was more like it's fun i can jump i've jumped bikes my whole life but i want to go race yeah 
So, so that was the catalyst, probably X Games, huh? Where it went from being just fun and yeah, party into like, hey, I can, there's money to be made. Yeah. and then your sponsors know that hey, we got this much marketing value out of you. Yeah, make sure that you show up to be on the TV program of these events, which was X Games, and then they had the Do Tour, mm-hmm. which. Uh, well, no, Gravity well, Games. Gravity yeah, games. Gravity yeah, yeah. Games lasted for a handful of years, and I want to say Gravity Games became the Dew Tour. Tour. Yeah, basically, yeah. I think m- molded together. But okay. What's What's outlasted everything is just the X Games, and that's still kind of, you know, if you're a freestyle guy and you're trying to make a living and get some funds in your bank account, that's it. then you got to be a guy who's, you know, committed to your sponsors and making them happy to go and win X Games. Well, yeah. that, that's what I noticed, because when, when I first moved here, it was at the end of 2000, and, and freestyle had just blown up, and especially in, in the States, but it seemed to me that if you just were able to, to get a medal at X Games, that almost set you up for another 365 days of being able to go, hey, promoter, I want 25 grand to show up and do my flip or whatever. So it seemed like X Games was almost your price point. When gold sure. there, you could go to almost any mm. promoter and dictate your price because you were the crowd draw. So X Games was like really the, the, the poster. Yeah, the pinnacle that you needed to represent to get everything yourself. Else. Yeah. And if you could be there on the podium at X Games, you could pretty much call the shots and be like, oh, you know, I can go to Europe and do a handful of events in a stadium and come home with, you know, I think after I started doing flips, I was getting 10 grand per per flip where I would show up, go to yeah. Germany, go to France, go to Italy. And, you know, I made a lot of money that year and then, the following year, there's a handful of kids doing flips, and, yeah, then, and then now it's just guys are doing it one. for cheaper and cheaper. I mean, for sure. Oh, we're gonna pay Matt's got 20 G's to shop. Patrick Potato will do it for two. You're in. Yeah, yeah. No, Pat, I you're think, up. I think it even <laughs> got down to one point where, where when I was making, say, five to 10 grand still doing a flip that there was kids that would go to a, a local, you know, fairgrounds event and get 500 bucks. Jeez. So. And then it drives the price back down. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a, what was that window? Oh, I guess it was the double flip. There was that guy from like the Midwest that showed up with the farming gloves. Yeah, and gardening gloves and he was trying to do doubles. Yeah, there's been a handful of guys that have Jeez. got to show up to X Games that were not professional whatsoever and then they go out there and splatter themselves. And yeah. Well, the best trick also kind of lends enabled that. that. Yeah. Because there were guys, you could tell they had, they battled to hit the ramp straight. <laughs> was so bad on the bike and they were a one trick pony and even that guy you're talking about i think his name was scott murray or yeah. Scott murray. Like, yeah yeah that was yeah. it Good I, i'm gonna can't believe it yeah right. but anyway <laughs> but it was just like i think there was also like no way this guy's gonna do it that's well, why i was watching it, it was, was a story like, yeah i mean for sure for x they just want numbers like, hey look right? he did a so. double backflip in the mulch pit we got this. <laughs> yeah, one of the scariest was the dude doing a front flip at X Games in, in L.A. I think it was the Home Depot I know who you're talking about. And just watered a front flip to his head, and it was just, like, so disgusting. Dirty. Yeah. The one thing I will say about X Games, um, as much as they don't really care about the athletes, it's all about the TV show. They don't care about fans. I guess they're okay at taking care of the athletes, but they paid well. For sure. Uh the, the third I got for Supermoto one year was more than it, I would get to win a 250 Supercross by a lot. A lot. It, was 12, right. <laughs> it was 12 and a half grand for third. When I, um, in 07, when they had Super X at the Home Depot Stadium, I got second, but I didn't actually even pay attention that there was a purse. So they said, oh, you got to sign in these uh, tax forms. And they're like, oh, you need to go collect your checks. I was like, oh, sweet. Curious what this is. I'm used to motocross. And you got a second. Motocross bonuses. I got 25 grand for second place in X Games. I was like, yeah, you well, can't I wasn't complain about that. that. I, think was, I think it was 50 grand to win and then yeah, 20 whatever. Yeah. For second and then yeah, no 15, complaints. Almost a Mine was 12.5 for Super Mario. Yeah, it might have gone half, half, half. Pretty that crazy. was a fun race. Yeah. Did you race that one too? I didn't do the super. I was kind of done racing Supercross by that point. No, Supermoto. I did Supermoto. Yeah. Ooh, the one at Home Depot. That's yeah. You got second. I am. Um, I was no, I was running third. You talking one about year, su- and I crashed out. You talking about the Supercross? Yeah, well, or I Supermoto. did Supercross. Yeah. yeah, but in Supermoto, I was running. I think third the one year. I, I was behind Bostrom and Eddie Seal. Okay. And then I weeded in the. I landed off the rhythm jump 
and I had the leather moto it, supermoto gloves, and my hand slipped off, and I just oh, because you were running up front. Yeah, yeah. Was that year they had that huge step up back in? Well, I I did it a couple of years, but that one year I, that step up. Did you race that year? I didn't race it that year. Did I? That was, I was a little nervous. Gnarly. Um, is that the one that Stewart Seal? I didn't Eddie, Eddie Seal, Seal had Peter. a big crap. A yeah. few guys. Did, a lot of the Euro was just looking going. You, no one's going to jump to the top. Are you? I'm like. I got McGrath next to me, and he's eyeing it out. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I got a feeling we're going all the way. And I was behind Jeremy when he did it. I think he was the first guy to do it. Jeremy's got some balls. I oh, yeah. That. But when he did it, because it went from asphalt to the metal ramp, there wasn't a nice trend. Yeah. He bottomed near the bottom of the ramp, and I saw sparks, and then he was all, rap, rap, rap. and I'm like, fuck, I don't want to do this. I'm like, is he going to do it again? And then he was doing it. and Just greasing and it. Then, you would come around, and I remember there was like 10 guys just sitting there watching. So I just got behind Jeremy, just did exactly Followed what he him. did. Uh. Dude, it was pretty scary because you would just stare at this. And it was three tiers, and then it had a tabletop, and then it went all the way back down the grandstands into the stadium. So when you hit it, you went blind, and then all of a sudden you come over and just see the whole arena. So it was definitely intimidating for a little while. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. We got to all race different stuff too, but especially supermoto. That was one of the coolest things I've ever done because I grew up as a kid wanting to race street bikes. Yeah. And that was something my dad was like, no way. So when I got to, you know, take a bike from a friend and go out there and ride on the dirt and the street, it was just it was so cool. Yeah. Your style was cool. I remember that. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I remember you had that just, you actually had the, 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 the supermoto style. Like, yeah. I always look like a motocross guy on the back. But you you had a good flow. I was thank like, you. Yeah, man. I think that's one of the funnest disciplines that never took off. Huh. It was at the Don't wrong you, place I mean, at the wrong time over here. Supermoto was so yeah. fun to ride. It was fun to watch. For when sure. you saw guys come in at 100 and just... Come in, you know, sliding side by side. Well, the thing with Supermoto, you, could, watch, had, you could have it in state <laughs> fairs where you got built-in crowds. You could yeah. have it in arenas. and it, There was a lot of opportunity. It just came up the wrong time because of the recession. Yeah. Did hey, you do the Queen Mary event, Long Beach? I did. That no. was probably one of the last ones I did. I was riding a Cowie. That was fun. It I mean, was. just like that's how Troy Lee put that on, and that was like how they needed to be. Mm. At some place where people would want to just gather and party and put For a sure. race on in front of it, you know? Yeah. Hey, I was riding at Grange good. one day. And Metz was out there riding, and I was as riding as hard as I can, and he's doing stoppies past me going into the corner. <laughs> and oh, we rode really. like that for like a half hour, just stoppies, and then wheelies out of the corner, and I'm tucked going as hard as I can. That was a fun place to ride. That track yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, great. You got a flat that day, and I was like, oh, man, I'm going to beat him. No. He's there was that one little uh, 180 off camber turn. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And that could, range? Yeah, you yeah. could drag yeah. like your pegs and coming into that. You one. felt like a boss through there. Yeah. They That's ruined fun. that place though when they re when they repaved it. It got super slick. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. It doesn't it. help that it's in the desert too. So sometimes you get there and it would just be slick because of all the dust, the dust on it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So '99 was the first X Games. 2000, 2001. You weren't you weren't like podium on there anyway. It didn't show you kind of up on the podium. Yeah, I was. Was what really was going on those years? Much. I just cruising. Yeah, just be like most of the time I'd show up to an event and I wouldn't even do practice. I'd just be like, okay, I'm here. Like, when do I go? And then go out and like ride the course and hit the jumps and do tricks. Really? Yeah. Like I, would, I don't know. I just. It's not that I didn't want to be there. It was just like, why ride my bike extra when. I'm just jumping. Were you <laughs> not really? So you were you even really enjoying riding at that point, or was it just kind of like you did it because it was a paycheck? I think probably, probably just doing the motions. Yeah, you know, going through. I think at that time, um, just having a family, starting to have kids. Maybe I don't know. Were you just married at that point? Yeah. Okay. I think and I had your first been. kids. Yeah. Okay. So. With the deck, and that went bad eventually with that wife, yeah? No, no, I mean, like, this is part of life. Some yeah. people can't stand each other, and <laughs> some people can't. <laughs> no, but oh, Mandy, my ex wife, and I, we still. You talk guys are good and, now? Okay, yeah, good. yeah. I pretty much have the kids full time and have for a little while, but um, yeah, when she shows up, we still can talk and say hi, and, you know. That's she, good. She gets along with my girlfriend, and. Yeah, so it's that's not saying. awkward at all. I always wonder. Yeah, no, no. Um, I, I think it's been long enough to where I've been awkward enough to where finally you just like whatever. There shouldn't yeah. be anything awkward. Yeah. It's yeah. just life. Yeah, 
But yeah. um, no, I think let's say well because I had a kid. My first kid, but my daughter was in 2002, I think, when I won X Games. She was already born. So back yeah, then, she was... yeah, because leading up to that, that's when I, like I said, I started to get more serious about it, you know, because I had everything to really, like, be the best at it. Mm -hmm. And for me, I wasn't, like, trying to be the best freestyler. It was just, oh, okay, sponsors are paying me to ride my bike. I want to go race. Okay, I'll go race this. Oh, I got this event to go ride mountain bikes or, you know. Yeah. It just kind of was do whatever I want. Yeah. When did you start putting uh, the eyeball on the helmet? I'm not too sure, actually. <laughs> it's been a <laughs> it's while. It's a good question, you've yeah. Been, you've been doing that for a minute. Um. Yeah, no, the reason why I even started uh, running a Bell, I think it was a Bell Moto 6 or something. I think you might have one up there. Or, yeah, that one right there, up the number 60 yeah. on the end. Yeah. Those helmets just always looked super cool to me without visors because I'm into BMX and kind of the guys I looked up to. Hoffman. Uh, yeah, Matt never Hoffman, a visor, huh? Um, Dave Mira. And I don't know, I was just always kind of attracted to that sport as far as going big on a BMX bike. Yeah. You know, Matt Hoffman just did crazy stuff that I remember watching videos of him, you know, taking his sport to the next level where he's dropping in huge, like, mega ramps and airing it out as big as you could, which at that time was just unheard of. Yeah. You know, to see one guy go and, like, think he's going to jump, 10 times bigger than anyone else, you know, for a kid like me, it was like kind of, whoa, yeah. what's, why is that guy like that? Yeah. And that's how I've always been, just kind of push myself, not even really thinking about the consequences. Yeah. So. Well, um, one thing that, that lends <laughs> that, that helmet was really round, you know, for didn't sure. have a lot of flat shapes or anything. Yeah. So it looked like an eyeball. So your eyeball just like. Fit pop, perfect. It fit perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure when I had that eyeball painted the first time, but I'm sure Troy, Troy Lee was the one who did the first. It probably had to be around 2001. Yeah. In Supermotor sure. with, with no visor and the eyeball, you'd scare everybody on the track. <laughs> yeah. You eyeballing me, boy? You eyeballing me? It's weird, but it's always been a battle because like people know me as the freestyle guy with the visorless helmet. And then I want to show up to the track, and then I get pictures of me with a visor, and then people are going, why are you rocking the visor? <laughs> well, because motocross, you need a visor. You know? Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's kind of frowned upon to be. I didn't know there was a controversy over a visor. There definitely <laughs> is. That's wow. funny. Why are you wearing a visor? How dare you? You're the guy without a visor. You sold out, bro. What's with the visor? Are they paying you now? Yeah, they must be paying you extra for the visor. <laughs> He's so corporate wearing his visor. But I rode the other day and I, I rocked a visor. I went out and did some uh, enduro riding, dual sporting from where I live. Buddy it's nice up there. Yeah, it was actually the first time I've ridden those trails in Big Bear and it was unbelievable. Pretty fun? Yeah, I came yeah, across cool. some of the baddest single track. That Have you seen me the, the get Big Bear, those really? Big Bear Riders Clubs? They do that 200 mile ride up there. Yeah, every year they yeah. have uh, the dual sport riders deal and. It's pretty popular as far as a, a place for enduro slash dual sport guys just to come get loose. My buddy has a house on, in that Green Valley area, and yep. we ride from his house to the backside of all that. I was going to say, on a dual sport, because you can cover some good ground, yeah. you can go from Big Bear down to the high desert or yeah. back you up. you got to have a plate, though, all the places you rode. You really got to have yeah. a plate. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You should, especially just riding from my buddy's house to yeah. get to the main road. And yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so one more thing here. We're going to take a break, but I want to talk about a couple of things. Fresno Smooth and all the parties that were going on during that, that time, kind of leading up to the where before free, Freestyle really took off. Like those, the pimp and hoe parties that were in the original Moto Triple X and Crusties. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I can't pull that off, right? Like, I can't. You can't just show up with like a pimp suit i just that's just, just it's not me banging. like well, they, he'll be like look at look what an asshole pingry looks like like i just can't pull it but you guys oh, they say that anyway phil they say yeah they so said anyway. funny though to think back how many people did wear suits like that like froze the albrecht's fro yeah. yeah 
Yeah, a lot of guys did. I remember that one video, and I think it's from, it's from <laughs> right Vegas. Now. And then, yeah, and then it's Stevenson and all them that coming out of the hotel, all just huge collars, get, get, getting to the old <laughs> Lincoln limo. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that scene back then was kind of just started by the snowboarders. I think yeah. Damian Sanders, that was his main um, club promotion. And he was just tied in with all the, the crusty dudes yeah. that kind of got involved with Manly. It's cool. I just did a show um, on Zoom last week with all the crusty guys. It was Emig, Dana Nicholson, Bubba, Freeman, yeah, Manly, and it was cool to talk to those guys and you know just reminisce on how different stuff started. But really, the whole crusty thing came about because of Manly, Brian Manly, knowing the dudes like Freeman, Freeman. and and uh, Nicholson. They, they did whiskey, in. right? Like they did some really big snowboard videos. What, do you remember that one, whiskey? Whiskey, where the guy was trying to break the whiskey bottle on his head. Do you remember that? I don't remember. That's the, the name. first video I ever saw shot in Palmer because he's in that video. Yeah, yeah. Palmer has a second. Yeah, so that's the but first time I ever saw. It. It's like that's what Moto Triple X and Krusty were modeled after. Okay, that, that video and a well, couple the, other did ones you see Creatures of Habit? Yeah. Okay, that was the one that like Damian Sanders and uh, Dana Nicholson kind of became famous as snowboarders and goofing off and. Mm. Yeah, crusties happen. Yeah. So, what were those parties all about, man? The party was that Club Rubber. Was that what they were doing it down in? Uh... They did have some at Club Rubber where they ended up having the crusty um, showings. Yeah. Um, premieres. Or premieres. Whatever. Yeah, just big, huge parties that people would be blasted and you know whatever kind of drugs they'd throw at you. It just it was kind of free for all with that whole scene. I mean, seriously. It Everybody was, was going hard. Yeah, huh? I wasn't just smoking weed back then. It was just <laughs> like, you know, know. It was heavy. Yeah. Because the stories I heard, time. I'm like, really? That guy was doing that? Lots like, of women. And it just kind of seemed to be everywhere yeah. all the time. And it was weird because it, the scene, the sport of motocross, to me, really wasn't like that. I mean, I had my fair share of knowing different pros that I looked up to yeah. that later found out that they partied and, you know, rock chicks all the time. Like, I used to think that just, you know, motocross was just all about how much pussy you could get. <laughs> so It was? Wow. I mean, <laughs> okay, the truth's <laughs> out. That but, was uh, during that window. That was part of the motivation to win. Yeah. I can't for speak sure. for the 80s, but the 90s was a lot of that. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, part of... Being a, a man that rides motocross and, you know, just getting what you want. And but that was then, also influential because that in the 90s was when, when I started watching all the videos and all that. And I used to remember thinking, oh, these guys are so cool. And, oh, man, they're badass. Like, it got me, like, pumped. Like, well, I, that's I, I wanted the same to be thing that guy. I was thinking, looking up to guys like the Dogger, Ron Lachine, all the JT guys. You know what I'm saying? I looked up to to those dudes as a kid. Is yeah. there the the dudes with the image that are you know dressed the part, got the sick factory bikes, and they got the hottest chicks? Yeah. And that's to me like that's if I wanted to be that guy. Chicken and Wardy driving yeah. the Porsches and yeah, and Kudrowski, sure. he yeah. was driving Ferraris. Yeah. You know, so those dudes that you look up to at the time, and you're like, well, shit, they got Ferraris and chicks, and when's my turn? Yeah. Isn't that funny? So, like, because we looked up to the same guys, right? And you hear all these guys with uh, the passing of, of Marty Smith. You hear all of these guys like Wardy and RJ and all of them going, man, Marty was who we looked, looked up, up to. to yeah. He was, like, this good-looking, freaking cut, badass on a bike. Like, he, we wanted to be him. He's the reason we went and rode. Right? Right? Isn't that cool? And then GL's yeah. saying he was watching the 90s. Like, it's just it's funny to watch these generations go through. And who is an influence on all of us. Yeah. You know, there's so many different dudes that I look up to that made me kind of who I am, my attitude yeah. and who I wanted to ride like, be like. Who are the guys in the sport you looked up to? I'd say for a long time, mainly Ricky Johnson. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, John Michelle Bale. Just really? like Yeah, just like like... The way the dude rode and made it look so effortlessly, you know, I remember like Sun Devil Stadium and coming from behind and then going through a sandy ass whoop section and just blasting by like McGrath and Stanton, like they were standing still. Yeah. And then the dude just 
continued to dominate whatever he wanted to and kind of always, you know, had it out to make fun of the Americans. And, you know, it was just part of the game. Yeah, he was so not to, only. to see John Michel Chobel and then his whole, like, training ethic was he was a rock climber. And yeah, he was different. Yeah, just did his thing. More like his a Jean Girard. And then, uh, yeah, it was just cool because... I just had different dudes I looked up to. I looked at all the different guys, you know, even yeah. like Chicken, Damon Bradshaw for yeah. sure. You know, I always had to have a Damon Bradshaw Troy Lee painted helmet for certain years of my life. Hmm. What about know. outside the sport? Was there anybody in other sports or just maybe in art in the art world or something that you looked up to? Um, I think as far as like action sports, being a kid, I always looked at the BMX dudes, which would be Matt Hoffman. Uh, Dave Mira later on because Dave was kind of younger than Matt, yeah. kind of in between my age. Um, then the skaters. I mean, Steve Caballero always just kind of didn't even really realize the dude was in the motorcycles or anything till later on. Um, but just, uh, I think all action sports and motocross, yeah. like, all as, as one. Everyone is their own individual. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you're not out there to to rub elbows with anyone and be their friend. You're out there yeah. to really be better than them. But, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you're skating on a skateboard ramp or at the BMX dirt jumps. Our mind frames, as far as those type of competitive people, it's out there like, dude, I, hopefully I can do a bigger backflip yeah. or mm -hmm. the next more impressive thing that the people watching are going to be like, that's impressive. Yeah. I feel like in a lot of those sports, though, and, and freestyle would be included in this, you guys brought that competitiveness, which pushed you all to be do better tricks, do it better. But there was still a camaraderie when the when the contest was over, and motocross lost that somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, see, that's one of the things that I really dug about BMX as an action sports in the in the minds of the guys doing it. They always had that attitude that I was more drawn to as far as friends. Yeah. Friends being bros and like hanging out at the trails. Where motocross, to me, I never felt that. Even with freestyle, it was just... Oh, really? Yeah, even with freestyle. Even with freestyle I mean, like, you know, grown up with... There was like so much competition. You're like, ah, he's, yeah, yeah, he's but the But we're enemy. also, you know, the guys that I grew up with, whether it was Deegan or Hart, we were competitive as far as jumping and, and doing an event yeah. to of course win but it didn't matter if we were out free riding we always had that racer mentality mentality where i'm better than you mm -hmm. and it's kind of i don't know it's like it's like a selfish attitude yeah. that you really have to grow out of yeah and for me i've you know it's taken a long time if not a few times to grow out of being so selfish and just into I got to be the best. Well, it's yeah. also it's what me. we know. Yeah. <laughs> right? We were all we're told that sort of way. Like, we're not out there to make friends. We've all been told that, you know? Sure. Or, you know. For sure. <laughs> and not to mention, when you look at freestyle, snowboard, and a lot of those sports, it's individuals doing their thing. And you just mentioned, you came out of the gate and cleaned out Decker uh, kind of intentionally. So <laughs> there goes your camaraderie as yeah. well. We, we are a contact sport, which I think... There's there's that hangover effect. You said uh, you and Deegan had an issue and didn't like each other. That happens at every level, and then eventually it's like they're like that guy. Well, like also that guy. those and listen, you get your little clicks. These sports yeah. are also different because in motocross, <laughs> your competition, you're on the track at the same time with them. And freestyle and skateboarding and snowboarding, you're watching your competition. Yeah. And so when you're done, you have other competition standing with you watching what's and going on. It's something that, sure. like, with skating, I always yeah, thought really was cool. Yeah, I really hope he lands a triple backflip. Not, not saying that, <laughs> but I'm saying you, got, you, you see guys interact with each yeah. other as they're watching their competitors. Yeah. Well, I always thought this was cool in skating, kind of to your point, is that when one guy was going, all of his competitors would be up on the ramp, like when Tony Hawk's trying to do the 900, yeah. and they're, like, banging on the ramp. Everybody's cheering for him. I mean, you're not doing that. If we're doing time qualifying, Eli puts in a burner. He doesn't stop and go, go, Kenny. You know, like, come, yeah. come you on. can beat it. You can beat it. <laughs> I, I left difference? some time on the table back there. <laughs> <laughs> Just rail the outside and turn four. You got it. <laughs> so For it's sure. different. But I like it that is. vibe. I think that's, um, I think you can be competitive and yeah. still be friends. For sure. Well, that's like with BMX racing. I've found that, you know, all the top BMX guys that go out there and battle one lap at a time. 
you know, they travel and still go to buddies. Olympics. They're buddies. Yeah. You know, it's just a different deal. Yeah. You ain't on a motocross track for 35, 45 minutes battling and then talking to yourself about how you're going to pass that dude yeah. and where you're, you know, there's so much that goes into mm. riding a motorcycle. Yeah. I was thinking to myself the other day, I've gotten a chance to do a lot of different schools. I've done school with Ricky Johnson, Gary Bailey, um, American Danny Walker, American Super yeah. Camp. Uh, Freddie Spencer, Road Race School, um, and another dude's Pridmore, Jason Pridmore. Mm -hmm. One thing that stood out as far as something that that dude told me and everyone that he's schooling is he's talking about the start of a road race. And he's saying that when you're on the, the start of any race but a road race, he's picturing all these different outcomes in his brain, in his mind, prior to taking off and doing the start and getting through turn one with... 20, 30 other dudes on the starting line, yeah. you're mentally focusing so hard and controlling your mind of you can already picture like, okay, if I get the jump or there's five guys in front of me here, you know, with road racing, it's a staggered start. Guys all over, depending on how you qualify. Yeah. So, you know, it's just weird to hear from somebody that that's their profession, that's their game, that they could say, dude, I could picture 12 different scenarios in my head before I even twist the throttle. Mm. And one of those outcomes is for sure going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hopefully get the start. Hopefully get a better jump if you have five guys staggered out and you've already pictured that. Yeah. That's a serious mental game for any yeah. human to be able to have that much control over them their mind and their bodies and make it happen prior to going and doing it. But I don't think that's any different other than the component of, of other people. But like when you say, when you were picturing a, a trick and you're in your head going, okay, I'm turning this, I'm going to put my head this way. The bike will do this. You know, you're playing that out mm -hmm. in a supercross race. I don't know about you, Gio, but I would be like, okay, if I get a, if I get the whole shot, I'm going to go wide out of the first turn and I'll do this down this rhythm. Yeah, line. And try and get, yeah. If I'm, if, if this guy, cause I know this guy is good he might get a better start. I'll tuck in behind him. I'll, you know, you play those different scenarios out too. For sure. And you know, shits, who knows what happens? Cause there's so many different <laughs> variables, but I try to yeah. only think of the good ones. I used to try and just envision that I'd just see these fenders disappear and I'd be able to take my line. But like you said, sometimes you'd go there and be like, okay, I didn't qualify well or whatever. Like I'm out here. Realistically, the whole shot. All right. So if I don't get the jump, how am I going to tuck in? Where am I going to, we yeah, that. and controlling, like you say, the mind, the, the mental capacity to be able to put your heart rate that's freaking doing this, mm -hmm. all that adrenaline and all the possibilities of shit going bad, because I don't know about you guys, but I'd have times, and this is usually I'd end up with a bad start or a bad ride, is I'd be like, okay, what if I wheelie out of the gate? Oh, okay, that's no. Or what if this guy, I'm going to go down on the first turn, or what if somebody cases the triple out of the first turn? You know, See, I, I, never, I never try to think of anything my brain negative. would start taking off on everything that could go wrong, and I'd have to go, dude, stop, bring it back. Yeah, like, oh. did you never have that issue? Or, like, I don't know, I think it was pretty mental as far as I always thought I got good starts. So, I think that's like, if you are in that mind frame from the very get go, yeah. like, you know, I don't know how many starts my dad made me practice throughout my life, but I would go out and do days of just starts. Mm. Put in first gear, yeah. get a tire warm, <laughs> hang a ride. So I think if mentally you're already like through that part where you're confident in getting yeah. your start, whether you get the whole shot or not, you're still in, you're in that mind frame of like, fuck, I got to be up front right now. Yeah. And that just happened so quick. You're up yeah. front, you're doing your job. And once you're out front, then usually it's a mind game for me. Whether you're, you know, drifting your mind, thinking about chicks or thinking about your competition. Yeah. You know, I think that was probably I the harder part for me. I, and this, I would say the same thing. One of the hardest parts for me was if I was in the mindset where I was saying where I'm going, uh, my brain just starts thinking of all the things that could go wrong and I'm going to get hurt or my bike's going to break or whatever. And I would have to be like, God, stop, dude. What are you doing? Like, you know, bring it in. And then there's other days I would not, nothing was in my mind. It was clear. It was just like, it just happened. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I felt confident. And I felt like I wasn't thinking about any of the negative stuff. I was just focused on what I'm doing. And I did, you know, those would be my better races. For sure. And but then to do the that consistently, like imagine a Jeremy or a Ricky where, for three seasons in a row, you win every race. <laughs> every time you go up, you're in that spot. You know, I can't, I can't, 
Yeah, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I wished it was. <laughs> um, all right, so 2002. So um, this break was a rumor? No. We'll take a break. All right, we'll take a quick break. <laughs> Hang tight. We got more Mike Metzger. I want to get to this stuff because it's fun. Uh, stick with us. We'll be right back. At Nihilo Concepts, we have a passion for innovation and for motocross. Our mission is to develop parts that will improve the durability, functionality, and the appearance of your motorcycle. We're proud to say that everything from Nihilo is made in the USA in our state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Stewart, Florida. Whether you race every weekend or you just ride for fun, Nihilo offers high-quality, innovative parts that you just won't find anywhere else. Nihilo offers custom engraved engine covers, one-piece titanium foot pegs, brake tips, internal engine components, specialty tools, frame grip tape, carbon fiber components, and so much more. Check out our website, nihiloconcepts.com, and see for yourself why teams like Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, Troy Lee Designs, and some of the fastest riders in the world choose Nihilo Concepts. nihiloconcepts.com. the sunrise. I wake up in the morning feeling so nice. I burn a couple bowls of the all right. I look out to the world and it's all mine. Yeah, it's all mine. I see palm trees and joints. Kids smoke palm trees like ointment. My wee breath is fresh cause I keep my appointments. Now I can finally see like I smoke some DMT. What you think we should sound like? What you think we do at night? Cause we the best of this shit. We made a mess of this shit. We wreck the rest of all the western with the recklessness. If you Use a bitch, you might get snatched up like some necklaces. This where the rest of us live. You 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 say you say we feel like the West Coast. I say we sound like the past You say we feel like the West Coast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, welcome back. That was your Troy Designs timeout. Get over to TLD. And check out their Mylon uh, gear that's out now. Uh, Basically, all kinds of different jerseys that line up with all sorts of different pants. Just allows you to uh, kind of save money but have multiple different looks that you can go right in. All kinds of cool stuff over there. Obviously, their paint department's still cranking. They've got all the bicycle line as well. And uh, everything is out. All the spring and summer stuff looks rad. So go check those guys out, TroyLeDesigns.com. And uh, before we keep going with Mets here, I just want to say we want to dedicate this show and just let everyone know in the Smith family, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you guys. Um, Obviously a travesty losing not only such a legend in our sport, but just a a good human being. Uh, we, We had him on the show about six months ago, and I didn't know Marty personally real well before that. And uh, I was just blown away with his enthusiasm still after all these years for bikes and talking about it and how, yeah. just how much he loved to ride motorcycles. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really neat to see all these people that are posting different stuff about him from RJ to, yeah. um, you know, guys that have worked with him or, or just known him later on in life. And he, he was just super positive, super upbeat. He was a great, just a great guy. And, um, well, and also how many of those guys you realize looked up to him Yeah, and how Marty was there inspiration or well i was saying earlier wardy posted something about um you know there was a race where um i guess jeff had qualified better than him and marty came up and said hey no no take this gate it's better and here's why like who would do that who would go up to a guy who's you know maybe even if jeff wasn't a real big threat who would go up to a guy they're gonna race with and say hey no dude this is better one take this one i mean that that speaks volumes about what kind of guy he was so 
truly a, a big loss and uh, our, our hearts are with those guys and um, and uh, as well as Lee Ramage and the folks that were with him. Just real tough. So he will be missed sorely. Sure. Uh, so Matt's getting back to you. Uh, 2002, this is where, at least on paper, your freestyle career kind of took a big leap forward. Um, you won... And I remember watching it on TV. There's a few X Games moments for me where my heart was like running. When Pastrana did the double backflip, you know, they, they played it up really well. But like you think in your head, they don't have to play this up. I know if this goes yeah. bad, this could be really bad. For sure. <laughs> and when you were lining up to do your first back-to-back backflips and, you know, they're, they're talking it up like you're going to do it. I'm like, no. I guess no one had really pulled it. Kerry had tried that one at that point, right? Some guys had had said they were doing them at home or whatever, but yeah. in a big contest, no one had done it. And you lined them up and went back to back. And I remember just being like, holy shit. That was crazy. Not just one, but two right back to back. And there were big jumps. <laughs> yeah. What were the gaps again? It was like 80 and then 100 or something? 45 feet for the first one, first gear, and then grab second. And the next the one was... The first one was 45? Yeah, it tip, was a tip, ramp. tip, tip. It was a ramp. With a really steep landing. I thought they were. And then, so we're probably going, you know, 50 to the middle of the landing and then grab second gear. And then the next one was about 75 peak to peak. So going about 80, 85, that's a huge landing. When did you grab second? In the, in the air, upside down? Yeah, upside down. Just <laughs> come out of the tight turn, which I think we're going to a right hand 90 or right hand 180 turn. And then just brrr, up, first gear. Grab second and then just get ready. Grab a handful for the next jump. And I remember back then, like, when I showed up to that X Games course, I just was like, that is the sickest jump ever for a freestyle dirt lip. It was just like a big BMX jump that was just massive. Yeah. So so you had obviously been working on them a bunch. Did you know going in, I'm doing back-to-back, or I'm just going to flip, and then you saw the layout and said, I could do both of these? Or yeah, what? pretty much when I got there and I walked the course, I just saw that jump and I was like, okay, well, there's a regular ramp jump before it. It's a rhythm section. And I think I just started talking myself into it right away going like, man, if I don't flip that while I'm here at X Games, I'm going to be missing out. So kind of leading up to the main event or to the final run, I kind of just knew in my head, like the pressure's on. I got to do this right now. Because if I don't, I'm going to like regret it. <coughs> yeah. Just Did you do it in the qualifier? No. Nope. No, but you'd been flipping at home, I'm sure, right? Yeah, prior to, to, well, prior to X Games, we had to do Gravity Games like two weeks earlier. Okay. And then prior to going to the Gravity Games in Rhode Island, I was on tour doing the FTMX tour or something like that it was called. And I wasn't doing flips on that tour which was about probably six to eight weeks. But prior to that, I had been at home and been practicing flips. So when it came down to, you know. You had a pit at home at that point. Yeah. No, no, oh, no. I didn't have a pit actually until later on. But when I first started doing flips, I was doing them on a bicycle and a resi mat, then pulled it on the bicycle. And when I decided on the motorcycle, I built a cliff jump at um, a guy's house in Lake Elsinore, Manny Jabala, where you might have ridden there. Okay. All the yeah. freestyle jumps. Um, but anyways, had this big cliff jump basically built in the side of this hill. And I just knew, like, man, if I can get the bike spinning around as fast as I can to where then I see the, the hill then I could just jump off the front of my bike. Mm. So I did that a handful of times one day where I, I flipped, come around, I just take a step right off, you know, I'd be like two feet from the dirt, step over my bike, then the bike would roll backwards and demolish Spend itself. Spend an hour, go yeah. fix your bike. <laughs> so once I was doing that, I pretty much just kind of like knew like, okay, I can rotate. And then I was at an event, I want to say in Reno, and... uh TJ Lavin was there, and this was for four months prior to X Games, and he's like, what are you going to do for X Games, man? You got to come out, do a 360. And I'm like, well, I think I'll do a backflip before I do a 360. And he's like, well, what are you waiting for, dude? Do it. And then uh, <laughs> <laughs> he pretty much said, 
Great and question. I hadn't, I hadn't <laughs> thought question. about it before. Sounds simple enough. <laughs> TJ's like, well, why don't you take your ramp out to the dunes? Just set your ramp up to a sand dune and go huck it. Make it happen. And so I went home after that event, and then I couldn't really get that out of my head. I was like, dude, TJ says take the ramp to the sand dune. I got to do it. So what do you do, though? You got to lay carpet or something up to the ramp? You can't... Be went to the, I went to uh, Dumont D Dunes one evening, stayed the night. And about 5 o'clock early in the morning when the sun came out, me and a handful of guys got the ramp off the trailer, put it up to a sand dune. And I just recently saw the footage. As Dave Dawes has it on YouTube. Okay. But uh, went and hucked a couple jumps just to make sure I was getting the distance. But where we had the ramp up to the bottom of the sand dune, we couldn't push it up anymore. Uh -huh. And if we did, it would make the lip steeper. So I kind of was stuck with what we had and where we set it. Was it kind of farther than you wanted? Farther than yeah. I wanted it. So basically, like, at the right speed to hit it and get the flip, you'd be coming about a foot or two uh. short. And so I went for it. I knew, like, okay, well, I'm here. Might as well do it. So I flipped, came around, and knew, like, oh, I'm coming up short. So just as I hit the peak of the landing, I just stepped off the side of the bike into the sand and it was like, don't you be hurt. Okay. Wasn't hurt, but the bike, my left radiator had crushed mm. up underneath and was making the front fender like hard to, to have straight. Yeah. So I got up and said, well, I got, you know, I want to try it again before I leave and went and did exact same thing, jumped off the side of the bike and uh, ended up in my head going, dude, I just did a flip. I just need to stay on my bike. So by the time I ended up getting home, I got a phone call from the ESPN people saying, we heard you're doing flips and you're going to be By the doing time you're home. Yeah. I got a phone <coughs> call. And so they're like, hey, can we set something up to where we can film you and put it on our commercials leading up to X Games? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So within a week, they ended up um, making a date to come out to the house and film me doing it. Well, that morning I went out, set up hay bales on my landing that I was going to do it on. And um, the first one I threw, I've landed it. And the camera guys didn't have their cameras on. Of course on, they didn't. Right? Yeah, of course Serious. they didn't. And so then I went out and made sure all the camera guys had their what, equipment on. What was that feeling when you rolled out of that, though? Were you just like, no way? Super pumped. Like, Twitch was there. Ronnie Feist was there. Handful of friends. And everyone was pumped. But then it was like, because then the camera guys were just, like, standing there with their cameras and their pants off going, oh. Uh. And so I'm like, what? And they're, we didn't film it. Not one of our camera guys filmed it. So I said, well, get ready. Turn your cameras on. Went around. Boom. Did another one. And then that was like, you guys got it? Cool. Okay. And then uh, I went and did two more, which I came up short. I just barely hung up on a hay bale. It kind of pitched me to the side. And then I ended up doing the fifth one. I pulled it, so okay. I did. Out of five, I did the first, second. I did three out of five that day. Okay. And that was the very first day where ESPN got the footage. And then... And those were all the flips you went, you did before you went to X Games? That was it? No, no. Then, oh, okay. then two days later was July 4th. Uh -huh. I can't remember what year. It would have been 2002, two, right? Yeah. yeah. So in July is when I first did it. So it was July 2nd. Two days later... Because I was pretty beat up the next day from hitting the ground. Um, I woke up super early and I did 21 flips in a row. And just like boom, 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 boom. Like that mind frame where it's like, okay, I flip now. So let's just go flip. And I started my bike, went out and did 21 flips. And then I was like, okay, cool. I'm calling it a day. What that were you riding? Good. Was that a, a Honda. Honda 250? Yeah. Two stroke? Okay. Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite bikes. It was a 2002 Honda 250. Hmm. Super solid bike. You can ride it, do yeah. anything you want on it. So after that day, did you feel like, I've got these down. Like, I, I know the feel. I know what to do. I know. From that day on, it was just the same as jumping a dirt bike. Whether I was doing a flip or jumping straight, it was exactly the same. Oh, that's it was crazy. like, that's my <laughs> mind frame. Like, we have to do flips. That's just part of riding bikes now. But it wasn't yet. I mean, Kerry had done the one attempt. For me, it was, because <clears throat> I'm the guy. Like, all, all of a sudden, you know, ESPN wants it for the commercials leading up to X Games. You know, Did they, they play it? I don't remember seeing 
yeah. footage of it before, really? Yep. Ho- ho- did, hold like, on. Go back to Carrie for a second. When you saw him do that, w- were you immediately thinking, that's what I'm doing? When Carrie did it? Yeah. No, not really. Carrie made it look too hard. You know, but we were already all thinking, you know, say as far as say the top five freestyle guys that were forming the sport, we had already all been saying to ourselves and if not ourselves, each other, like Carrie and I, Carrie lived with me for a while and we'd always catch ourselves talking about like, hey, we're going to have to do flips. We're going to flip bikes. And so I think, you know, Carrie definitely took it upon himself to to be the guy like, dude, I'm going to make this happen. Went to Woodward with TJ Lavin, built certain landings and stuff to try to make it happen. And then I think even after Kerry, you know, did it and made it look hard and crushed his ankle, his back, really hurt himself, no one was like, yeah, we're going to do that. And it really, I didn't feel like it was my job to go do a backflip. Until TJ Lavin. TJ really pushed yeah, it over TJ there, came yeah. up to me. He's like, well, you're the guy. You're going to X Games. What's the trick? You know, and back then, <laughs> you didn't really show up to an event, especially a big event, without a new trick. Yeah. You know, he's always thinking of what's that new trick going to be. Oh, okay, X Games is over. We have 365 days. What's the next trick? You yeah. know, it always has been that way. <laughs> So, so TJ Lavin actually is really the, the inspiration that was like, Metzger, what are you going to do? Make it happen. And so he really pushed me to take the ramp to the desert and then just... The one that you were doing at your house, was it first gear? Yes. So you had never done a second gear flip? No. So... Not till X Games. So at X Games, you get that first one at a point yeah. upside down. I'm sure you went like, okay, I got it. I'm coming yeah. around right. And you shifted it upside down in the air, you're telling me. For sure. Yeah, and then knew, I like, watched the video again this morning. You see your foot move and shift. And then you're just around. like, all right, I'm just going to see how this one goes. Like, I just knew, like, dude, it's second gear. I just did a first, first gear flip. I'm, you know, you're in the rhythm. Yeah. We all know how to ride bikes. We know the feeling of, like, okay, this triple. We can all look at a triple from a super yeah. cross track and go, Okay, that's that much pop yeah. in second. Or we third. used to be able to. <laughs> we used to. <laughs> now we just follow yeah. other people off. <laughs> in fact, it, when I see guys ride supercross tracks nowadays, it gives me like, oh, like, get kind of scared for yeah. these dudes. I went to uh, uh, Star West or the new Star West track and watched uh, Michael Lieb out there a few months ago, and to see these dudes and what they're doing and how gnarly the tracks are, it just makes me go. These guys think this is fun. Well, a lot of yeah. <laughs> go look at a lot of the guys like Instagrams and the posts they're showing. They're making, you know, rhythms used to be. Well, back in the day, they had no rhythm. The seventies and eighties supercross, you landed in the face of the next one. Then it became doubles. Then it became triples. Now you look on these four fifties. Guys are going quad, quad, quad in a yeah. lot of st- sections. Well, I think the tracks are a little tamed from like the nineties, but guys yeah. are able to, like you said, they've got seventy some horsepower now so they're just going yeah you know, dean wilson just posted something yeah. of him going quad quad did you see that dude it's like it's sketchy it was so sketchy <laughs> it's so big um well i so i i always thought you were practicing those into a foam pit so that's that's pretty crazy that's a cool story to hear yeah no well, i ended up getting a foam pit because uh bosch bosch tools was a sponsor of mine gave me a bunch of money towards putting it into my property with my course and getting a foam pit. But my my foam pit, I never really even got to use it too much because it burned down. It burned down. I was, yeah. I don't remember where I was, but I, I looked over kind of in that yeah. area. I was there was a smoke. big black. Dude, the biggest header. <sighs> what year was that? Man. Because I remember it too. And, and yeah, then, and then the news was anywhere like, was within messy. 50 miles. If you're down to Temecula <laughs> or up in Corona, yeah. you could see. It looked this. like an atomic well, I, I lived in, yeah. in Murrieta between the freeways, so we got a pretty good view because you went that far away. Yeah, just over the hill. What happened? Uh, somebody almost got caught in it, huh? If yeah, I remember right. Japanese Nate Adams had a couple Japanese guys that came into town, and um, I can't remember where I was, but uh, he hit me up. Was like, hey, can I go take these dudes to ride? And next thing I know, he's like, bro, uh, your foam pit's on fire. And 
I was going to imagine. <laughs> hey, I don't know what happened. We were going to go ride, but somehow your phone pit caught on fire, and I had to bail. Yeah, we, no, we showed up, and it was in flames. Was there a why. bike that would bike get burnt up in it? Yeah, melted this bike to the ground. I saw a picture of it too. It's like a little. It's like the Terminator, that one where he just melted yeah, into a puddle. Yeah, where it's melted in a puddle. And, there, and then as it dried out, there was like pieces of liquid aluminum that had hard, hardened into... Mm, yeah. It's like, that's cool. And then didn't the city get pissy with you about the, the fun? Well, bit? right after that, then I started getting jacked around by um, code enforcement. You know, that I had moved a bunch of dirt, graded mm. oh. graded more than 500 square feet of dirt. So then I had to, you know, at the time, too, I was making good money. So I was put, putting money in towards uh, getting, like, a plan made and how much dirt got moved. So mm. I spent over 10 grand with, like, the city and code enforcement to make sure it was all good. And the mm. next thing I know, I'm over freestyling, moving on in life. And those pits were sketchy because obviously there's static electricity in that foam. Yeah. And when you have gas dripping out, because would you guys turn the gas off before you jump? Yeah, you'd be coming up to the ramp and you'd reach down, turn it off, make sure there's just so, enough gas so yeah. it's not just dripping out or pouring out into the foam pit. But the main thing was the static electricity. And it would ignite that fuel yeah. and then that foam would burn just oh, like yeah. really quickly and really hot. So the riders started thinking that it would be better to like water the foam down and just try different stuff. But it was mainly the static electricity from the bike hitting the uh, foam and then having just a little bit of gas fumes yeah. in there that would just blow it up. Crazy, man. <clears throat> you had um, you had some pretty bad injuries. Well, before we get to those, Winter X. Uh, so you won gold that, that day uh, at Summer X in 02. They, I, I, I laughed. The commentators called it before the run was over. After you landed the, the back-to-back flips, uh-huh. the commentators call it. They're like, that's gold. <laughs> yeah. We don't even need to see the score. Well, yeah. It, it was, was so. But you don't get that very often in contests. How often can they go, without a doubt, that just won it? Doesn't happen very often. Yeah, not very you often. You have to wait for the judges. Right. Huh. Well, you? speaking of Winter X Games, that was a really cool event um, because I went into Winter X Games, showed up, and seen this super sick, huge ice block jump <laughs> that was over 110 feet. And that was the next backflip from that I had done uh. that went from an 85 foot backflip to now a 115 foot backflip and I went off that ramp and did the sickest whipped out knack knack that it, you know even today like that's probably one of the coolest pictures that I've seen I know the one you're talking there's, about there's one from uh, the year I rode a Honda and then the following year I was on Kawasaki so that would have been like 2007 2006 2007 um, and that just you know, really in my head was like, whoa, that was cool to be able to, you know, serve up a huge jump like that. And for my first time jumping it, do a knack-knack for the first time. Yeah. I literally showed up to Winter X Games and did a knack-knack, whipped out backflip for the first time. Never had done it, ever. Just showed up and was like, dude, I'm doing a knack right now. And they had it so much time in the air that you could have so much control, you know. It was, really? Yeah, it was awesome. Did you not, <laughs> I, I imagine, like, in my head, and I've never flipped, so no, full purpose. disclosure, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but when you're upside down, do you not lose, I, I would say if you're going straight, you can kind of spot where you're going. For sure. But when you but start to moving, do a knack-knack yeah. now, now you're kind of, like, looking off to the side, and you're off the bike. Do you not lose your spatial awareness? Um, I think you doing it so many times... From the time you take off the lip to the time that you land, you know how much time and what huh. the control is. So you hadn't done that before. I had never done a backflip knack, and then I ended up doing it on 110 peak to peak, which was about 115 in length. So that's insane. And it um, was really cool to just, you know, like be that confident in my riding and my skills. Yeah. And then just be like, whoa, that. That was cool. I just did a new trick at the big event. Yeah. So What I was won. it like hitting that, that ice jump? I always wondered, because it would get ruts and stuff in it, right? Yeah. It would change really quick because of the spikes in our tire or the studs. But um, at that time, I was riding for Bridgestone, and Bridgestone had some really good tires that came with spikes for okay. winter riding. So, yeah. At first, you would think that he would be out of control and loose, 
but because of the spikes and the ice, you didn't get any sliding. Oh, is that right? Yeah, okay. when you land, it, especially, you know, like sometimes you land in a whip and you're still kind of whipped out. Well, the dirt gives, you know, you get a little gas going, it straightens the bike out. Well, when you'd whip it with those spikes, you'd stick. And sometimes it would be like you'd stick and it'd want to throw you off the bike. Mm, it was so much traction, it would yeah, almost high side you. Exactly. Because you're just sticking into the When it ice. sticks, the suspension will compress and then it wants to rebound yeah. you. But uh, that was the only mm. weird thing about riding on the ice. But other than that, you know, like it's a really good lip always. I think it was Dane, Dane Herring. Yeah. Dane, yeah, yeah. Dane right. was the one who was kind of in charge of all the, the jumps for a long time and then mm -hmm. ended up doing the Red Bull X Fighter stuff. And now he does Red Bull Straight Rhythm. Yeah. And and you had to be well over 5,000 feet up there. I don't know the elevation, but you're in the mountains. It's probably around five, for between sure. five, yeah, six thousand. Yeah, up in Aspen. Feet. So was your bike just a turd? Did that affect how much throttle you had to give or speed? Yeah. I don't know. I think one thing being used to riding on a pile of crap bike was <laughs> was like growing up racing mammoth yeah you know what yeah, i'm saying yeah. i think for years and years going with my dad and and racing that event you know you, you're setting yourself up to yeah. go and try to win a big race but you know your bike's not going to run like it always does yeah so i would say i was always confident knowing that my bike wasn't at running top condition but I did my best to yeah to it work. work it work so the this, throttle and make sure at this point good. are you getting help in it with bikes from Kawasaki or uh, Winter X Games I started getting like right around that time I started getting help from Honda yeah that was the first time um, that was the first time they were helping you yeah Chuck Chuck Miller uh, yeah Chuck Miller he was the dude who dialed me in over at Honda for a few years hooked me up fat with Supermoto and. Mm. Uh, that was cool because that was one of my goals as a kid my whole life. I wanted to be a factory Honda rider, yeah. you know, and then like I never made it with Supercross, but later on because of action sports and X Games and getting to freestyle all around the world and then Supermoto, yeah. Honda was down to help me out. And it's things. neat. It's neat that it came around too for you because I know, especially early on in your pro racing career, you were kind of disenfranchised with how corporate racing was. You know, they didn't want any kind of like, tattoos or any alternative look. For sure. It was buttoned up, tight, professional. That was it. And so for you guys to go and create this whole other sport, and then you're making them come over to you and go, hey, we, we want to be involved. Yeah. Like, you guys That's are funny. Yeah. Pretty right? cool. That's what? a pretty nice little. <laughs> it went full circle. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Um, all right. So you did have some big injuries. Um, one at your house in 2011. What happened to that one? Which time? You <laughs> broken vertebrae, collarbones, kidney laceration. Oh, like, okay. That That's was a rough kidney one. laceration. Yeah. What happened on that deal? Um, well, let's just say I don't usually drink beer. And I ended up having one beer, which is just weird. I had a party at my house where um just invited a bunch of people. It was actually like going to be the last time that I had people over at my ranch house, okay. Paradise Ranch, which yeah. I, was my first house I had bought because of riding bikes. And so basically I was getting ready to let the house go back to the bank. And because uh, I was you know, going through a divorce and I think losing three houses at the time. Mm. But uh, that just happened to be just like, hey, I'm just going to throw a party, a little get together, take a bunch of people on a trail ride and adios. And anyways, I ended up having a beer, not even really thinking about like, hey, it's time to go ride. Um, I jumped on my bike and I'm waiting for everyone to get ready, geared up. I went out, boom, decided I'm going to go hit my ramp jump and thought I'd do a heart attack seat grab on a bike that didn't have a grab oh. hold. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had, ho I had heard that yeah, you went into yeah, a seat no, grab and there was like, nothing to grab. Know, and I'll blame it on the, the beer because I don't ride bikes and drink ever. I mean, you yeah. know. Well, no, <laughs> so that, not when so you're doing I, tricks yeah, like that. Yeah, so it was just an accident. So just you went to grab. I brain locked. And I went to go do a seat grab. And, you know, I, I mean, the better you get at doing, say, any trick, you serve it, right? you like, oh, it's time to do it. Boom. And I remember, like, going to do straight up and down. And then going to grab, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up 
when I'm in the hospital. So oh, I ended man. up flipping completely over the front of the bike, and then my bike just smashed me. <sighs> and I was basically, you know, one of the last things from that day. I remember sitting down there, people coming down with an easy up because it was hot to cover me. And the girlfriend at the time comes down with my daughter and they're looking at me and I remember like saying to him like I'm done I'm I'm gonna die and then mm. next thing I woke up in the hospital and told me everything that was wrong I lacerated my right kidney which would never you know work again is that true um well I'm sure it, I mean I didn't ever go back yeah. <laughs> so maybe my kidney works maybe it doesn't but um yeah, it was just a mess for a while. I think I was kind of in a coma for a couple of days. And then once I came to, I just, you know, started healing again and mm. figuring life out. It's <laughs> one of those things where you go through these huge injuries. It yeah. slows you down, makes you think like, man, should I even get back on a bike again? And So then, you had those thoughts? All the time. I've had been through so many injuries. That but I think we all do. When you have a big one, you're like, what sure. am I doing? I'm done with these. Yeah. No, I've and broken then, my femurs three yeah. times each. I've broken my back three times. I got metal rods up my lower back. So, well, that's the other crash I want to talk about is the barge jump. Mm -hmm. That was a big one for you too, huh? As far as injuries go. Yeah, I was par paralyzed for about eleven days until I was able to, you know, just get my nerves back and learn how to walk again. Oh, that's I happened to me a couple of times. Really? Yeah, actually, it was at, um, at Star West riding one day, fooling around. And uh, Randy Lawrence was out there. I did a can can over the finish line jump, and where I landed, there was a pothole, and I didn't get my foot back over the seat, and it just went boom and endowed me into the next jump with my head, mm. and uh, ended up like paralyzing my whole left side of my body that day. Went to the hospital. It took me a while to learn how to rewalk and run. Like for six months, where you know my whole left side of my body didn't work the when same. When was that? Man, I was riding a Suzuki at the time, so it was just after graduating high school. Oh, early. Okay. Yeah, so it would have been probably like between 94, 95. Jeez. Yeah, but yeah, no, I've had so many injuries where I've just been... Six femurs? Six femurs, each one three times each. And the last one was the worst. The last one, I was actually hadn't flipped a dirt bike in over a year. I uh, was getting ready for this show in Australia called the Crusty, or it was the... Well, there was a Crusty tour. Yeah, yeah they just Down restarted a new something. one. But it was, what's that called of when you come out of retirement? Because uh, like, they were supposed to be Mike Jones, Tommy Clowers, Har Reunion. A reunion. Yeah. It was supposed to be like okay. this freestyle reunion thing. So I hadn't flipped. I got invited to do that show and... and the week prior to leaving, it might have even been like three days before I was supposed to jump on an airplane. I ended up d thinking I needed to do a flip, and I landed upside down 80 feet, oh. blew my uh, right, you know, pelvis, like, my leg came out, blew apart my femur with the metal rod that was already in there, and then they ended up rebuilding the whole bone around the metal rod, mm -hmm. and now I have like a... A that mesh, some mesh that goes around to hold it all together. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, I've broken so much stuff my whole life. Like, you know, even one of my first races I can remember at Corona Raceway, blowing out my right ankle. I think I was six years old. And how's your body now? It's pretty good considering, like, you know, I can do everything. I can hang out with my kids. Uh, do everything. When BMX races. Yeah, I can go ride bikes, which is the most important thing. I yeah. just went riding with a good buddy of mine the other day out in Lucerne, and then he took me to go do some riding up in uh, the Big Bear area, which I've lived up there now on and off for six years, and I've never got to see the terrain up there, so that was fun. And some cool now rides. I really want an enduro bike. Yeah. I'm sure you know somebody can make me a deal on one. He, he always laughs because I always <laughs> talk about my enduro riding now, but yeah, I love dual sporting as well. That's what we do with a lot of our buddies. That's Social. what you do when you get old, right? That's right. So. Well, it's a, it's a good way to get the fix, you know, without... But it's fun, risk. man. Like you yeah, said, you get to see sure. some cool stuff. You yeah, stop, the adventure you laugh at of someone it. falling yep. over. Like by the end of the day, it was just enough things to talk about that you were like, and I feel like when you get done, mentally you're in a better mood. 
Yeah. You know, like when yeah. you get stressed out in life, like I get down there, I'm like, I needed that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's much for the body, it's for the mind. That ride I went on the other day, it had been months since I went on any kind of ride, and uh, I slept so good <laughs> after you know why? doing that. I've I've worn my, my watch to see like calorie. Your heart rate doesn't usually get that high, but because you're still riding, your heart rate's going the entire time. Yeah. So you, after a four hour ride, you look, you're like, whoa, I've been a lot of calories. And uh-huh. like you said, you will sleep like a baby. We did a Baja ride and I fell asleep at dinner table <laughs> waiting for dinner. <laughs> no, straight up, I, I, I just said, oh man, I'm going to lay my head down. They're like, food. <laughs> yeah, no, any, any kind of riding is good riding. Mm. Yeah. So hopefully I'll be back on a bike soon. So you broke your back on that barge jump. Tell me what happened to that thing. This was in, the, in Long Beach Harbor, right by the Queen Mary, right? Set up two barges. You were going to just flip them. Yeah, it was for the stunt, uh, Discovery Channel Stunt Junkie Show. Okay. And leading up to that, I got asked to do, do the event, which was like, yeah, sure, no, no problem. Sign me up. And yeah. I kind of just told myself I was going into this event as a stunt rider. You know, I wasn't going to practice. Really, you can't just go practice riding from barge to barge. Oh, yeah. Really? So, And they asked me if I did want to take a practice run and, and get that out of the way. But I just, you know, being confident and knowing like, well, I've just done however many backflips this week at my house. We're going to be doing about the same distance. And the one thing I didn't really take into consideration was that the, the barges, two barges, were moving in all directions yeah. at all times. Anywhere from eight feet one way to eight feet the other way, That's which huge. would make it six feet or 16 feet it could be 16 right. feet off at any shorter time. or longer yeah shorter longer or side to side, side. Yeah. and so um how could they not anchor it down better like that seems like the, insane the promoter guy who who got me to do it basically said that they could but they didn't so you know i ended up blowing my so you uh, went long right yeah i just went Long enough to where I over-rotated and landed in the bottom of the tranny with the rear tire to where where it sucked into the tranny in my body. Basically, my, my hips went forward and my back went over the top. And, okay. s- and then when I hit the ground, my um, L4, yeah, because my 3, 4, and 5 vertebrae are all fused now. So my L3 just basically, no, L4 disintegrated. And just, so did you collapse and fall off the back of the bike? Or yeah, what yeah, I just like, and yeah. came off the back of the bike. The bike came out of my hands, went off the barge. And uh, luckily, I didn't go off the barge because I probably would have died. They didn't have any... Um, no crew, no, no scuba crew. team. No crew, yeah, the scuba team wasn't ready. So that was the one thing that they were kind of shocked after it all was said and done, that it could have ended up being really bad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, besides yeah. for... Were, were you paralyzed? Like, could you feel yeah, your legs? Yeah, no, right okay. away I was on, on laying there looking up to the sky and it felt basically like I was pissing my pants. Like Just from, burning, from like warm. The, yeah, warm burn, like... And that's basically from the uh, the discs just being blown apart. Yeah, those yeah. nerves will just, you'll get those firing pains. When Dostal broke his neck, I don't know if you remember that. I was with him that day, huh. Jerry Dostal, and he goes, man, I feel like I just got these shooting hot, mm. like fiery feelings down my arms. Really? I'm like, I just heard he broke his back on a BMX bike. He broke his neck again. Really, his yeah. neck. My dad just told me last yeah. weekend. Crazy. Yeah, still no, no deficits, so that's good, but. Man, he's not very lucky. <sighs> no. Yeah, he should not be playing around with BMX bikes. And Probably dirt not. jumps at no. his end. And he's a, he's a fireman now. He's got a good job. Oh, he yeah. Maybe well, he's just weak-necked. Yeah, it's good, though, that he's all right. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty could it, have been worse. It definitely is. Um, all right. So the Caesars Palace fountain jump. This is another moment, because I was there. I watched that. You did? Yeah. Uh, I braved the crowds. There was freaking people everywhere. But I remember that platform you, you approached on was, was raised. And so when you hit the the lip and went up from the flat ground where I was, dude, it seemed like you were a hundred feet in the air. Yeah. It, it was like 60 feet at least. It was wild. <laughs> that is freaking high. 60 feet. I mean, that a, is a triple is not even 30 and he is 60. I mean, just yeah. imagine that. Like it's, 
from the ground, it was impressive. That's why you don't look at what you're getting yourself into. You just say, <laughs> okay, there's a ramp. I'm going to hit that. It's supposed to be 100 feet, so we'll see what happens. Well, I don't want to look. It's true. It's kind of like <laughs> you go to Anaheim or something, and you do track walking. You look at the face of triple. You're like, whoa, that's kind of big. And I, I learned just go around it, go to the landing, because it looked a lot, a yeah. lot easier from the landing. Yeah. Um, how was that event? It obviously went well. But yeah, it was fun. Was there anything kind of sketchy about it? Was it easy for you? It seemed like almost, I don't want to say easy, but by that point you had flips down so Yeah, I was dialed. pretty confident, especially at that time. Um, and I just did an interview with uh, Paul Tabley from Monster Energy, the dude who did the Netflix, um, the freestyle movie that I was in. Just did a deal with him this week and we were talking about, you know, different events like that. And for me, I was pretty confident in a lot of these different events that I got to do because of the crew I worked with. You know, the the people that I always got to work with were professionals. Like who? You mean top-notch dudes, you know, like the producer, the promoters, the ESPN people. Okay. Um, you know, Paul Tabley, he was mostly the promoter of a lot of these events. He's okay. the one who first called me and asked me, hey, Mike, would you jump Caesar's Fountains? And I was like, sure. <laughs> Sure, sign me up. <laughs> and after that phone call, he was like, okay, cool. You know, and I had known that um, the ESPN people had hit up Pastrana and Hart prior to reaching out to me. And so when I did get the phone call, I Did just, they turn it down? Yeah, they turned it down saying, oh, they weren't interested. And I just was like, yeah, I guess it's my turn. I'm not going to turn it down. And I think probably three months went by, and then I finally got another phone call from Paul saying, hey, uh, you ready to go check out where you're going to be jumping at Caesars? I'm like, okay, I guess this is for reals. And he's like, I got a plane ticket for you at the end of the week. We're meeting up so you can check it out. So that was where it kind of became more real, Okay. seeing what I was getting myself into, and they're basically saying, okay, from this platform or this restaurant and pavilion is, you're going to be ripping through here this planner we're gonna take and put you know like a zigzag around that and then over here by the stairs is where the ramp's gonna be and you'll jump into that parking lot and i was like okay cool and then they're saying what do you think as far as a ramp to use and i said well let's take our second gear ramp and let's just scale it up to where i'm gonna hit it in third gear and you know go from 75 85 feet with a second gear ramp to 100 plus with a third gear ramp and uh from that point they're like cool we'll get it made probably two weeks went by and they ended up uh delivering the ramp to my house and Menifee, and i ended up building a big huge uh, landing for it and we started jumping it right at about 115 feet that day which was me um lusk uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Lusk, Lusk yep. and Wiley Fulmer, who were on my Monster Energy Kawasaki factory freestyle team at the time. Okay. And so it's kind of weird because these dudes are serving it up just as I went out, hit it first, third gear, bah, boom, 115 feet. And now here's two dudes on my team who are just as badass. And now they're out there jumping it. And then I'm flipping it. And then Wiley's like, well, I want to flip it. And they kinda, did? Yeah, Wiley ended up flipping it too. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird because I'm supposed to be the guy going to Vegas. And he's like, well, I could flip that far too, you know? And this is really cool leading up to that. And then uh, they came out, filmed. and At your a, house? Yeah, at the, okay. us hitting the ramp. And then and they did a commercial for ESPN. And then uh, they took the ramp that day. And I didn't ride for seven days leading up to the Caesars event. And, um, yeah. When you went there and first looked at it, was there anything sketchy about it? Or you're like, man, I don't know about this. Or was um, it good? Like, it looked like a little bit like the transition on the landing was kind of... Yeah, I think it was just weird that how tall the landing was. I think the landing was 55 feet tall. Jeez. Because of how because of the, platform, the ramp yeah. was raised up on a on a pavilion yeah. um, sidewalk. And so you could have gone way further. And prior to the record jump, which was 125 foot, I had been measured at 118 feet. So, you know, going and doing my laps at the ramp, you know, I had a cape on tribute to evil knievel and 
Next thing I knew, for my third run, and I had told the camera guys, when I come back to do my third run, I'm going to rip the cape off, and I'm going for it. And I just, like, remember, you know, being excited and being in the moment all of a sudden. Because I've always kind of been able to, like, look through the crowd and look through what's going on, all the excitement. I mean, because of years of just the experience of being around stadiums full, mm -hmm. full of people and just there to do my job. So... Leading up to the jump, I've you know there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. They were showing videos on a big screen of um, evil, evil crashing, evil crashing and blowing himself up. <laughs> and I remember people coming up to me and they're like, "Dude, I can't believe you're this like here with." Evil can evil smashing himself, and you're getting ready to do this. And I just, you know, yeah, whatever. Just you know, always been able to block things yeah. out like that, and went and ripped the jump. And right off the lip, I knew like I'm gonna hit this faster than usual. And airing it out, I just kind of knew like, okay, I need to slow down my rotation because um, I had you know hit it a little more excited than yeah. than if I wasn't, and just mellow. But uh. Yeah, it worked out. I landed a little high with the front end. And, you know, Paul asked me, did, were you out of control at all when you did that? And I was like, no, I felt like I, you know, had it all under control, just a little more excited than usual because, you know, I'm trying yeah. to prove a point, make a record happen. And, and it really was a, you know, an ego thing because Twitch and I, you know, Ang bars yeah. and he's just you know really uppy and excited about writing and doing big things and so for him and I we've always pushed each other you know whether it was in competition at X Games or just out in the hills like he's one of the best guys to ride with so in my head it was all about beating a 108 foot backflip that was his record yeah. at an X Games so when they asked me I was like well it's got to be at least 110 feet from ramp to ramp we're you know peak to peak and then uh just slowly started building and so what course, was the distance on 125 the feet ramp to ramp is the guinness book world record That's that i hold yeah oh you still hold that yeah oh, okay i thought yeah. someone had broken it um officially no one's really like broken it as far as guinness book of world mm -hmm. records but um shortly after you know he's calling me out calling me the the Who? Uh, Twitch. Twitch? Yeah, calling me the grandfather, and he's out busting. <laughs> I think it was like 150 plus. It was definitely 150 something. I want to guess it was like 154, 156 feet that did it. He ended up going out to uh, Jimmy like, Fitzpatrick's yeah. house out there in Temecula. So, mm -hmm. you know, in my book, he holds the record as far as, you know, just all guts, all glory, just see who can do the biggest flip. Yeah. And, and for. You know, everyone that's freestyle and jumping, you know, Twitch definitely for sure is gone. I'm sure the biggest backflip. That's crazy. And I've even thought about it, you know, like I've been hit up to do um, events where I would do like break my record for the flip, break a record for the uh, the high jump all in one event. I've been, you know, and it's cross my thought like that would be cool even I could recently you've been thinking about that you know oh. within the last say six years <coughs> you know that we're people have been talking yeah. and like um what's his name from australia robbie madison oh, yeah. you know he always gets hit up with people saying he's they're gonna break his record and it just doesn't happen i think what axel hodges was supposed to break his long distance record just within the last year yeah, and yeah, yeah crap. Oh. Work out. so it's cool you know even at my age i still hear about who's gonna do what flip or what long distance jump and i get excited yeah. you know it's it's in the blood when's the last time you flipped a motorcycle Unfortunately, I think the last flip I did was the I was getting ready to go to Australia and I blew my blew my femur, my hip, you know, put a hole in my ball sack, Ooh. all kinds of stuff. Ooh, that sounds like the worst. Yeah, injury. big hole here in my leg. They're playing at Coachella this year. Hole in my ball sack. Hole in my ball sack. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's been at least seven, eight years since I've done a flip, and I, and my. Last one happened to be the worst one. So I still have that in the back of my head where I'm like, man, if I get a bike and I'm at the right place at the right time, I'm sure I'd just throw a flip. Uh, so I could be like, yeah, I pulled that. No big deal. 
<laughs> just to just to say you finished yeah, our good just, note. Yeah, I mean, it's, oh, it's man. in the back of my head. Can't give up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but what was your biggest payday? Was that Caesar's Palace Fountain Jump it? In one lump. That was brought up the other day in my monster interview. Um, in one lump that. payment. Was that, that the biggest one? No. No? I don't think so. Mm, maybe. But I've, no, no, because I've had bonuses. I've had, I had a $75,000 bonus check to sign a contract once. So there you go. It wasn't $75,000. So I was shit, you know, I was making fun of, well, I guess myself to Paul Tabley <laughs> going, you know, I get people, that's probably the biggest question as far as the Caesars event. How much did you get paid? And at that time, you know, it wasn't about getting paid to do anything because I was already making money from my sponsors. Yeah. I was making good money at that, that first year with Monster. And, uh, and that was an event that Monster didn't even know I was going to do. That oh really? Something that just came to <laughs> oh, their table, yeah. yeah. And then that happened to be the first live worldwide event. Supposedly, that mm. at one event was worldwide live coverage, mm. and it was that month that event where I wore Monster. And you had um, was it Echo? Echo Unlimited. Yeah. They looked like they must have paid to you a pretty penny because their For logos sure. were. Yeah. Big and prominent. Yeah, that was probably one of my biggest outside the industry sponsors that really took care of me. Um, I had a really good uh, sports agent at the time that was also yeah, because they weren't in two wheel. Yeah, they weren't in anything, anything other than sponsoring rappers yeah. and mm -hmm. some, you know, I guess probably some basketball guys they sponsored but anyone like in that hip hop genre was what Echo Unlimited was into and I just kind of fell into that spot I rode for him for I think six seven years along with uh, at that time I had a really good deal with Red Bull I was supposedly the highest paid helmet wearing Red Bull guy at the time uh, and I didn't even have a full Red Bull helmet I didn't have the blue and silver it was just the black with the flying eye and said Red Bull with the yellow. Mm. So that was some good times. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I got to ride for some of the best companies ever. You know, still look back and I'm like, dude, a, a lot of big, cool companies had my back for a long mm. time. Like yeah. Oakley, Alpine Star. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. You, you were killing it. Thank you. Um, was there a point where you're like, all right, I'm done. Was it the femur or were you already kind of done before that? And you had gotten pulled back in for that reunion tour. Like, was there a time you're just like, I'm done with freestyle. I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm, I'm over this. I think I tried to get away from the sport a few times, a handful of times where I'd be like, dude, I just, I'm not showing up to this event. Yeah. Even though Red Bull's trying to pay me $25,000 to go over to Madrid and do an event. I'm like, I missed my plane. You know, <laughs> I just don't feel like doing it. I'm going to go do this this weekend. And that's one thing that, you know, you, if you're committed to your sponsors and they want you to be doing those events, then you're kind of yeah. contracted to go do that shit. And for me, I just, if I don't feel like doing something, I'm not going to do it. I don't care how much money's on the table or if I signed a contract I'm just, you know, sometimes you just can't live up to what you sign because you don't feel it. And yeah. so I think that's probably, you know. Had, I've had really good sponsors. They've all had my back, and, and most of the sponsors have let me go out and do what Mike Metzger needs to do to feel comfortable at that time. Yeah. And hmm. I don't know. Because a lot of times, though, that, that'll be a deal breaker. Mm. You miss something you're supposed to do, and For they'll sure. be like, Psh. For sure. But it seems like there's always another one of those big events that they're just yeah. hoping that I would be at. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's stressful. Doing all that freestyle stuff, especially traveling around the world to go out there and risk my life. And that's one thing you really got to, you know, be selfish, turn off your brain sometimes and be like, dude, I'm laying my life on the line right now to go out and do the best I can, but really to entertain these hundreds of people that yeah. are here to watch. Did, that, did you start to get a little jaded? Like, I don't care about you people, you know, like. I don't know. You could get a little I think, jaded. I think it. there's been time, there's definitely been times, and it was early on in freestyle where, I don't know, for whatever reason, ego, just worn out, burn out on people that I wouldn't sign autographs. Mm. You know, but then I got like 
backlash from like moms going, that guy's a dick. He didn't even sign my kid's hat. He was standing right there in the stadium next to me. He wouldn't look at me. I'm like, sorry, I'm watching this event. I'm watching my peers go out there and risk their life. I just am not going to sign an autograph. Yeah. And then later, as that went by, I was like, man, I'm just being a dick for no reason. So It happens. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I remember when Chad Reed first came over here, he was so arrogant. He was so cocky. I mean, and he started to get backlash. People didn't like him. And uh, he figured it out because he was starting to get a lot of haters. Mm. And now he's the, like media darling, you know, like he figured sure. out that, that balance. Yeah, that's like, what it is. It's a balance too, especially being a racer because dude, it's intense. The feelings that and emotions you put on yourself prior to going and you're wearing yourself out. Well, even so, with, I'm sure it's no different than freestyle. For sure. It's a hell of a lot of pressure for your runs and yeah. well, even uh, the risk factor. I mean, yeah. well, when we went to like Bercy and these events you're talking about, I mean, I remember like, you know, all the motor guys are inside the stadium somewhere and then the freestyle guys are there, but it always looked a little bit frantic because they're trying to take a bike that, that was brought to them and make it their own with the hand grabs and for the this sure. and the that and the, you know, the flip bars and whatever it may be. And you're like, anything goes wrong on that. It could lead to something big out there. You know, I always cross my mind. It's a different bike, a different stadium, different yeah. dirt, different everything. Yeah, it's the same trick, but it, there are variations. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just stressful because you, you want to be on your main game. You want to be comfortable with your bike, your surroundings. Yeah. And it's always, you know, it's a lot of pressure to go out there and just be that guy. The problem is, though, <laughs> you're there for you and your sponsors are there for everybody else, right? So yeah. that that is the hard part. It's like you wouldn't be there without making money, but you have to be selfish to do it right. For sure. Yeah, it's a tough It's balance. like it's a, a crazy dynamic. Yeah. Um, so since then, you've been into bicycles, have you? You, got, you have a, your own bike shop now? Um, ended up shutting the bicycle shop down shortly after we won 13 championships up in Mammoth. The reason I opened up a bike shop in Big Bear in the first place was to support me and my son's racing habits <laughs> okay. and, and, and to not have to worry about all the political crap as far as dealing with other shops and, hmm. you know, what they're what their interests are. Yeah, my interest yeah. was hauling ass and winning bicycle races with my sons. And so for me, it's like, okay, well, I want to order the best stuff, not through the shop because that takes time. I got to wait on them. And it was just the best thing I could do as far as get all the sponsors mm. involved for our racing team, sell their products, sell their bikes, rent their bikes. And, uh, Basically, when it was all said and done, and we went out, and I ended up winning some races for downhill, ended up winning the Masters, I uh, want to say it was 40-plus, yeah, because it just so happened within the last four years. I won the 40-plus Masters uh, Enduro, smashed that class by seven minutes, which was really nice. cool for my age, 40 plus. Yeah. And, then, and then I was only like a minute and something off of uh, the, the top pro, which was Brian Lopes. Mm -hmm. Got another guy, but BMX bicycles that I looked up to. And, um, you know, when I'm into it, I'm into it. Like that year I went out and did that. I was just, just training my ass off. I wasn't doing anything other than working on bicycles at my shop, training, going and riding, pushing my son to, you know, the best he can, can. Yeah. And, and he went out in there and did some cool stuff and after it was all said and done he was like yeah I don't really want to race bicycles dad I want to go hang out with my buddies skate and then basically snowboard which is his passion he has sponsors to do that and um, yeah so I put the shop aside and then I reopened up the shop and then that's mainly where I just build bikes I love bikes so yeah building custom bikes, whether it's a BMX race bike that costs $3,000 or a downhill custom uh, enduro or downhill race bike costs like anywhere from eight to 10 grand for a full custom build. Mm -hmm. That's where somebody comes to me and goes, I want the orange 324 downhill frame and then I want all these different high-end products. And so that's why- You build it up for them. Yeah. So I've done- Interesting. A, done a, you know, 
over a handful of, of super expensive bikes like that for people. It's far and few between. But, you know, every day I get people up in Big Bear calling to, you know, hey, can I stop by and get a tube? Can I get something done to my bike? And I'm like, sorry, I just do custom builds. Mm. And that's because I'm busy right now yeah. tattooing and doing so that's, art. So that's your main deal, right? Tattooing yeah. and art. So how's yeah. that going? Do you have your own shop or you work at a shop up there? Uh, for several years, I've worked out of a private studio. Sometimes okay. it's at my house. Sometimes it's at actually um, another office. But it's been private studio guy for quite some time to where it's just more comfortable for me. I don't like the shop tattoo studio kind of hair salonish yeah. type attitude. If dudes aren't working and into their craft tattooing most of the time they're bitching and complaining and it's just it's like, like being yeah long. exactly well you gotta so, deal with other people that's enough yeah. said right there yeah. So, <laughs> yeah but it's good um yeah no i stay busy especially lately with what's going on because i've been in private studio and not at a shop that you know i've been getting more and more people hitting me up being like hey we we want a tattoo yeah. our normal tattoo guys not doing it and, yeah How'd you get into tattooing and art and all that? I mean, there's a there's actually a a painting you did at TLD. Yeah, I think it's in the bathroom or right next to the bathroom. But it's like every time I go there, ah, it's Brad. Like you Thank can you. tell your I heard art. that got stolen. It's there, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Unless it's gotten stolen in the last month. Hmm. Yeah, no. But so. all your stuff has a look to it. I, I I don't know what the look is, but like I can look at something and go, "Ah, Betts you. did that." It's cool. Yeah. No, I've been an artist since I was a kid that's usually been kind of a loner since I was a little kid. Like, go to school, come home, go practice, go ride, because that's always been the main focus with my dad. Um, as far as art, that just kept me busy, but that's always been my passion. Mm. As far as my dad, he doesn't dig art. You never catch my dad buying a piece of art or hanging art on his wall in his house. It's just not his thing. Yeah. But um, for me... Uh, shit, I wanted to be Troy Lee when I was a little kid. I painted helmets from like 13 to 15 years old um, in Menifee. My dad had a really cool house, still does, where his whole basement was my paint shop. And is, that all, is that stuff all still there? No, it's all an apartment now. Oh, okay. He actually changed it. went from my paint shop to one day dad coming home and basically telling me I can't paint anymore. Crushed me. I thought oh, I was yeah? thought I was gonna be Troy Lee painting helmets and jet skis for people along with my riding. And then dad came home and said, Sorry dude, you gotta get rid of all your paint stuff or you gotta go get your own paint booth because I was painting with automotive paint, like one shot pinstriping paint, I'd be blowing it through an airbrush and that's like super toxic. So it was basically screwing yeah. up my mom and dad's house and seeping through their walls and then my dad would wake up with a headache and so he couldn't take it anymore and i basically just from that point i was like okay i guess i'm not doing art and then uh i gave all my airbrush and paint equipment to my uncle joe you might know joe, joe schmo joe schmo joe armstrong what, what was so, that because i remember that from way back yeah well he was pretty much just doing odd jobs and construction that's the logo that's the logo i'm thinking of this is the Joe Schmo. Joe Schmo logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's old school, man. So Holy cow. Joe is my mom's sister's husband. Okay. And he was always played around with artwork. But when I ended up uh, getting rid of all my paint equipment, my airbrush stuff, I gave it to him. And he, he actually started a business out of his garage, um, painting all kinds of helmets, moved into Harleys. But like a guy named Mike Hale, which was yeah. a champion flat tracker. Mm -hmm. My uncle painted all his stuff and, uh, yeah, and then moved into doing all, like, the Rough Riders, you know, the yeah. gang of biker dudes. My he uncle, does all their stuff? Yeah, he does all their stuff. So they keep him really busy doing some really nice tiles and paintings huh. on their bikes. That's cool. Your dad's into Harleys, too, right? Doesn't yeah. Doesn't he and your mom have bikes? Yeah, they stay busy doing that sometimes. But, yeah, my uh, my painting career and wanting to be Troy Lee was short-lived. And then throughout my life, you know, I've always dabbled and did different types of art from you know tattooing which is my main art that i get paid for now um i love painting you know, oil acrylic huge stuff but it just takes so much time especially having a kid yeah and that's my number one job yeah is being a parent full-time and raising my kids basically on my own mm. and 
doing it the way I want to do it without anyone's opinions on how I'm supposed to raise my kids. You know, I like it. That's oh, good priorities, man. Thank you. Have you been able to make any of the art make money? Like sell enough pieces or, or is you just not have enough time to like really? Uh, actually, I do get hit up all the time, especially through social media and direct message. People hit me up to buy my art. But um, it's usually like where I have time. Something has given me time to just focus on painting a bunch. And then once I got, say, a dozen paintings, they're sitting there. And I'm just like, okay, that's money sitting there. So. Yeah. Yeah, one time actually, and how I got into really selling my paintings and making artwork was when I blew my right femur apart for that, that deal. I was supposed to go to Australia. I was running out of money during that time, and a good friend of mine, uh, Derek Mahoney, you might even know Derek. Know He's messed around as a mechanic for different people. He okay. grew up racing motocross from Idaho. But anyways, he hits me up one day and he's like, dude, I think I was trying to like sell tires and just some bull crap to make some extra yeah. ends to pay some bills. And he and that was like on my Facebook or something. And he goes, dude, why don't you start selling your artwork? I know you got plenty of, of canvas and paintings all over. Sell that shit. And then he's like, hey, you know Steve Caballero. Steve Cab, he sells artwork. Well, I didn't really even know that huh. he did art. Yeah. So I went on his Instagram, and he had, like, paintings for sale, original paintings for sale. Here's the price, size, what it was painted with. And he just made it really easy for me to go, okay, I'm going to copy that. <laughs> yeah, copy that. I think within one month I made, like, six grand off of all my paintings, got rid of them, and paid my bills. Yeah. And I was, you know, hurt. So from that time, I knew, like, oh, okay, if I really need to fall bo fall back on, like, boom, here's a painting yeah. that's going out. And does it take you, does one painting take you a long time? Yeah, yeah. a long time. Yeah. Unless it's just, like, a little tiny thing where I'm like, okay, let's paint a flying eyeball or a spark plug. Yeah. And, you know, three, four days of doing the same thing when I have extra time. Yeah. But my tattooing, it, it takes a lot of time. And I'm actually, at this point in my life uh i'm really blessed to get to tattoo and do my artwork on people that want tattoos cause yeah they're not fun getting a tattoo isn't really that fun but the uh, the process of doing the tattoo and then when i come towards the end and and the people are just like so stoked on it that really makes makes it all worth it yeah but that's I, more uh rewarding to you than a painting like a canvas um yeah because I'm working, like, while I'm working on a tattoo, that time that I'm putting in right there is money being made. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, when I sit and I'm working on a big canvas and days go by, it's never, you're never going to make the amount of money on the, the time that you put into that painting unless I'm dead. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, just how, yeah. That's art, how works. art works. It's, yeah. it's kind of like, um, yeah. Uh, restoring motorcycles. If you actually put your hard cost in, you're like, yeah, I made some money restoring the bike. But when you go, yeah, well, I have about 600 hours. In yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, no, it doesn't. That cost me a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you did, a, you did a design for us, and it's still being uh, put onto hats and T-shirts. But like, awesome. I can't wait for you guys to see it. It's um, cool. You guys, I sent it to you. Right? Yeah. It's, it's really cool. That's so, cool that you're doing that. I was, uh, I'm stoked with your work. I, hopefully you. you down the road, if you got more time, we'd love to have you do some more stuff for us. For um, sure. You know, that was a fun project, so I was yeah. pretty stoked you guys well, hit it's me neat, up for that. You have, like, the different layers. You know, you sent me all the sheets, which I haven't shown you guys. I'll show you, but mm. it's, like, little thin paper, and then there's one that's in color, and one's in black and white, and different. there's different, like, details on each one. Yeah, I think there's five of them. So, it, you know, it took me five different sketches to get to the main one. And even before I came up with the main finished design and I told you, what do you like between this one and this one? You were like, well, I like this on this one and this on this one. So I combined them yeah. for the final one. It just takes time, but yeah, you gotta, be, you gotta be creative. I, I just don't see it. Like I see people do work. And I'm like, wow. How'd you come up with that? I'm like, Oh, I just had this vision. I'm like, yeah, I don't <laughs> like, I just don't have that vision. I look at something like, I'd be like, uh, I can't I draw know a start. stick figure family. I mean, I'm terrible. <laughs> Your kids are like, what's this dad? You're like, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have no talent. So I really appreciate it. Like when Troy would design, you know, he gets a sheet of paper that has just an empty helmet outline on it. And I'd watch him just 
come rough, up with rough this something in. I'm like, man, I just it's really well, the, cool. The to thing see that would that trip me out is, is to see when people start something and then all of a sudden they're starting over there. I'm like, wait, what is that? And why did you move over there? And all of a sudden, then they just go whoosh, whoosh, and yeah. blend it together. I'm like, whoa! Now I see it. It's kind of trippy watching people put that together. Yeah, well, they can. You know, I'm assuming you guys see it in your head and where everything needs to be already and. You just sometimes, put it down. sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it happens. Sometimes, as it goes. Huh? sometimes I let the sharpie marker, especially like a tattoo. People will come and then they'll be like, "I don't know Get what creative. I want." Yeah, yeah. They're like just do whatever you want, and then I'm like, "That's nuts to kinda, me." Could you imagine going to someone no. and say, "Just do whatever you feel like," and it'll never be able to come off ever again? <laughs> and sometimes I don't have an idea, so I try and get it out of them. That you know, is there anything that you've seen that I do that you kind of like? And if it's like, "Oh, I like your eyeballs and wings," and then I'm like, "Okay, they yeah, like that kind of hot rod vibe." And then I'll just take and I'll sharpie marker some different shapes, and especially like with a with a body, everyone's canvas, their bodies are different but you still got the same contour of muscles. So I kind of build the picture around the oh, canvas. So like mm. a certain image or shape looks good with this part of the arm, you know, so mm. it looks good and this doesn't look like a pile that somebody's wearing on their body. What's the weirdest thing you've ever tattooed? I get that question a lot. I haven't tattooed any wieners or vaginas, so I don't... But oh. like any, 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 <laughs> does everybody come up, ever come up to you and just want something really strange? I think some of the weirdest stuff is that, uh, especially in Japan, I went over to Japan a couple of times for some events. Yeah. And then years later, those people have come up to me and, and lots of people have said like, I've got your signature tattooed on me. So. Really? Yeah. I've tattooed my own signature on people. I remember a family from like, uh, Germany or... Yeah, somewhere near Germany. But anyways, the whole family, it was a, a husband, wife, and three kids. And they all got Metzger on them. They wanted me to tattoo my signature on them. And then a couple of them got Godfather with like a flying <laughs> eyeball. And yeah. this is like, boom, yeah. Metzger. That's good. <laughs> so weird, but people wanted it. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, so you're they a Metzger. They paid for it. <laughs> no. We're a Donken Schnitz, <laughs> not Metzger. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think I haven't really tattooed anything like out of the ordinary. Yeah, nothing most too crazy. Is, yeah, most any of the time dolphins? Any dolphins? <laughs> not too many small tattoos like that. Most of my clients, they want you know. But like were they stray or gay dolphins? Saying. You're right. <laughs> Let's, we got to get that one clear. <laughs> Does that dolphin have a wiener hanging off of it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hmm. That's a boy dolphin. Hey, you want to know a fun fact? You know that dolphins and humans are the only two species that have sex for f recreational. Dolphins I, go I out knew the I ocean. like dolphins. I knew it. So when someone said, if you were an animal, what are you going to be? I'm like, forget the bird and all that. I'm going to be a dolphin. <laughs> Straight one. <laughs> um, all right. So going from dolphin wieners into this question. <laughs> It can't be any more serious than that last one. <laughs> well, no, you had mentioned before that uh, your Christian faith plays a pretty big part in your life. Um, is your folks, are they Christians? Is that why they just kind of brought you up that way? Yeah, I think uh, I just remember probably around five years old, living in Corona. Dad started taking us to church, and it became a big part of our life. You know, I think we're, at times I'd be like, well, we have to go to church today. We're not going to the races. You know, where dad and mom were trying to do church life yeah. as far as make life better. And they don't go to church anymore. I know that, you know, my dad believes in Jesus Christ and the Bible, and um, so do I. But I think over the, the years, I've just been more into really surviving and, you know, doing the right things for my kids, mm -hmm. keeping a, a house over their heads, yeah. food on the plate, um, where, you know, being an artist, and that's that's my main income for a lot of years now, you know, it's hustling what I'm doing, and that's my art, and making sure I'm paying attention to my kids 110% yeah. of the time, because I'm not the type of person that lets people babysit my kids ever, you know, I don't trust people when it comes yeah. to my kids. My kids don't sleep over at other people's houses. Yeah. They yeah. yell at me all the time about it. I'm like, yeah. not yeah. happening. That's how I was raised too. My dad definitely wasn't letting me go to anyone's friends' houses, stay the night, no way. Uh, I was the opposite. Yeah. 
we had nothing in the house. So all my friends had more toys, more food, more snacks, more everything. So I wanted it out of the house. My dad's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it was because us growing up and not being from South Africa, right? I think for us being from California, our parents were probably worried about their kids getting snatched or, mm. you know, just weird stuff going on. Which well, you see the me, number of people, of, uh, particularly girls, that get sexually molested from even uh, family yeah. members, you know, like uncles and cousins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm taking one that out three. of the equation. One in three. One in three. That's what I'm saying. One I, in three what? One in three adults have been molested. Oh well. Yeah, that's yeah. not not good odds. And so, I mean, that's how I my main my main part of my day every day is just focusing on my kids. Mm. And if I have to focus on work, usually I'm I'm tattooing my appointments. I set up by ten, ten thirty. Um, that's so I'm starting to tattoo and do my work before noon, and then it just depends on the project. But most of my tattoo projects are six to eight hour days of mm. where I'm sitting in the chair. Mm, and just me. trying to get the project done the best I can, and then afterwards I can breathe, and then we go ride bicycles. Go paddle, yeah. And, but yeah, no, being an artist is what I have been from the beginning, yeah. and it's something that's cool that I've always been able to fall back on. Like we yeah. were saying, um, or yeah, we we're saying that like you know I've never been to where. I'm so stressed out on not making money doing something, you know, most of the time if I'm hurt from riding dirt bikes, which was a majority of my life, I always had my artwork to just yeah. keep me calm, keep my mind off of my bikes and just indulge in being by myself with my art supplies. And yeah. the next thing I know I'm healthy and I'm back riding my bike and pushing myself to do whatever I'm trying to accomplish with that. Um, is there anything you'd do different looking back at your racing career or even freestyle for that matter. Anything you'd change? Hmm. Good question. I don't think I would. I mean, like, I'm just happy that I've survived this far. I've so many crazy stories of the people that I've gotten to hang out with and see the world. Um, I tell you, that's really, I mean, I'm still healthy. Yeah. I have plenty of friends who've passed away from riding bikes. Um, or who can't ride bikes anymore and they're, you know, still alive, but can't, yeah. you know, do well, stuff. So for me, I'm just fortunate that I still get to be involved with bikes, even though, you know, I don't follow Supercross or the Nationals. I just know Eli Tomac's badass and uh, Cooper Webb, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that name yeah. before. Maybe he's... Yeah. yeah, like all of a sudden Cooper Webb's winning races and stuff. I remember I'm like, who the heck is this kid? And then I've, you know, see him here and there. And I'd say that's he's probably one of my favorite riders. Yeah. You know, it just seems like he's got that attitude to like make it happen when it needs to happen. And then you got Eli and he just seems to just to be... His dad's prod protege, totally. where like, dude, this is nothing gonna stop that kid yeah, from yeah. being more and more badass. So, well, I think it's interesting. I like, I didn't know that racing wasn't really your passion. It was kind of your dad that pushed you into that. But I would tell you this from the from a from a not even freestyle or racing, but like a motorcycling perspective. If you step back and go, okay, who are the people? If you were making a route, Mount Rushmore of people that impacted motorcycling. I think you're on it, dude. I mean, Thank Pastrana, you. yourself. Got you to know, throw in McGrath. McGrath. He brought Supercross to the forefront. Evil For Knievel. Sure. But I'm saying it's not even just racing. It's those guys that transcend the whole a specific sport. sport. Yeah. The industry. Yeah. And, dude, I mean, like, I truly honestly believe you're one of those guys. Thank and that's you. massive. You know, I, everyone made so much, I don't know, I made fun, but, like, gave Pastrana such a hard time when he kind of when he was even doing the freestyle stuff, like even when he yeah, won the yeah. X Games, he went the next week to Loretta's for sure or whatever, you know, yeah, people were like, that's a joke. Why are you doing that? And look at what, you know, and now he, he's making a huge, yeah, he's making, it, making a living <laughs> running that circus. Yeah. He runs the circus. Well, yeah, we've said really this does. many <laughs> times that he's way, made way more money doing this than he would ever have made racing. Yeah, I, yeah, for I agree. sure. But not not even money. I know, but I'm that's not mean, the marker. I'm just saying yeah. that that I'm just saying that that's the example that freestyle isn't a joke. That but it that it has taken him that far for sure. And guys like him and I who've put our time into what we do that it reflected the industry and helped the industry sell more products. Yeah. Yeah. It's just weird that 
we're not selling freestyle bikes. You know what I'm saying? The two yeah. things that really were big for me in my career as far as motorcycles was freestyle motocross and supermoto. Two things that they don't sell. <laughs> yeah. They don't sell a yeah. supermoto yeah. specific race bike and yeah. they don't sell a freestyle specific, which I think they could. In KTM does. They sell a SM model still, right? I think. KTM and Husky? Yeah, yeah, but I'm just trying to think. It wouldn't wouldn't have fit into a Husky a race has category. Husky has a supermoto bike. Yeah, yeah. okay. I know they we came did out with one two year. years ago or whatever. And yeah, it's, so, it's actually a pretty good. Bike. But within my racing time right. and freestyle, they didn't. The industry yeah. didn't come out with a specific freestyle bike, yeah. Yeah. which I think they could have. You know, well, that's like saying with, with Suzuki, very few changes, right? That's like saying Suzuki's got a supermoto bike. They got the DRZ four yeah, hundred well, steady. Yeah, <laughs> that thing's been there since eighty five or something. <laughs> it's their best return on the investment. But no, I, I'm not talking about money or or you know. I just mean as far as an impact on motorcycling globally. Yeah, the P- industry, Pastrana's, if you want to call it that. Pastrana's made a you know huge, way bigger impact than if he can if he would have won seven or eight championships for sure. I, I believe yeah. so. And, I, and he's continuing to change freestyle. And I don't think anyone else other than him and his crew pushing each other constantly in, in the way that they do, they're going to continue to evolve and, and come up with new tricks, which is just completely insane yeah. to think. Does it surprise you he's still doing it? Like he's still hucking stuff. And I, I get it in a stuff. rally car, whatever, but he'll still get on a motorcycle and just... Yeah, Set it, I just know? wonder every time I see him on a motorcycle how much pain he's in. I do too. That's it. That's all. I'm just like, dude. That's I don't want to say hurt. only, but he's only like 36 or something. He's young. It's, yeah. it's not like he's 45 years old. I mean, you think how much <laughs> you? <laughs> <laughs> it's well, not, he's not some old washed hey, up bastard. Some at 45. old 45. Good, good news, they're 44, so yeah. we're okay. Yeah. We've got a few months before yeah. you're, you're insulting. Point, my point is, you think that he would be 45 because how much you've seen him in the limelight. He feels like he's been there forever. He just forever. burst onto the scene so yeah. young. Yep. Yeah. I mean, he was... He was 14. He was doing tricks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think he was 15 at that first X Games. At the Gravity or yeah. whatever. Yeah. That, was it X or Gravity? It was the X first Games. One? Yeah, X Games yeah. where he jumped into the water. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. So... And thumb as well. <laughs> it's kind of our last... Well, before we get to this, how, how can people hit you up if they want to get a tattoo or buy some of your art or whatever? Where can people find you? Right on. Well, people can hunt me down pretty much by my phone number on Instagram. Okay. Um, I'm located in Big Bear Lake, California, and that's pretty much... And your Instagram's what? Just... Uh, M. Metzger... Or no, Instagram's Mike Metzger. Okay. And then yeah, as far as like emailing me, mmetzger88 at yahoo dot com. But pretty much like I let people hit me up directly. I'll get back to you if if I read your email and I'm like this person's legit. They're not just trying to fanboy yeah. out. Yeah. But um, yeah. No, I stay really busy doing my art, tattooing, and getting to hang out with my kids and do fun stuff when the coronavirus isn't going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we're not gonna get. Yeah, into yeah, it, take it well. deeper. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, on, on that good note, <laughs> how, it's kind of a question we ask all our guests at the end of the shows: is how do you want to be remembered in the sport? Um, I think as the older I get, that changes. And for me, as far as just being involved in the industry, I think real plain and simple: I want people to realize that I did it my way. That was mm-hmm. it. Everything I've ever done, it wasn't to. Sorry, it wasn't to make sponsors happy or to do anything for anyone really other than like, this is what I'm doing because this is what I have to do for me. Yeah. And so I just feel like, you know, anything I do, that's where I'm paying attention to what I have to do for me, what I have to do for my kids and really do it my way. I'm not never really tried to copy anybody. You know, I took in all the different people I looked up to, I took. The little piece from yeah. each and every one of them. I don't think anyone would call you a copycat. Thanks. <laughs> no, you, you blazed your own path for sure. Yeah. yeah. There's only one of you out there. Appreciate it. Well, yeah. Thank uh, you. Again, like I mentioned, man, you're you're uh, you're a legend, and um, yeah, man. We, you know, like I said, we may, we may have had our little run-ins back in the day, but as I've gotten older. You know, GL, I've talked about this. I'm burying hatchets. I used to have issues with Chanel. We want to have him on. You know, <laughs> Deegan, <laughs> I want to have Deegan. You know, like, 
you, as you get older, you get that perspective of like, okay, wow, that was so high school. You know what I mean? For sure. And but I, you also realize you don't specifically hate that person. It was a situation yeah. that caused you guys not to or like the competition that race, or and you know yeah. all the stuff. Competition for yeah. sure. That's the, the main, main one. The main factor is because yeah. you always loved the guy that you lapped. <laughs> Although yeah, it was right. 15th. I mean, you and him were like this. But the guy that was second or third, he was just an asshole all the time. 100% of the time. That's it. Well, hey, I am stoked to call you a friend. Thank Likewise. you for coming on. We appreciate Thank the time, you, man. man. We don't take your time. Yeah, that was awesome. It's so. been a long, long time since I even thought about doing yeah. an industry thing like this. And yeah. I've been hit up a lot by different magazines and people that work the industry and I've, you know, just kind of let it fly to the wayside, not make a date. But uh, once I, you know, saw what you guys were doing and watched a handful of the interviews, which for sure my favorite was uh, Ryan Hughes. <sighs> the Ryan Hughes interview you did with that just really like just opened up the whole sport. And like you know where he came from and how he made it is it just was like super positive. For I think definitely. he also showed a side that most people didn't know he had or didn't know. You know what I mean? Like I, that he, he actually me has a little bit more like he's emotional instead yeah. of just aggressive. And rah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's you know like all of us. He's working himself out right now. I, I feel like we might have lost him to Hawaii. He's over there right now. <laughs> I don't think he's ever coming close. back. I think he's going to move out there and live well, a little... Well, he's basically an Instagram model now, so... <laughs> <laughs> he might get a deal with Monster pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, maybe. Monster will be out there putting tattoos on him. Maybe you could put it on him. <laughs> right. Right on. Well, hey, thanks again. Appreciate it, you guys. Thank you for watching. Uh, that was Mike Metzger. We'll be back thanks to wrap guys. up the show. WP is more than a store. We're truck and Jeep experts. From wheel and tire upgrades to full custom builds, 4WP has you covered. Do your rig right. Shop online or find your store at 4WP.com.
something I like Yeah, I've been on something since last month But I'm feeling alright Maybe I'm blind to see Maybe I'm losing my mind Cause I've been on something since last month But I don't feel alright It's me against myself It's me against myself I'm starting to black out yeah. I'm staring at the sky I'm running from myself I'm running from myself I'm starting to black out yeah. The stars Hey everybody, welcome back uh, This is Sponsor Spotlight And we've got Patrick Lopez coming in from OGO to discuss some of their products with us, and uh, welcome in. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. excited. We're stoked to have you guys part of the program. Um, you know, just a little bit of history here. If anybody, for those who don't know, OGO got jumped into our sport. I don't know, twenty years ago. Yeah, twenty plus years ago. Andy Bell, uh, who, uh, as you were just telling me. Kind of at first was not really sure if he wanted to be in that spot. Ah, it's just luggage. I don't know if I want to do this. Starts handing some bags out, and as people started to realize how great these bags were, became super popular. Like, you were nobody if you didn't have an OGO bag. Everyone had an OGO bag. Oh, yeah. My dad still has the, the, the flight bag with the Pro Circuit Monster Energy Kawasaki logo. So that's four, 15 years old now. Oh, yeah. So, and he still uses it. Yeah, and I've got, like, literally some of the very first bags Andy gave me. I still have them, still use them. Remember our Red Bull KTM yeah, ones? They started still have avoiding it. them, and we were like, oh, that's so true. Well, even when, even when I started, <laughs> my boss saw me rolling my, my old bag that I got from Andy. He's like, you don't want the new color? And I'm like, oh, God, I didn't even think about it. Obviously, I just yeah. started or whatnot. I'm like, yeah, I guess I probably should get the, the new color. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it just plus. really speaks to the durability of these bags. Um, Almost to the point where you go, man, it, they make them so damn durable. It's almost to their own detriment because you're not buying new ones. <laughs> I, was gonna I say, mean, I've had the same bag for 20 years. Yeah, uh, but they're incredibly well made, and and again, sticking with our theme of only partnering with amazing companies that make amazing products. Uh, you guys are an awesome fit here, and we're stoked to be involved. So tell us a little bit first of all about this bag. This is the new flagship item, um, and this is a doozy. Yeah, it's uh, it's the Rig T3. I think a lot of people saw it as it was actually, I think the Tampa Supercross weekend is when we kind of launched it. And nowadays you can launch via social media and, and that's what we did. <laughs> okay. You know, we've got a, a good roster of, of the best of the best from amateur kids like Talon Hawkins and, and uh, Ryder DeFrancisco all the way up to Cooper Webb, you know, and they all got it. And uh, the best part was they were so excited about the bag, they ended up just putting on their Instagram. Yeah. And before you know it, I'm walking through Tampa in five minutes. It was the first time I traveled with it. Uh, yeah, walking through Tampa, and uh, yeah, everybody was asking about it. So it's it's been a long time since the rig, I guess, 9800 um, has been, uh, I, I don't want to say improved upon because it really didn't need it, but a lot of times the rig 9800, uh, the, the old flagship product, it, it didn't have a spot for your boots, and it didn't really have a spot for your helmets. It all fit there, but it would get dirt possibly you know, through the bag and things like that. So I think what I'll do is I'll try opening this sucker real quick, but um, that's what we did. Yeah, it's the uh, Rig T3. Um, put it so, on the table. Okay, you can put it on the table. And so this thing has specific compartments like this that are designed for the helmet, for the boots, right? Yeah. And you and know, I just realized where did my darn what am I sitting on this thing? Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's <laughs> first time with a headset on. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is right. We have to teach these guys everything. Hey, I'm I'm cool with that. So Zippers over here. I'm still I'm All still right. willing to learn. <laughs> Um, Those are some heavy-duty zippers. And what I like, too, uh, this is something that was different from every bag I've ever had, um, are these adjustable little mesh screens. Yep. So you can change the compartment. If you don't like the layout of it, you just unclip those things and they reclip in other positions. Yeah, so you can customize yeah, your so compartments. Yeah, so I thought that was cool. Just depending on what you're doing. I, I use my, my old one, which I'm going to use this new one now for going snow skiing, as I was mentioning yeah. to you. So we're packing all kinds of boots and ski gear into it. And you need a big bag like this to hold all that stuff. Yeah. And I can just design it as I need. Yep. So I love that versatility of it. Yeah, so it's unbelievable, you guys. Like, it literally did just get stolen. Like, I don't know where that is. Like, I just showed Don't. this bag off somewhere. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know who took the bag. I did bring another helmet bag, so I don't know if we're going to cut this thing and, and go grab it out of my van, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, that's just it, you guys. Like, this thing is, is huge. Um, I think the biggest thing that people need to understand is put your gear in the top portion. There's a big top portion here. Uh, and that's kind of where your gear is going to go. You can also um, put it in the... Isn't this for, like, your... Zip out of here. Yeah. 
wit. So this whole top part will hold yeah, pants jerseys. It'll hold, yeah, it'll hold pants, jersey, and even uh, I think I worked with Ferrandis a little bit on, on, on the bag, and he was putting his chest protector and everything in there also. So, mm. you know, you can keep your gear separate there. Obviously, the boot bag, super cool, brand new for us. Um, we've never had it. Uh, fits in the bag. And that's just it. It's a one-stop shop. I know when I go riding, I'm always like, helmet, goggles, I'm kind of going head to yeah. toe, you know? And with this bag, you can pretty much go head to toe with the bag and know that you're never going to forget anything. Yeah. So, so dialed for moto, uh, full disclosure, those also fit ski boots. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. Idaho boy, right? Yeah, Montana. But Montana, close enough. okay. Yeah. Cold, cold. Anyway, very cool and very, very versatile. Yep. So this is the Cadillac. This is the Cadillac. And a lot like a Cadillac trunk, you could fit a dead body in here. Hey. Um, I mean, you said you it, not so me. Inclined. You said it, not me. Yeah. You can see how well these things are engineered, too. Yeah. That's the thing that amazes me. Most bags that I think anyone's ever owned, they end up breaking the wheels or something happens down there. The Geo. OGOs have been phenomenal. Yeah. I'm actually glad you said that. It's a good segue, honestly, because I think one of the biggest things where I know, rather, some, one of the biggest things we did not want to get away from was the sled. I mean, yeah. that's what, kind of what it's known for. That sled technology. Okay. Well, because no matter what, at the end of the day, you're not probably going to pack your gear bag exactly the same way you did when you left. You're so tired and whatnot. Um, you know, it'll still stand. So a lot of times if you're going, you're trying to load your bike or and whatnot around gear bags, you can still stand it straight up. It's pretty narrow, and it'll always stand. Or you're at the airport, and you stand it up, and it falls over and hits somebody. Well, here's the other thing. We all take Not care of our stuff, it. but when you're uh, flying around the, the country or the world and you look out the window as you get on the plane, you see them launching your uh, bag, you're like, thank God I got that. Well, <laughs> and uh, the telescoping arms that come up for the handle, those will bend on cheaper bags. Oh, absolutely. So the sled, that whole plastic case keeps that from happening. Yeah. So now we're, we're excited about it. And like I said, there's 38, I think, riders, 42 riders that got it. And we've got a lot of really good feedback from it. And yeah. Yeah. I stoked. just just started using mine and I absolutely love it. So that's right. amazing. You made the cut, didn't I you? I did, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's it, right. It came in a, a massive box. <laughs> well, he yes. said about 40 riders, so uh, if you don't ride, you don't get one. Well, uh, I think guy, I was yeah. press. I was media. media. Yeah. yeah, I was a press guy. Okay, so this is gear bag. Yes. Um, yeah, sorry for sort of another too, segment too that you have would be travel. You travel. So show, mean, us, show us this stuff. Yeah, so I think, um, gosh, it, it was... Formerly called the layover. Mm -hmm. We call yeah. it the Onu 22. It's a 22-inch bag, basically, is what it is. Um, and, yeah, this is our carry-on version. So I think you guys both have one. I think as yep. of now, I think I sent you one the day I started. Um, but, yeah, it's got everything. I mean, this is sort of your simple kind of weekend travel kind of bag. But, like I said, it fits in the overhead. Um, and, I mean, you can literally could carry everything. I carry a couple pairs of shoes, obviously a couple pairs of pants on my toiletries, um, everything you need. But, yeah, you don't have to check on a bag. I think with yeah. baggage fees and well, things like well, that, well, this that's, is Well, what's popular. great with, with these is it, it, it isn't remarkable how much you can fit in there. And the nice thing is you'll never have an issue because when you go any, to any of the airlines and they go, your bag needs to fit in this dimension, that thing fits like a glove. Absolutely. Yeah, it's designed so, for that dimension. Not an inch too small and not an inch too big. Whoa, yes, you're right. <laughs> That's right. what she said. <laughs> right. um, and this, again, crazy, crazy durability on these. Um, yeah. I've had, again, the same bags for 20 years. Oh, yeah. Um, and I can pack for a week if I'm going somewhere warm where I don't need a ton of heavy clothes. I can pack a week's worth of clothes into this yep. thing, no problem. For a week, my wife needs uh, the rig. Yeah. yeah, she needs that. But yeah, there. But yeah. His and hers. His and hers. <laughs> but I also like this for, like, I put my bathroom bag in here. I put yep. shoes in here. Yep. So it, it's got sort nice. Sort of a little, it's the hamper. It's sort of the way I use it. Obviously, it's ventilated and whatnot. So, yeah, as I use the clothes, I just keep putting in there. Fill that up. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing, like you showed, yeah. when the handle comes up, this backpack drops right into it. They're kind of yeah, meant to be, cool. to be used in tandem. It really is. I mean, it's funny because you just don't think about things like that till you have the option. But, you know, you're jamming through an airport. Before you know it, your back's all sweaty or just something kind of weird, you know? Um, this back piece here, it's a luggage handle. So it just kind of fits on there. Yeah. So you can see that. It slides right into yeah, the handle. it slides handles. right in. Let's see if I could do this. Oh. Since I'm struggling with everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Legit. There you go. So if you're crew, if you're somebody who travels frequently, I mean, this is a no-brainer. It's yeah, incredible. Especially when you're marching between gates, you oh, yeah. your backpack might be a bit heavy. Oh, absolutely. That takes all the weight. Well, and again, I mean, here you have like basically something you normally check in, yeah. check on, you know, and you've yeah. got it all there. So yeah, under the seat in front of you, this is checked in up top. 
This is the Rev Pack, by the way. It's our high end backpack. And you guys have multiple. Uh, various different styles and, and everything of backpacks as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is the high end, obviously, that kind of matches with Do the Do some of the middle and lower end ones have the that back part as well to sit you on top You know what? Of this? They don't. They okay. don't. That's yeah, the this, feature of this yeah, guy. Yeah, that's okay. the feature of this guy. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. They don't. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's travel, and there's all kinds of options there. Yeah. Uh, and Pony then the other... two Rev Pack. The other segment is it's kind of the accessories. So GL's always talking about the hydration pack. We didn't bring Got one of those. <laughs> but it's a they're sold out. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> GL's pumped them up so much, they're sold out. Uh, this is a helmet bag. And you guys have all kinds of these too as well, right? We do. We have two versions that we sell. It's the head case, and this is the ATS case. This is the harder case. Okay. So a little bit more dexterity to it, for sure. And what does this thing feature? Gosh, this one's pretty cool. You basically could fit a neck brace in the, in the case as well as your goggles. So a lot of people... Uh, Obviously, helmet and goggles go together. Okay, so yeah. four goggles. sets. Yeah. Cool. Four sets of goggles, four helmets. Sets there, and helmets are not cheap these days. It seems like the custom painted helmet's coming back, or kind of been coming back for a while. So, yeah, you can check this out. Well, with the quality and the technology in helmets, they're, you're looking at 700 bucks for a decent helmet yeah. now. You oh, want yeah. to protect yeah. that, too. No doubt. Yeah, this is nice. It's you know, nice. you spend all that money on a helmet, and then you throw it into a gear bag, and it's getting compressed and pushed in. Or yeah. even just that little light scratch by the time you pull yeah. it out. That used to piss me off. Oh, yeah. No, and that's, that's just it. I think there's a lot of categories that people just forget about. They probably do realize they've seen it before, but they just forget about it. Yeah. So coming here today, I certainly wanted to talk about, obviously, the, the different riders and the people that we work with. I think that's a big part of any brand, personally. Yeah. Um, but of course, yeah, I mean, everyone knows we have gear bags. Everyone kind of knows we have travel bags. But I think they forget about the accessory side. Boot bags, helmet bags, fanny packs. Um, yeah. Really cool for, like, adventure riding, longer mm -hmm. rides. They've got some they even have really vests. versatile and functional yeah. The flight packs. Vests. Yeah, vests. What yeah. else do you guys have? What am I missing? Gosh, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, of course, backpacks, like we talked about, um, hydration though, definitely the flight vest is a hydration pack. Yeah. It's cool. all on your body. I mean, obviously you get a little bit of swing weight from, uh, from a normal hydration backpack, but uh, you'll see a lot of Baja guys, guys that literally something goes wrong. You're going to have a big problem. I mean, there is so much, so many different options to carry your tools and keep the weight on your body. Mm. Um, even photographers, fishermen, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the guys, uh, use that same pack. Um, yeah, Grant seems to like it. Well, and, I mean, um, vodka and the Gatorade just mix in there back there. Yeah, you, 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 you didn't have to stir drink. it, just hit the road. <laughs> <laughs> it's all self-mixed. Uh, yeah. So, no, it's, uh, but, um, it's a great... great remind uh, people, because I know that we've seen this over and over, where to go find the stuff. Yeah, there's definitely um, a power sports division, like yeah. we talked about. And obviously, it's a big part of the OGO brand. Yeah, ogopowersports.com is when you'll, f you'll find any of the... the the different specs and everything that you might, you know, want to know about with this uh, helmet bag. Um, and then our Instagram is OGO underscore power sports. Um, okay. It's all, I wouldn't say it's new, um, but it's just something that I need to remind people of. So if they're at OGO.com, they're probably not going to see all the power sports stuff. No, they'll find the power sports, you know, button and then they'll transfer to our yeah. division. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, you go straight to OGO power sports.com and yeah, it's all, it's all there for you. So, cool. Yeah. Well, the products are amazing. Tell us a little bit about how the company's doing. Um, yeah. You it's, know, um, you know what? It's, you're it's, relatively new there. So how's it been? Yeah, it's been a couple years now. Um, has it already been two yeah, years? Yeah, it's been two years. You know, it's gone really, really fast. Are, are we getting older? Is that yeah. what it is? We're forgetting. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. probably what it is, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. But, but no, uh, yeah, we have a great distributor, um, you know, in, in a 50-year-old like a brand, you know, O'Neill Distributing. So it's, it's amazing. And uh, being a part of that group, kind of knowing kind of what the brand was. I don't want to say was, because it, it, it never went anywhere. But to be able to get all those original riders, like the Nate Adams, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, Kenny Bartram, and, and a lot of these guys um, that literally kind of helped the brand become what it was, uh, that's all kind of back. Yeah. Know? Again, they still rolled them because they had them for 10 years. They yeah. still had the bag. But yeah, they needed some fresh stuff and some new colorways. So we've come out with a lot of new colorways, obviously a new bag. Um, we have some of the best reps in the country. They all mm -hmm. represent really strong brands. Sort of like you guys said, you want to have the most premium brands affiliated. That's how most road reps are too, you know? And yeah. so literally we have the best reps in all of, all of the country. There's no doubt about it. Um, well, a lot of them are also doing a few other really top brands as well, which 
yeah. gets him in the door well, anyway. If you're a rep, that's how you make your living. You, it's, yeah. it's tough you've got to, to pedal. Pick the, you've got to pick the best yeah. brands as it, well. It's to, tough yeah. to go pedal shit and sell it, but yeah. if you've got a really nice product, it's easy. Honest to God, I mean, you can be the best rep, the most likable guy, but if your product's not going to turn yeah. or, or get them excited and make them want to sell it, because I don't, I don't care who you are today as a shop or whatever, you still have to sell products. I mean, oh, yeah. you do have some anomalies, people coming in saying, oh, I just want this, but th those days are kind of over. I mean, they really are, I think. You know, you still got to sell. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with OJ, there's definitely a brand story, you know, that's been told through you guys and a lot of other people. But there's a, I don't want to say a new story, but certainly there's a new bag, um, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, there's definitely some stuff going on, a new face. You know, I still yeah. talk to Andy Bell quite a bit. It's nice to get his blessing. And, and I saw him on stoke. Ridiculousness the other day. He was that's like the weird. guest. And I'm like... <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's weird. Andy yeah. Bell on yeah. ridiculousness. Yeah. And I think, huh. what did they, how did they introduce him? Like stunt man or something like that? I don't know. Yeah. Is yeah. that his title? He does design stunts. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. But, uh, but no, it's cool. And just, uh, hopefully people are seeing the brand more maybe than they had you know, recently. Um, I think it did but, lose that forefront of people's minds in the industry. But, uh, I mean, I know if you go into, you know, my store, you've been in there, but we yeah. just restocked. You walk in, you see all the helmets, and then above, we've got all the big gear bags, Saw all that. the colors, and they've actually been doing very well. People are digging them. Have they? Yeah. Cool. Did they, cool. when, when, kind of when, <laughs> when it faded off a little bit, was that just the recession? Was it 2008, yeah, yeah. 08, 12, it kind of got everybody, you yeah. know? I mean, certainly, it, 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 there was a lot of other action sports divisions for OGO. Um, it always started from dirt biking and motor, motor sports, you know, that, that sort of mm -hmm. surf, skate, snow, moto. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the flagship in, in, in action sports. And it's been fun because a lot of guys like Steve Caballero or Ryan Desenzo, a lot of, a lot of people ride dirt bikes that still are just gnarly in the ocean yeah. or, as we know, like Sonny and all these guys. Yeah. It's like, I've met all my heroes I've been in the water with them. I've skated skate parks with them. I never had a conversation with them, per se. On a dirt bike, I've met all my heroes. I've literally met all my heroes from a yeah. dirt bike. And especially through a brand like OG that's so androgynous, it's like there's, it's not like I talk to somebody, oh, well, I, you know, I, I can't wear that sunglass. These guys have always helped me out. It's pretty cool to kind of just plug it in and, and know that we sort of stand on our own um, in the category. And, and honestly, it's all the hard work that people have done, but... I want to give a lot of credit to the the people that I work with. You know, they they work their ass off, and and so yeah, and they and they just they've been there, they've done it, and and yeah. So I mean, we just uh, yeah, we've been pushing pretty hard. So yeah, to be a part of with you guys, and and obviously with different you know media partners and whatnot, and they pick up our calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, they call us back. I love it. Yeah. And uh, and one thing just to make sure, so there's no confusion. All of the manufacturing is the same as it was. Is there's not been any changes in that, so it's not like mm -hmm. this is a new relaunched uh, OGO that's different mm -hmm. or cheaper products. They're still super durable and reliable. You buy one of these, you're going to have it a long time. Yeah. yeah so thanks. pick a color you like. Yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest difference between us and a lot of different gear bags or gear companies. It's uh, the materials. A lot of people think our bags are heavy because of that sled. It's not. It's the material. Mm. I mean, you see, those bags do not collapse. They just that that uh, that dexterity. I think they have. So yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. You still riding a bunch? I yeah. am. I've been yeah. riding with well, SoCal rain. I've been like riding off road, high desert, and have you turn oh, nice. tracks? Yeah, well, yeah. It's been pretty fun. Well, hopefully these moto tracks get opened back up soon, and we can get back to some roosting on the regular. Thing up. They're opening yeah. up. Yeah, lap news. times. Trying to go fast, trying to go quick through a corner. I'm just, I'm no. gonna ride the trail Cruising? for a minute. Okay. I'm just kidding. No, I'm ready to. I am. I'm ready to ride some, some tracks. So hopefully everybody's staying safe. I know we're doing our best to, to to stay safe and 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 go offside a little bit for, for yeah. this. So, and we all um, took a bath and hand sanitizer out here. Um, oh just yeah. Completely slathered each other up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the help on that. Yeah. No worries. No worries. All day. Hey, thanks for coming in. Um, if you guys have not checked out OGO's full line of products, go to OGO Motorsport Powersports.com. Yep. Yep. Make sure you don't forget the Power Sports because they are different websites. You can still get there, but OGO Powersports.com. Uh, check out everything they got. This stuff is super high quality. Guarantee you won't be disappointed. So also check uh, them out on uh, like Instagram or social media. You guys do some cool stuff with your yeah. athletes and that, and it's just. I don't know. For a gear bag company, it's 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 a pretty sexy account if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. no. You know, it's, it's hard to make luggage. 
OGO underscore. Yeah. OGO underscore power sports. Yep, underscore for power Instagram. sports. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on, man. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. I appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. For real. No, proud to be a part of it. Turn it up. Surf <laughs> across is coming. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it better be made. It better make the cut this year. I was yeah. going to say. I whole shot that last year. I got my. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so. terrible. So <laughs> I'm going to try to be a little bit better this year. Yeah. No, you killed it in the surf. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're all surfer cross guys, huh? See that, J Bone? I couldn't even Ready barely. Oh, I mean, I'm talking about on the surfboard. I couldn't get it up. <laughs> I need well, some. I need some foam. I need a barge and some whitewash. Yeah. And yeah. I'll, uh, then I'll get up. All right. Yeah. That's good stuff. Well, Pat, thanks for coming in. Yeah. Absolutely. This has been Sponsor Spotlight. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. All right. That was our buddy Pilo. He's been in this industry for a long, long time. Great dude. And now he's working for a great company and. Uh, Stoked to have him on and, and just show you some of those products up close a little bit. Get over there and look at some of that uh, the things that they're offering because they're amazing products. Um, lastly, we've got the SKDA Get At Me Q&A. SKDA is just changing the game in terms of motorcycle graphic design. If you haven't gone and seen some of their uh, graphics and what they're doing, go check them out. Uh, look on Instagram and um, stay tuned because they've got some really cool ideas coming up that are going to be something totally different. No one else has done. And um, it's going to be it's going to be really cool. Donnie, what do we have for questions We've today? got some crazy internet questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> crazy questions. I was going to say crazy and internet and questions. Yeah, it does go together. Germany or Florida? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think about the possibility of running the last seven rounds of Supercross all at one venue in uh, possibly Arizona? I think it's weird, but... You have to start looking right now at what your options are. I think for them to try to delay it till later and do it after the Nationals. Well, some people were like, oh, I think that would be a better idea. And I'm like, I, I really don't. Not for the teams, for riders, for no one to, to, to keep chopping and changing. It's, it's, yeah. Well, the, the problem is we discussed uh, kind of off camera earlier was let's say in a perfect world, some of the Nationals go off. Like, they delay Supercross. We don't do it now. We get through some nationals. Then they're going to fill in the fall with Supercross. <laughs> then you've got no break, essentially, a month, and you're right back to A1. Well, here was my thought. That's no good. Let's, for argument's sake, say Ken Roxon crashes at the last round of the outdoors and breaks something. He now loses the outdoor title. He loses the 2020 Supercross title chance and may not line up for the 2021. Yeah. So that could be potentially three championships that could go out of the window for a, an injury that could cost you three months. Uh, think about it. Like It yeah. could be huge in that aspect. And I think for any rider to be that unlucky at that time of the year and lose three titles potentially from one injury, I also think that's a bit rough. Yeah, I what, agree. What about also the fact that you know, there's new model year bikes and they do new testing on bikes and change things and they don't have any opportunity. Yeah, you have only one month to develop a new bike. If develop a new bike needed. to go from one yeah. season to the other. I, I think that this thing, it, here's the deal. The Feld, I don't know what their books look like, but if they could get a good deal on the stadium, which you got to imagine they are, not a lot of people renting that stadium right now. So they probably get a good price on it to keep it to keep it. Instead of a weekend rate, they're getting a month rate. <laughs> yeah. So they're getting a yeah. discount. Well, hey, they get the it. Monday through Thursday rate yeah. instead of the Hey, go, Friday, Saturday, go try to book a, uh, a Airbnb right now. You can get a mansion for peanuts. I mean, that's just the way it is. Things are cheap right now. So they get a good deal on the stadium. The dirt stays in there. So you think the cost of dirt every weekend, that's eliminated now. You're spreading that out over seven weeks. Logistically, it's a lot easier for most of the teams here. Amen. Yeah, it's an easy drive. You could just leave the rigs there, fly guys back and forth, or bring them back in a transport vehicle. Um, and it, even if they don't have fans, they probably make generate a rough enough revenue off the TV to cover the cost of it. You know, because they can do it pretty inexpensively. Yeah, but did you see that there were some teams that were talking about not being ready to be able to race these races? Yeah, and I don't. I, I don't get that. I don't get that either. I know that. Uh, Roxon was kind of dragging his feet because he says he's immune compromised with what he's been through. But for a race team to say they're not ready to go, that's I don't okay. Get that, well, yeah. tough tits. I mean, we're going racing. Like Cooper, that's what Cooper they Webb just posted uh, quite a long thing saying, "Hey, I'm ready to go right now. I stayed ready," is what he said. Well, I only think that some of the reason the teams are saying they won't be ready is, I mean, the reality is a lot of 
teams sent their employees home. I mean, a lot of people were furloughed or paid time off, or but they're just not working. Now they've got to, tr one, try and get these people back, and you go, oh, they'll all be there waiting for us. Well, you know, some people hit the panic button, and they went and got a temporary job working for Walmart or, you know, one of these other jobs that were hiring people. So I think those are the teams that are going, well, we're not ready. No, it's not we're not ready. You just try to save a buck, push some people to the side, and now you're going, well, we got to wait till everyone's back because we don't have a suspension guy or an engine tuner or a mechanic or a truck driver. That's why I, the only reason I can think of, and I think and it's kind of silly. 20 years ago, there was no problems like that because you didn't have those guys. Yeah. You had one mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have a separate suspension guy and a separate clutch guy and a separate well, yeah. rear spoke nipple guy. And well, I wish I had a rear spoke nipple guy back in 01. That would have really helped <laughs> me out. Either way, the excuses are bullshit. Let's go that racing. part of it is, yeah. If they're going to be able to run these, let's run them, and the teams will make it. I promise you, if you're failed and you say, hey, it's this date. We're going to be at there Phoenix. also an obli there. obligation to the sport and the fans in general to try to get this stuff moving as well? Yeah. I don't finish, think, what, finish what you started. I don't think they care, though. I, I don't think I, anyone I don't cares say, about I don't know the they fans. don't care or they care, but th that's what the sport is here for. These, these are spectator sports, and everybody, I guarantee you, people would be happy, even if they couldn't go there in person, that they'd be seeing it on TV. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm starving oh, yeah. for, I would be for too. racing yeah. right now. Like, I've been watching old races. It's driving me nuts. Yeah. I hate watching old races because the outcome never changes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's, <laughs> it's just the way it is. I want to see some new stuff. But I, I think f there's a lot of moving parts. One is a lot of states, they couldn't even have a Supercross if they wanted. Maybe even with no crowd, they still couldn't do it. So you've got to find somewhere where it could be reliable. Arizona seems to be pretty. Texas. Texas is open. Yeah, I mean, open for business. Texas is open for business. They are, but you know, I got to imagine trying to rent Texas Stadium from Jerry is going to cost you an arm and a leg. Arizona, I guarantee you, it's a lot cheaper. You know, but there's a, as we said, there's a lot of moving parts. But I think getting the series finished, even if outdoors does get pushed back, which it sounds like it is, and they've already moved the schedule from May to June, and that that could even change again. But I think to get the Supercross series finished is the best solution right now and if this is the way to get it done yeah it might not be ideal for everybody but i really think that they're making the most of a situation and they have to keep moving forward the national is going to get pushed back to like 2021 <laughs> is that what's going on <laughs> well remember the first round was hangtown that's cancelled for good then round two was parlor it's got pushed to the end of the season round three was lakewood colorado that's been pushed to an off weekend in July. Rumored was that round one, according to their schedule, was um, June fifteenth, June thirteenth in um, WW Ranch, Florida. But I'm hearing through an email from NBC, but that that may be pushed to the end of the year, and the opening round might be the twentieth of June at High Point, mm. which also gives Feld a little bit of time because I think for a lot of teams they would really hate to finish Supercross and the very next weekend be trying to get to Florida or something. I mean, that's, that's a tough, that's a, that one I can understand when the team's saying, come on, give us a weekend off yeah. to just re-gear and restructure and repack the truck before it takes off. Yeah. Sure. Unfortunately, though, the whole country has been upset, right? And we all have to make sacrifices. Upset? Bru, I am furious. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make sacrifices to get back going again. Yeah. 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 If everyone can compromise a little bit, It'll be fine. But I, I, I hope that they put their foot down and tell the teams, if you're not ready and you can't be there, tough titties. You agree to come to the 2020 Supercross season. We would normally be racing right now anyway, so don't tell me you're not ready. Yeah. Yeah, Amen. Th this weekend it would be the final round. Mm, no. It, it's the first weekend of May. Was This would be the penultimate. Wouldn't this have been? This would have been the final oh, round. Oh, you're right. Donnie's right. Yeah, because it is already May this yeah. weekend. Well, mm -hmm. it's like I've lost track of time, but I had it on my calendar, and I looked, and I'm like, what? Mm. Already been over. All right, what else we got? All right, well, uh, we got a guy that was asking if, what would be the uh, possibility of having like a vet Supercross in Hawaii? Mm. Could you get I saw former stars to show up and ride? Yeah, so, so I actually DM'd back with this guy. This was a message that came through Instagram, and... Um, his concept was he went to Eric Pernard's Supercross in Hawaii last year. First one that had been to the islands for 
aside from the shit show we tried to do in 04, <laughs> it had been a long time. And um, he said it was just so cool to see. And he goes, you know, it would be so neat. What about this idea of having stars of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s come out? And it's a watered-down tr- Supercross track, right? Hey, so you fit into that, Ping. Yeah, yeah, I, maybe, but... Um, <laughs> he fits into all three, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I thought, man, you know, you don't have to worry about paying these guys a bunch of money. I think if you just all said, hey... trip. Yeah, hey, we're going to give you an all-expense pay trip to Hawaii. Come out, have a good time. We'll do some fun media stuff. The track's going to be totally safe, you know. Um, we'll provide bikes or however you, however you do that. Like, you know, you could do it without having to pay a bunch of cash, make a big purse. I think you could keep your financial commitments pretty low. And think about the guys you could get. I started just spitballing a list. I bet you could get Emig to go. There's no purse, right? He can't do anything that's races for money, but he could do something. Bradshaw. Uh, Stanton. Maybe Wyndham. Stanton. Wardy. Um, Dogger still rides quite a bit. Yep. Dubach. Well, he's going to kick our ass. GL. <laughs> yeah, Dubach probably will get. Kurt Nickel. Um, I mean. What about even guys like Villapoto and that? Totally. Know? Yeah. Hey, I mean, you, 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 you could have 20 guys. This is, the way, this is the way it needs to work. Okay. I, I, I figured the, this, the system out. You have to go out and however they qualify. That has to be handicapped in there. So you got a guy like Villapoto, and say he goes out and he qualifies, and he's, I mean, like this is a re- reality. Twenty seconds faster, fifteen seconds faster. Then you go, okay. Or well, what about like old school, like almost have your start, which will avoid injuries. You go, you go, you go, you right. go, you go, and you go slowest well, and fastest. Well, I think it's like you said. So if RV is ten seconds a lap faster, and it's going to be fifteen laps. You yep. calculate that time. You amortize that time over yep. the 15 And there's laps. a guy with a stopwatch, yep. and you do the math beforehand. And yeah, it's maybe it's like a single file start, and you order them up slowest to fastest. Go. The only problem go, is, remember, you know. World Supercross, when they all the Euros were coming over and sandbagging so that they could... It, the one that was at... Uh, yeah. Well, you would hope that it, well, there's no cash involved. Yeah. You just do a trophy, like I was gonna, guys. Oh, this is the way you I was do it. Say you sandbagging don't, people. Half or you of don't us tell them. Look like you don't tell them. You don't yeah. tell them. Number one, and you don't show the times, so nobody gets to see the times until it's qualifying is over. There's ways you can do it. Or we talked about uh, having two different classes: an eight, uh, 1980 to 80, or to 93. 93 to Hey, wait. Do 03? those guys have to ride bikes from the 80s to 93? <laughs> <laughs> that would be too hard to get bikes. Yeah. But I think it'd be cool to do it on two strokes. Yeah, that would be. But everybody uh, on two Everybody strokes. on two strokes. Yep. Because I think pretty much all of those guys would have ridden them. You would on. find guys, we, we've seen people over the years, that would build bikes for their heroes oh, yeah. and go, you take that to Hawaii sure. and ride it and sign my plate and bring it back, meet right. up so I can okay, keep it. Okay, so, so wait a second. What bikes, if you guys were going to be involved, what bikes would you choose two strokes to ride? YZ250. YZ250. All day long. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the most comfortable. Yeah. It's a great easiest bike. Easiest running, yeah. And yeah. uh, 125 wouldn't pull my fat ass over anything. It'd have to be really watered down track. Okay, so what about this? <laughs> Doubling triples would be a <laughs> difficult. I don't think you're going to get rent Aloha Stadium for something like this. It's too much financial commitment. You go back to that car but, track. But, but, that you no, we're not going exactly. to the but, <laughs> but even if you could find an arena, they I did. think that would they still have, work. Downtown Honolulu, there's an arena called the Blaisdell Arena. It would be like an arena cross track. Could you build inside of that type of arena yeah. a track that's safe, yeah. That, that the guys would be able to have fun on and race on, but no one would feel like, man, I'm going to die. Yeah. And even have a guy sure. in the stands. That'd be pretty little, trick. And have a little, little horseshoe. Did you ever top. go to Qualcomm when it went up in the stands? No. Uh, at Moto, I watched Mo- it. Yeah, yeah, I raced the... No, no, no. Like in the 80s. It, oh, no. It used to go up into the stands at, San, at Qualcomm. No. Didn't they also used to do that at Pontiac quite yeah. a bit? Yeah, Pontiac they did, did at yeah. Pontiac. They did at Pontiac. Not that many years, or they did it someplace. until they blew up that. So they blew up this. Yeah. yeah. Well, they did the Navy Moto X World Championships yeah. there, and I, I raced Supermoto there, yeah. there, and it jumped out of the stage. Yeah, it, I remember. It actually that. came out of the tunnel. You yeah. fly out of the tunnel. That's sick. And then it jumped back in over the stands. They and had came some there. little Larry. U.S. Open style. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. Is Do a two night event. Could you reverse take it? That, possibly have that arena cross where you run it out into the parking lot and back. Yeah, there. I don't know. I don't know the format of that arena. I, I don't know if that's possible. Regardless, it would be fun to watch all these guys. Listen, I, even as a fan, yeah, you would 
what an opportunity just to go. It'd be fun. And you'd have an autograph session where everyone could come sure. down and BS with Dude, all the that, writers. That, you would sell out, and it would be like uh, Trump's rallies, everybody outside wanting to watch. <laughs> well, this guy said that there was a huge enthusiasm about the event, and a lot of people showed up, and people were talking about it. So there's, there's an interest. There's a vibe, yeah. yeah. And... I just wonder how many people you get to come over from the mainland and just watch. Just getting or... that, those groups of guys, because yeah. it's just those groups of superheroes that still ride bikes. Okay, so you still might get some of the guys that say, ah, I'm not going all the way to Hawaii. It's got to be real simple or they won't do it. What if you... Bora Bora. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I think it's like Southern Cal. Let's find a really nice hotel in Southern Cal. Yeah, no. No? You lost me. You do some type of... Hawaii deal. sounds way more better. Yeah. Way more better. Way, way more, more better. better. Bring your slippers. All right. Hawaii yeah. it is. Somebody get on this. Eric Pernard. I would go hey, for I'd sure. Hey, I'd even go to the Bahamas if that's yeah. what it took, okay? Uh, uh, GL, you're, <laughs> you're a real giver. I know. Team player. Uh, yeah. All right. That's it. What's what we got? That's all I got. The SKDA show. Get At Me Q&A. Um, get over to SKDA and, look, SKDA and look at what they've got. Amazing stuff. These Scotta. guys are, Scotta. are Scotta. killing it. Uh, I want to thank also Yamaha. Big thank you to those guys. Uh, Power Dot, 20% off. Get over there and use it. Method Race Wheels, 20% off. Charlie Designs, SKDA, 20% off the Whiskey Throttle Show graphics right now. Dunlop Tires, Adidas, Pro Circuit, 10% off over there using Whiskey Throttle as your code. Nihilo Concepts giving you a free gift with any purchase. Is Make that sure way you, you got mentioned. that hat? Yeah, free no, gift. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Seat Concepts, big thank you to those guys. Amazing products. Go to SeatConcepts.com and look at all they've got to offer. Fire Department Coffee, 20% off over there with our code. Specialized Bicycles, OGO. Go look at OGOPowerSports.com. Paleo Ranch Foods, Lengths and Motorsports. That's our show. Nice. Enjoyed it. Yep. We will uh, see you guys very soon. We don't have anyone else scheduled at the moment because it's a little touch and go, but uh, hopefully we can button that up and have some more uh, content to you very soon. Thank you for watching. We'll see you guys next time.